I made a post a while back and I called it why creation is finished may be the most important understanding of all. And the reason why I found it profound enough to share was because when I was in meditation one night, I saw all these different versions of myself and it was like an infinite amount. And there was versions of me that were slightly different, some radically different in both directions, good and bad. And I realized that they were all within me and that I had the power to believe them into being if I wanted to. And the reason why I found that profound was because I I truly, I think at that moment, I thought that I had to become things in the world instead of accepting what I already am inside. And I wrote something to something else, you know, building upon that idea. And I want to read it to you. And I write, Since man is all imagination, the difference between you and your current, your current self-concept, your state, and the desired state or the desired version of yourself is simply a reformed imagination. The version that you desire believes they are that self-concept. They don't doubt it. But in the end, it's all you. For that desired version, that desired state, is still all imagination. So the difference does not lie in the physical structure, but in the arrangement of imagination. If you associate yourself with all imagination, then you can see how fluid you are, how translucent. For opacity is believing in solely the senses. So you free yourself from the opacity of the sense man and you allow yourself to feel one with imagination, the inner man. For as Neville said, if you judge after appearances, you will continue to be enslaved by the evidence of your senses. So if I limit my judgment to myself only after appearances or only to the past, then I remain as I currently am. However, were I to see that all these versions, these states of me are inside of me, and I have the power to believe them into being, then I can expand. For when I limit myself, I'm actually limiting myself inside imagination. So I enter myself and I treat my own imagination as my own place of creation. I can change what I desire to change. I can expand what I desire to expand. And I can drop what I don't desire. There is nothing and no one else to change but self. And if I can see that the self is not this physical body, but the inner man, then I can change. Continuing to judge after my senses leaves me paralyzed and in sin. But it is Christ that comes and heals the paralyzed and takes them out of sin. But I have to see myself, you have to see yourself as your own Christ. You are the inner man. You have the power to free yourself from your own self paralyzation and what is demoted can be promoted if i know i'm the inner man so now i'm going to speak about that is that if i know that i'm the inner man that i'm fluid if i associate myself with this physical body and the senses well then i remain as i am i can't change anything and in the end it's all things there are things we desire and things undesirable in our worlds and it can be hard to accept that I'm the inner man who creates my world when I'm creating something I don't like. I'm creating undesirable things. But in the end, it's all just things. And Neville tells us to go to the creator of things, our imagination, the maker of things. So I'm told to go within myself and open my inner eyes and see exactly who I am inside. And I can notice, if I go within myself, I will notice that I have the power to resurrect the past. I have the power to see different types of futures for me. I don't have to go anywhere. I can just enter myself and see that I have this power. I have the power to make myself low or high. It's up to me. You know, the Bible tells us that the mind is God's throne. So you can actually, you, the inner man, can sit inside yourself as if it's your throne. And it says the earth is his footstool. 
you extend your imaginary legs and place them on top of earth. You can envision this. It's a symbol of who you should be inside. So we become our own saviors. We become our own Christs. We free ourselves from being paralyzed for years. We can have the power to do that if we know we're Christ. You know, I think a very common thing that happens when you study this work is you might come into contact with a certain train of thought that will make you feel that you can't imagine this or you can't have that or you can't uh, see yourself in this type of way. But is it that you can't do it or is it that you're afraid to do it? Because there's a difference. And what I've learned is that there's truly nothing to be afraid of inside. Unless you're afraid of yourself, that's really the only thing you can be afraid of. Because even the doubter, you know, Satan is your own creation. It's a, it's a thing created. And this has nothing to do with deserving things. The inner man, there's nothing, the idea of worthiness needs to be thrown out. For everything inside yourself is yours, including all these different versions. And I want to reiterate that the desired version that you want to be inside yourself, which is just yourself, believes fully in the self-concept that they are. So there's a version of you that fully believes they are the thing that they desired once to be. It's a version inside. And all these are in you. So don't go outward to get it. I enter within myself, and I imagine it already being so. So I think that that kind of realization that it's not in the physical structure of things that I need to change, but the arrangement, the reformed imagination, and I reform it to accepting that new desired version. I accept that I am that because I am. I just simply notice that I am or I accept that I am. You become aware of being it. I know it. Whatever it is, words you want to use, whatever feelings you want to use to get there, that's up to you. But I would advise you not to go anywhere. Just sit down and commune with yourself, as Neville would say. Commune with your own heart. Ask yourself what it is that you desire. Be honest. And accept that you have that, or you're the version who has it. See yourself. Visualize yourself having it, and you'll see that this is a version of me. And then visualize another version of yourself not having it, or visualize your, a version of yourself having something else. You'll see there's all these different people in me, but they're all just me, and they're all rooted in imagination. And at one point, the person I am now was rooted in my imagination. So I rearrange and reform my own mind. So repentance, the radical change of mind, is a gift. This should never be seen as a, as a difficult work to change one's mind. It's a gift to change one's mind. It's a gift to enter in yourself and change what you desire to be changed. It's your own imagination. Don't worry about if it's selfish or what society tells you or what the outer man will want you to think. Allow yourself to be the chooser. Don't, don't give up your selective power that you have within yourself. It's not something that should be taken lightly. You truly have the power to go within and decide things just as though you were sitting on a throne. So if you guide your thoughts with power and love, you can truly create a better life for yourself. So don't underestimate the power of your self. There's so many times where we think we can just imagine all these things and we you know, we come into contact with our harvest. We might not enjoy our harvest, but it's our harvest. I sowed these seeds. I was told that seeds grow after their own kind. So if I want to grow something wonderful after its own kind, I must plant it. But I plant it within myself. I don't go outside of me. I accept that it's planted. So, again, I just wanted to stress mainly the point that the version of yourself that you desire believes they are that self-concept. So you don't have to try your hardest to become that version of you. It's something that already is in imagination. It's already, it already is that way. It's something that should be accepted, celebrated. It's something that should be enjoyed 
It's something that should be loved and protected, not something to just be in constant hope of maybe one day I'll become it, maybe one day I'll become it. Associate with the inner man. That's the outer man speaking. The inner man, the, the future and the past are not things that can't be brought up instantly. They're, they're present realities to the inner man. So if you associate yourself with that being instead of this sense man, well, then I think you'll be more free. I think you'll be freer than what you are now. And try to open up your imaginal eyes. These eyes are, they can see things beyond what your senses show. And try to open them more. Start to notice. Go within yourself and notice. What is within me? There's all these versions. What else is within me? The past is within me and I can bring it up. What else is within me? All these different types of futures I can have. There's all these catastrophes as well within me. But there's also these lovely things within me. All these things. It's just a bunch of things within me. But I'm told not to go to something outside of me, but go to the maker of things, which is my own imagination. And I go in there and I change with the power. Not as something in hoping. You have the authority to change things inside. As Neville would say, Christ has the authority to forgive sin. Well, if I associate myself with that being, then I have the authority to forgive my own sin and forgive the sin of others. And how many times should you forgive yourself? I remember forgiveness and um, faith is like the two conditions that are, re are required for repentance. So a radical change in mind, I must have faith. And how many times should I forgive? I have to have forgiveness. He says 70 times 7. So I keep forgiving myself over and over and over again until it's forgiven. It has the possibility to be changed. Imagination always does. It's always open to reform. So if you allow yourself to be open to reform, it will come down to you. How open, how free are you willing to be inside yourself? It's a choice. Regardless of the senses, if you didn't have to have the senses, a thought accepted doesn't need a sense. It can just be accepted about yourself. You don't need to conform, make it conform to something outside of you. You're allowed to accept something new about yourself. And we're taught that if you persist in that new change, that if you celebrate in that new change of you, it, you will become it in the world. Because that's how, in some sense, you became yourself currently now. At some point, you were imagining these things. I know it's true for me. I can look to my life and it's not that different than what I've been imagining. And I notice that if I do change, my world does change. But if I limit myself, I'm actually limiting myself inside my own imagination, inside myself. So it's up to me to free myself. All limitation is self-imposed to the inner man because there's no one else who can do it but him. He's the creator of things. So I know this is going to help you because you're going to start seeing that these things that you want to be aren't outside of you. And they're actually you. And it really comes down to learning to expand your forgiveness, to expand your self. <laughs> That's truly what it is. You've, you have associated self with the body. You've associated, associated self with the senses. But now learn to expand self and associate it with imagination. You're not just the body. When you go to sleep and you find yourself in the dream and you would say, I'm there. That's, that's the same I am that's here. So you're not just bound by the body. So don't, and you don't have to bind yourself to the body during the day. You're allowed to start associating yourself with the being within that has the freedom and the authority and the permission to change. You don't need the senses to change. As Neville would say, I can be locked up in a dungeon. I can imagine myself free as the wind and I would become so. That's how confident he is in his imagination. And that same confidence is in you. It's in me. It's in all of us. We're one. And we can utilize this creative power for good or for bad or whatever it is. But I'd say try to guide it with love, with celebration, with joy. You'll have a better life that way. But you could use it in a negative way if you want, in a destructive way. 
but I don't think once you see the unity with us, it's it's quite difficult to. Um, but yeah, I think that this will help you see that it's time to be translucent. If you're listening to these things, I think it's time for you to free yourself inside and notice, become curious and notice what is within me. You'll see it's everything. You have, you have everything within you. You have all the waterfalls, you have coliseums, you have everything within you. You can just spark it up within. So you lose nothing. You lack nothing. It's all within. What would I feel like if I had my desire? You know, this was a question that was often asked by Neville, and I found myself always asking myself this question throughout the day, is what would I feel like? And I would try to answer the feeling with a, with a forced feeling. I wouldn't necessarily let the feeling come up. I would try to force something upon it instead of letting myself be honest in how I would feel. And I focused so much on the feeling, and I thought the feeling was the most important part of that question. But what I found is that it's not the feeling so much, it's the I is the most important part. The I of man is the most important thing. It's how I would feel. It's not how another would feel. It's not how I'm supposed to feel. It's not the correct way to feel. And I need to be scared if I don't feel it right. It's how I would feel. And when we have resistance in changing the I, which is ourselves, who is occupying these states, when we have a hard time changing ourselves, it's because we have limited the I. We have limited, um, I can sit here and feel that I am not going to be a good speaker. And then I'll find myself becoming scared that I'm going to make all these mistakes. I can feel that I'm going to be a great speaker. It's how I shape my I. It's up to me. And I'm going to go into some kind of poetic speak. And I hope you catch the essence of what I'm trying to say. And I say this, I say, if I'm going to limit the I to only my senses, then I can guarantee I'll have resistance in changing myself, the I. If I believe that I'm limited by my past, well, then I'll have resistance in changing myself in the present. If I believe that the I is only limited to the present limiting state that I occupy, well, then I'll have resistance in changing my I. If I believe that the I is limited to how I was treated in childhood, then I'll have resistance in changing the I in the present. If I believe that I'm always headed for a catastrophe, that the I is always headed for a catastrophe, then I'll have resistance in believing in something good happening to myself or the I. If I believe that the I is limited by the habits that I've developed in the world, well, then I'll have resistance in repenting. If I limit the I to only shame, then I'll have resistance in entering greater states. If I limit the I to only the beliefs of my parents, then I'll have resistance in changing those beliefs about myself. If I limit the I to a certain ism, then I'll struggle to believe in the God in my, inside myself. If I limit the I by believing it cannot be saved or be forgiven or be loved, then I'll have resistance in, resistance in accepting those gifts. If I limit the I and enslave the I to obey only reason, well, then I'll have resistance in going beyond what my reason dictates. If I believe in anything other than God, I have limited the I. And the I, again, is the essence of someone. It's the individual inside. It's the invisible one who's playing all the parts. But I have a choice in how I speak and shape my I, which is myself. If I can see that I'm not the state itself, if I can see that I'm occupying a state, then I can change. But if I believe that I'm the state itself because I've been in it for so long and I've convinced myself through repetition that I'm stuck this way, that I can't go, I can't seem to imagine beyond my senses here. If I believe that, well, then I'm not going to change. I have to see myself. I have to expand the I. I have to allow my I or myself to feel more, to accept more to be more open to more feelings is what would I feel like were it true? And you can ask this question for everything. It's, and it's personal. What would I feel like? It's not what would they feel like? What would I feel like? And you just answer it. You, you change nothing on the outside. You just change fully on the inside. Because when you imagine and you're desiring, 
You are using your imagination to desire. And you're not using it to fulfill yourself. You're using it to desire. You're a desiring self when you desire. You're being that. You're in a state of desire. And you can move from that state to a new state. But I hope you can see what I'm saying. Is that you're using your mind to desire things. Instead of using it to feel fulfilled. Instead of using it to feel what it would feel like were it true. You know, Neville says this, he says, if you are still desiring, stop it right now. Ask yourself what it would be like were your desire a reality. How would it feel were you already the one you would like to be? The moment you catch the mood, you are thinking from it. And the great secret of prayer is thinking from rather than thinking of. So you catch the mood. Don't feel afraid to catch it. Don't limit yourself into not thinking you can catch it. You catch the mood. You feel the mood. You don't allow yourself to be dictated by reason. You don't allow that feeling to be dictated or to be controlled. You don't fall, fall and become a slave to a new assumption inside that's limiting. You allow yourself to feel. You allow yourself to be more open to new feelings about the eye. But if I find myself always feeling that I'm headed towards a catastrophe then I will have resistance in believing in something good. But I have to see that I'm the one imagining the catastrophe. I have to separate myself from the creation, from the ideas. You know, these ideas you can personify, them. they're really your own children inside. And they're your own creation. And you're allowed to shape and change the creation inside yourself. You don't need to do anything on the outside. You just, you can do it right now. What would it feel like were I the one I'd like to be already? And when you feel that, when you use your imagination wisely, instead of using your imagination to keep missing your marks in life, instead of using your imagination to keep using reason to stop yourself, or using your imagination to conjure up catastrophes and create resistance, if you can now use your imagination wisely and accept it, you will change. If you, if you allow yourself to feel that you're allowed to change inside, that you're allowed to imagine what you would like and feel that you have it, then you're using your imagination wisely. You It might look foolish to those on the outside, but as William Blake said, a fool who persists in his folly becomes wise. So let me persist in my folly. I'll believe inside myself that I am that I would like to be. I will sustain this inside myself. I won't change anyone or blame anyone on the outside. I will sustain it in secret. And when this starts to show in my life, then I will know that I'm the one who creates my own heaven and hell inside my own bosom, inside myself. I really do create these states of mind. Now, my heaven might be someone's hell and, my, and someone else's heaven might be my hell. But regardless, the imagination is the creator of these states of mind. And if I see that the I is the only thing that needs to be changed, as Neville said, there's no one to change but self, and the self is the I of man. I don't need to go outside of myself because my I doesn't exist outside of myself. It's within me. I go inside. I switch, and I change, and I believe in that change. It's called repentance. It's a gift. This is all a gift. And, you know, Moses in the scriptures was given a revelation of God. He was told... The guy's name is I am. So that's how I change. It's the way to change is I am. So I change in the present. I accept it being now. And that's what Neville says. How would it feel like were you already the one you would like to be? It's present tense. The moment you catch that mood, you are thinking from it. So you feel you already are. Don't reason with it. Reason will tell you you're not. You already know what reason is going to say. You've listened to reason a thousand times. But well, what would it feel like if you just didn't listen to reason? And you accepted that you already were. What if you allowed yourself to extend the power of your belief beyond what your senses dictate? And you extended it, but not outward, but inward. You would see a change in your life. Because you would see a change in yourself. Because self is life. So if I wish to change my life, I change myself. Truly, a true change, not a moment's... This is why I love when Neville says you want to wear it like a fragrance. You're allowed to wear it like a fragrance. 
and you put a good fragrance on it feels good it's the same here you put on a new state on it feels good you're allowed to wear it who can stop the inner man from imagining so don't listen to anyone who tells you you can't change um, the inner man's not bound by the reason of man or it's not bound by the words of man man can say you, you can't change but God will show you inside that you already are changed so you extend your belief beyond reason you allow yourself to be ever expanding of the I. You don't allow yourself to be limited. You don't imagine a state and contemplate yourself to death thinking, well, I don't know if I'm really worth it or what if this? And I find myself doing that all the time. It's a part of me. It's inside of me. And I believe in it. I expanded my I. And I feel that it already is so. Because I'm allowed to. I've given myself permission. And once you give yourself this permission to see beyond the senses and to believe beyond the senses, you won't need really to listen to me at all anymore. You'll start to live this way. And you won't change the outside. You'll start from the end. So I think I want to hit one more point again, which is don't use your imagination to desire things. It's not wise. It might seem foolish at first to imagine that you have it, but test this. Treat it as a test. Truly. And when you test it over and over, just I'm going to try this out for this, and I'm going to try it out for that, and I'm going to imagine I have this and that. And let's just see what happens. And if your world starts to shape down that way, well, then you found the creator of things. So you can't go to another. And you don't want to anyways. Because it's self. You go to yourself. If you need something, you go to yourself. So... I know this will help you, and um, use your imagination wisely. So I found that in meditation, if I stop speaking so much, I don't use reason anymore. I don't judge the feelings I'm trying to give myself. Because when we feel something inside ourselves, and we start talking so much, and we start using the voice of reason, we will come up with reasons as to why we don't deserve something and as to why we do. But it's really just ourselves creating these reasons. And when you give yourself a feeling and you start to judge it or critique yourself, you're not really accepting it, are you? And I found that total acceptance of something within oneself, that change shortens the time frame in the external for it to change. So total acceptance is really what quickens this. It's what makes it faster. So it's the, the secret is to have a total change inside and leave the external alone. That's the secret that I found from Neville's work and from just testing it myself. So when you go to feel something, uh, do not judge it. Don't speak so much. Just simply feel it to your depths and to its heights. And it's a term that I've used, you know, I coined myself to myself is feel beyond reason. It's something I always tell myself to feel beyond reason. And there was this question that was asked to Neville in one of his lectures that said, suppose you have an objective and you know the principle, but you have some doubt whether or not the objective would be good for you. How do you deal with that? This is a very common question that's been asked um, even today, several times, actually multiple times a day, it's asked. How do I know? I'd say I do know the law, but how do I know it's good for me? This is what Neville said. He said, if you have any doubt concerning the objective, Go beyond it and actually feel that you made the wisest decision in the world. Go beyond it in time and reflect upon it as though it has worked out beautifully and it could not have been a wiser decision than that which now has come to pass. Go beyond it. And you will know after the experience and upon reflection that it was the wisest decision you could have ever made. And maybe the rational mind could have never made such a decision. So the rational mind could have never made such a decision. So Neville's telling us, and when you try to use your rational mind to figure out the means, you're going to mess the whole thing up. So Neville says, go beyond it. Go beyond the problem and feel that you've made the wisest decision. Feel beyond the reason. Feel beyond the rational. And when you do that, you'll find that a thought does not need anything on the outside to be believed in. And I'm going to repeat that. A thought does not need anything on the outside to be believed in. And when you dwell upon this and you practice it, you will become far more free inside yourself. You'll become actually freed inside yourself. A huge weight will be lifted off. And the feeling that Neville would always push us to feel is that things are the way that I would like them to be. 
Because we're in the world of things, things desirable and things undesirable, but feel that things are the way you would like them to be. And I emphasize the you there because, you know, when I was a child, I would be so envious of other people's lives and I would look to them and I would wish I could switch places with them. I almost wanted to remove myself and just be them instead because I really did not like my life. But once I saw that it's about how we are inside of ourselves and not externally, because regardless what you have in the external, it doesn't necessarily mean you feel happy inside. Once I saw that it's the inner work, the inner world, that I can make the things inside myself as I would like them to be, well, then I didn't want to switch places with anybody. You know, and for a long time, I tried to control the world and control myself, control my behaviors, control everything instead of feeling. I had to learn to let Esau go, as I would say, and Esau is the outer man. You know, Esau always wants a new king. Esau always wants a new guide and a new God, and Esau is always trying to find merit with God. But I had to learn to let go of Esau and forget him, that the Bible tells me that I'm on holy ground right now, that God, is, I'm the temple. I don't need to go anywhere. I'm on holy ground as I walk. So when you let Esau go and you no longer feel like you have to control him and by no effort of your own, you feel inside. You don't pressure yourself to feel. You don't hound yourself down to feel. You allow yourself to feel, to feel beyond your reason. And not that long ago, I was at the grocery store and I had a jacket on that I haven't worn in a year. And I felt something in my chest pocket, so I went to a grab it and I pulled out a piece of paper. And I wrote something down maybe a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago. And I realized that this thing that I wrote down came to pass maybe a few months ago. And I totally forgot about it. So I'm being listened to and I'm being heard. And, um, you know, it's a story when I was a kid. I was at this daycare and I found this metal action figure. And I love that it was metal. I loved how heavy it was and I wanted it. And I looked around and I saw the room and I saw everybody was busy and I felt the urge to steal it. And I stole it, took it, put it right in my pocket. And I thought, well, nobody's watching. Um, no one's going to get me in trouble. Like nobody saw it. So what does it matter? And I think I was trying to teach myself a lesson. And when I got home, I thought nothing of it. And I found myself being questioned all of a sudden by my parents about this and where I got this. And I had to admit that I stole it. And even when I thought, I really thought that I wasn't going to get caught, but I saw myself steal it. The being in me saw me choose to steal. And I think it's funny now, but at the time it was quite scary that I chose that. But, you know, I don't condemn myself for that. I found myself in a state that I picked, but I was being watched. I was being listened to inside myself. And just like the paper inside my chest pocket, it was listened to as well a year and a half ago. So we truly do create our own heaven and our own hells in our own bosoms, inside ourselves. We truly do. But when you learn the art of being able to go beyond your reason, to be able to feel beyond it, then you really can start a new heaven inside now. The time is now to do it. And I'm glad that I wrote down what I wrote down a year and a half ago. It was a wise investment. It aided me now. And I hope to choose wiser investments now. So I feel that I chose wise thoughts. I feel that inside myself, things are the way I would like them to be. Regardless of Esau, regardless of the outside, the world of Caesar, our Caesar has no power inside of you. So I truly don't care what states you occupied in your past. It doesn't really matter what you're going to occupy in your future. It's about what you occupy right now. It's about what am I imagining right now. If imagining creates reality, then what am I imagining? Am I imagining that things are the way I would like them to be? Or am I imagining that things are undesirable for me? Am I imagining myself in deep desire? Am I in a hell inside myself? You know, am I really finding myself parched and wanting water? Or do I find myself in abundance? And we choose these things inside ourselves. And I know that it can be difficult when you have all these habits that have been created. But what imagination created can be uncreated. Truly believe that, that what was created can be undone inside myself. So let this video be a push to push you to feel beyond your reason. This is how you're going to grow inside imagination. You don't use external effort. It doesn't need it. So regardless of the things of the world, feel your brilliance, feel that you're wonderful, feel that you're intelligent, 
Feel that you're bright. Feel that you're wealthier. Feel it. It's there. It's always been there. So in the end, this is a self-persuasion. It's not an other convincing. It's not about being others focused. It's about being self-focused. And I don't mean to be selfish. I mean to grant yourself, this is a whole different world is what I'm speaking about. I'm not speaking about as the world deems as selfish and the world will tell you who to be jealous about, how you should compare yourself, how you should judge yourself, how you should think about yourself. But if you just ignore all that and do a societal cleanse inside your mind, you will find yourself the, having the ability to freely choose what you desire inside yourself. And this isn't about convincing another person. It's about a self-persuasion. It's about persuading yourself that you already are the thing you're desiring to be. For that neutralizes your desire. It's a change in self is what you're seeking. You know, growing up, we may have, we may have had to accept certain distorted, distorted images of ourselves. We may have felt uh, we were a slave to certain assumptions about ourselves. Maybe we had to act and pretend against how we felt. So we created a disconnection within ourselves. But Neville says that imagination does not question my right to want it. So regardless of any image that I may have taken or any self-concept in the past that I may have adopted, imagination doesn't interrogate me. It doesn't stop me from wanting it. It doesn't stop me from fulfilling it inside myself regardless. So as Neville said, I don't care what the past says. Regardless, assume it anyways. You want it but you condition it. You want it, but you reason your way out of it. You want it, but you feel unworthy. If you were just to let go of all of these ideas and realize that imagination doesn't question my right to want it, and it doesn't question me to fulfill it, then regardless of what states maybe I adopted in the past, they weren't really me to begin with, because I can move and switch between states inside myself. So I'm never really bound to anything. So don't be addicted to questioning and doubting yourself. You want it, then fulfill it. Allow yourself the ability to test this instead of questioning yourself. Regardless of how you feel, just test this. Allow yourself to test that whatever I desire, I may believe I have it and I will. So it's a self-persuasion. It's a self-relief. It's a self-satisfaction. There's no need for anything outside of you to convince you. You use the internal evidence to convince you. So there's no need to convince another or to change them. If I honestly believe that there's nothing or no one to change but self, then I have to leave it all alone and find self and I change it. But self is not found on the outside of me. And when you see that self is only found within, and you truly remove all these ideas, these societal labels that were given to you, and you allow yourself simply to rest in the idea that inside yourself there is no judgment, there's no fear, there's no one to fight, there's nothing to desire, it's just self, then you can finally have a sustainable peace inside yourself. You can truly let go. And as William Blake would say, he would fall back into states. He would allow himself to be embraced. Neville say he would yield into it. So it's all about gently falling backwards or yielding or ex gently accepting, granting yourself the permission to have. It's all done in a lovely way. It's not something that is forced upon yourself to take. You don't force yourself to take upon a state. You grant it to yourself, regardless of whatever reason that you give yourself to not have it. The question becomes is, are you convinced that you are? And if you have to, you have to ask yourself this question honestly. Am I convinced? If I'm not convinced, can I make myself convinced? Can I feel that I'm convinced? Do I hold this ability to change myself? And when you realize that you do, you'll realize that you're no slave inside your imagination. You're, you're no slave inside. You're no prisoner to the external facts. You know, we might live in this world that might feel like a sea of facts, and you might feel like you might be swallowed up by a fish when you feel overwhelmingly that the external is not conforming. You allow yourself to gently yield back to it, ignoring the senses. So here's a quote that Neville said that really kind of encapsulates everything is what I'm saying. He said, so here in this game of life, it's a game. Paul calls it a race. He said, I have finished the race, I have fought the good fight, and I've kept the faith. But you can call it a race, or you can call it a game. Both are competitive, but the competition is with self, not with another. There is no other. You're not trying to get beyond the other fellow. Grant him the right to use the same law to achieve his goal. His goal may be something similar to mine, but I have a goal. 
then I simply apply this law toward my goal, giving him complete freedom to get his goal, even though it's similar and may even be duplicate. Well, let him have it. So you can tell the law to anyone, and it's not going to rob you. You can tell it to everyone in the world, and anyone who asks for your secret, tell the law. That the end is where I begin. My beginning is my end. That's where I start. I go right to the end, the thing desired, and I feel myself right into it. I feel myself into the wish fulfilled. I drop it, and that is casting my bread upon water when I feel satisfied. So there is no other to compete against. This happens all the time, but what happens if two people are imagining the same thing? Just grant him that thing. Similar to, like, let, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Give Caesar what he wants. Give yourself what you want. Don't allow these ideas of not having the abundance within yourself that you're competing with another person. It's simply self against self. So you enter your, in yourself and you ask yourself, what states am I holding? Can I change? I may come up with a million reasons why I can't change, but can I change? I will only know this if I test it. So I change myself regardless of the past. I feel myself beyond reason. And I find myself changing inside. So it's nothing that really is that difficult. It's simply a letting go of these, I call it a societal cleanse, of all these ideas that were given to us about ourselves and our ability within ourselves. We truly have the ability to desire inside ourselves and we have the ability to fulfill. Don't forget that part. You know, you may question yourself and worry that, well, what if it doesn't produce the right fruit? Or what if it happens too fast? Or what if it takes a long time? Neville says, if you're asking yourself all these questions, you haven't yet yielded into it. You haven't yet felt yourself right into it, as he would say. You haven't yet felt the wish fulfilled if you're still asking yourself these questions. There really aren't any more questions to ask. It's a true faith. It's a true trust. You may ask yourself, well, how can I trust my imagination? The same way you trust anything within it. And if you don't trust this thought, you'll find another one to trust, and you'll believe in that one. You might not be able to trust yourself in believing that you're as brilliant as you would like to be. Well, then you'll go on believing that you're not brilliant. <laughs> there's always a there's always a surplus of thoughts to believe in, whether they're good or bad. It is it's up to you to define. But never count yourself out, regardless of where you're at physically. It's truly something you must learn to let go of entirely, because that's where you're going to find the true freedom. The more you let go of the external, the more real your imagination feels. The more you start to drop the importance of it and you see it as a reflection or a shadow, or you feel one with your environment, you will no longer feel that it's coming at you. You'll start to feel a deep peace inside, and lean into that peace, for that was given by yourself, to yourself. And that's what this race is. It's against self. Even if you have fallen out of a state for a long time, or you were once in a good state and you fell out of it, you can't lose a state. Don't reason again and think that, well, I'm... I disqualified because I fell out of it or I didn't sustain it long enough. You can always go right back into it. So never count yourself out inside yourself. So before you compare yourself to another, before you find yourself thinking thoughts of the inadequate, which is comparison, and you find yourself reasoning your way out of the things you want or conditioning them, realize who you're really fighting against inside yourself. Realize who you're really denying. And when you see that truth, that it's not against another, that you don't have to be other-focused. And when I say self-focused, I mean the inner self, the one in imagination, the only self there truly is. When you see that that's the one you free, that's the one you exalt, and when you see that you can do it, you will. I believe in you. I believe you will do it. And when the facts are against you and you find yourself imagining yourself to be something other than what the senses are saying, and when the imagination becomes the victor in this, you will now serve the right God. You will no longer go to some other person to grant you something. You will realize they can't. You can't go to another shadow. You will find yourself going towards the light which is within. And I want to end this with a quote that you should dwell upon. Truly, think about it. The quote is this, all feelings and thoughts are yours. Just dwell upon that. It's a simple quote, but there's a lot of truth that you can extract from it.
So learn to leave the hellish lands inside yourself and come and dwell in the land inside yourself where there's forgiveness, where there's fulfillment, where there's joy, and rest in that area. And let that become your place of habitation inside yourself. And I'm glad this helped you. We have to view imagination as a home. That every time we close our eyes and we enter ourselves, we're returning to our home. But the nature of this home, the nature of your thoughts, the, the certain structure to your thinking is going to be dependent upon how you view yourself. If you view yourself in a very negative light, then it makes sense that you would have thoughts that would come from that position because you're only encountering yourself inside your own self. So when we enter ourselves, you don't want to be a beggar for things. You can almost think of it as a person who is begging for peace. He w walks up to a structure, he sees a tall building, and the building represents peace. And there's people at the top, and he's, he feels that you know they're rich in peace, and he is not allowed in, and he's banging on the doors because he feels like he's begging for peace. We don't want to be that because peace really does exist within us and it's not something we have to earn. It's one of the detrimental ways of thinking, in my opinion, when it comes to having to earn something. Because if we do things in order to earn a certain feeling, it's strange that we would obstruct ourselves from giving ourselves the feelings we want to have. Because I think this idea of earning is what loses or makes us believe that we don't have it. Because when it comes to things like greatness or generosity or love or commitment, all these things are inside of ourselves. They're not something we had to earn. And if you take greatness, for example, greatness is something that we feel must be achieved or we feel like we must earn it with our, you know, with merit. But greatness is not meant to be earned. None of these things are meant to be earned. They're meant to be expressed. So whoever taught you or me that we had to earn and not express, then we're just proving to ourselves we don't have it because you're trying to earn it. And you can come up with any reason why you must earn it, but they will lead you down a dead, it will lead you down a dead road or a dead end because they're lies. And if you're in pain, you're probably convinced that you don't have what you really do have within you. Or it's even worse that we were taught that you had to earn it and there's nothing you can do to earn it. No matter how well you think, no matter how controlled your emotions are, no matter how controlled your expressions are, no matter how well you played a certain activity, it's not enough. I mean, if you did charity work, it, you're still going to feel that you haven't earned it yet. And that's not the way Neville is trying to teach us. Neville is saying reverse it to go to the feeling first and then let that express itself instead of going <laughs> and trying to achieve it. So you learn to sit down within yourself and you stop striving to achieve. That's why I made a video called Don't Try But Experience. Because to try to manifest, to try to gain, to try to earn, you're going to find yourself frustrated because you're not realizing you already have it. You're not realizing you don't have to earn it. It's something that you have to learn to truly grant within yourself that ability to actually have it and not try to have it. That's the difference. So you learn to experience what you are. Not as in thinking that you're this outer man trying to become the inner man. It's that you are the inner man. You know, Neville speaks so much about Jesus Christ. He always speaks about the Bible. But when you see it not as a man who existed 2,000 years ago or some thing that came, became flesh in that sense, but when you hear the term that whatsoever you desire, believe you have it and you will, if that statement's true, then I should try to understand what that's saying and how, how I can use it to my advantage. Because instead of seeing it as Jesus Christ, you see it as the inner man speaking to the outer man, that the inner man's Christ. And he's speaking to you, the outer man. And he's telling you, this being within you is telling you to believe you have it. But that's not really the point of this video. I really wanted to make this a point that you don't have to earn things inside. 
It doesn't really make sense. It's already there. It's something we have to accept. We have to learn that we must express what's inside, not earn it or try to earn it. We must give or allow ourselves the ability to change inside without feeling that we have to carry the burdens of our, pr- our current, current limiting state. You don't have to carry these burdens. Nobody said you had to carry the burdens of your current state that you dislike into the new one. It's something you're allowed to discard like a snake. It's something you're allowed to move. If you can just allow yourself to separate the self or the thinker and its thoughts or the self and its states, if you can allow that separation, you'll see that people are just expressing what they're thinking, but they're not those thoughts itself. And that's same for you. So if you can just separate yourself, you'll see that each state is like a, it is, it's like an article of clothing for the mind. It's a certain way of expressing ourselves. But we are allowed to change. Nothing really is permanent inside. It allows us the ability to not question if we're worthy. It allows us just to change. It's not something you have to sit down and meditate hours on end to wonder when you're going to be worthy enough to accept something within yourself. Because in imagination, if you were to able to conceive of it, if you're able to conceive of yourself the way you would like to be, imagination has already approved you. It's not something you have to wonder if you're worthy of obtaining inside. It's already been approved inside. And and we can find ourselves questioning and asking ourselves so many, or just throwing judgments upon ourselves, and that's really what stops us from allowing this internal abundance to grow. It's These judgments and this comparison is what doesn't allow us to feel free inside because we're so focused on the outside. We're not really inward focused. And when you go inward focus, you find yourself to be a being inside. And this being is not, it's not, it's not really visible, but you feel that you're inside. You feel like you're inside your own skull in a way. Neville said he would close his eyes and he would just pay attention to the darkness, into the, um, the liquid, he would call it. I find that to be a very good way to get into a meditative state is you just feel like you're almost looking inside yourself. And just rest in that position for a while until it allows you to feel peace. Once you start to feel that peace, I think it's wise from that point to either make a scene or hear something um, that you would like to hear. But truly, when you go to hear something inside yourself, truly feel that you're listening. Take upon the ad the same way you would listen to somebody you admire or you somebody really important to you. And you listen to them and you pay attention and you trust what they say. That's the same attitude you have to have inside because that's what you would have on the outside. So you mimic what's outside within. And that's what Neville says that, you know, give it sensory vividness or make it like the flesh because that's what's natural. That's what we're used to. So you want to mimic the outer world and you're seen in that sense. But you don't have to have a, a perfective, you know, a, a perfect type of scene. But you're allowed to, I mean, you can perfect it, but I would recommend you kind of go for the feeling or the, the, what is the scene trying to embody about you? It's about what does it mean about you? And accept that. You accept it. You feel um, whatever. If you feel like it's bubbling up inside, allow it to grow. Whether it's a, a novel would always say it's a relief for him. It's a deep, deep relief. For me, it's um, more of a peace. I feel a deep sense of peace. Um, at times, it can feel like a relief. But for me, it's I feel calmer. I feel so much more relaxed. And I don't allow myself to jump out of that state because the only thing that's going to take me out of that state is myself inside i may think a thought i don't want but it doesn't mean i'm necessarily out of the state i don't i can just simply feel because it's the feeling that manifests it's not so much the thoughts because you and i can have a million thoughts but there's a general feeling that we feel about ourselves and that's what is really what manifests in our life the, the feelings that we dwell in about ourselves uh, the ones that we revert back to always, whether it's good or bad, it's up to us. But there's certain states inside that you will find you do desire and you do want them and you do and you do have them because they're in you. It's just you might have fallen to the idea that you had to earn it. You might have fallen to the lie that you there's nothing you can do to earn it or you're not worthy enough to earn it. But it's already in you. It's like love. It's already there. You don't really have to search for it the more you go outward, it's just going to make you come back inward because you're going to see it's not out there. That it's always been dwelling within you. 
So remember what Neville said, that he never barred himself. He said, I had no financial background, no social background, I wasn't known, I was broke, and all of these things. He said that nobody knew me. But he assumed that he was known. So he didn't bar himself. He says, I find myself in some of the prestigious clubs, and yet I wasn't an academic. I didn't have, a social, I didn't have an academic background. But he goes, I never barred myself. He never restricted himself on the inside. We're already restricted enough on the outside. It's best to learn how to free yourself from within. There's so many ideas that come into our lives. We have these gods that come in and and they almost want us to kneel. I remember when I learned about the Catholic God and it almost felt like it intruded upon my mind and it's asking me to obey it. And it almost felt like I did. And I find myself uh, having these ideas penetrating my mind and telling me to obey them. But the choice really is ours, who we're going to serve in our, inside ourselves. And learn to serve yourself. Learn to be a servant towards yourself. Learn to give towards yourself. So when I say that imagination is complete, and I tell, and Neville tells us that man is all imagination, that means you're complete. It's just something, you, know, you don't have to earn it. It's something that is. Because imagination is complete. How can imagination lack anything? So the next time you go to imagine, learn to not judge yourself and just experience or lose yourself as Neville's. Lose yourself in the scene. So there's no more questions being asked. You're actually losing yourself in the thing you're hearing or in the thing that's being told to you about yourself. You actually lose yourself. You believe you have it. And learn how to believe in yourself. And if you practice this, I firmly believe that you will change the course of your life. It's something that you must try. You have to just test it. So when you go to imagine, lose yourself. And then you'll see the questions are in the, in the judgments of yourself and the comparison are going to dwindle down. And then a peace is going to come up. And when that peace comes, allow it to grow. And you can learn to live in this new home. And that's how you change states inside. That's how you leave that present state and go into the new one. You don't need to bring any of that burden from the current one into the new one. So break the habit of barring yourself and learn to free yourself inside. I'm glad that helped. The wish fulfilled is not something that should make you anxious. When you use the law, you shouldn't use the law to try to just continuously consume things. You learn to stop desiring. So it's not something that you feel nervous about when you feel that wish fulfilled. If there was a genie that granted you what you wanted, you wouldn't feel anxious if he granted you what you wanted. And that's how, kind of how it is in the inside. You want to go within yourself and be your own genie. You don't want to wait upon a second god. And I'm going to stress this again, that there aren't two powers. There's no, when, we say, when I say god, there's no two gods. I mean, there's no two causes. That's what I mean by god. Because there's so, there's so many gods in this world, and when you imagine, and if you think in your mind while you're imagining something, or when you're praying, as the Bible would say, and your mind goes to some other God outside of you, hoping that he's listening to you, hoping that he sees your prayer, or they see your prayer, whoever it is, a plethora of gods is like, you know, looking at you. If you have that, you should remove that. You're going through some outside God to get what you want. You're hoping that he sees your imaginal act. It tells us that God doesn't judge after appearances. So the cause of life doesn't judge after appearances, but after the heart of man or the mind of man. So God sees what we do on the inside, not on the appearances. So if God sees what I do on the inside, and I'm imagining safety and whatever it is I want, and he sees that, then I trust that he saw it. I trust that he sees what I'm imagining, that he doesn't judge after, he doesn't see the external act. This is the shadow of God. You don't look at your shadow and ask it what it wants. <laughs> you, it, it follows you. You don't follow it. So you would learn to start living internally. You, you live in, in this inner world where you feel fulfilled. You walk feeling the wish fulfilled. And it's not something that should stress you out. It should never be something that completely stresses you out. You know, Neville was asked a question, that, is there a sign inside of you that allows you to feel that it's done? And Neville said the only sign that he has for him is relief. So relief, it's not something stressful. That's why he says, don't burst a blood vessel. 
So I guess I just want this to be um, a reiteration of the same message, which is the wish fulfilled is not something stressed with a present tense feeling of being. It's something you are allowed to discard time. You're allowed to discard the senses and imagine. You don't have to judge after the appearances. And you can be like God and mimic this or be like cause and mimic, mimic it. If you don't like the word God, you can always use cause. There's no two causes. And when you start to accept that, the peace that you get is so profound and you can actually sustain it and rest in it. It's not too good to be true. There really isn't, in my opinion, from what I've seen, a different cause. I've tried to pinpoint it to other gods, but I can't seem to find that. As I said, these gods enter your mind and they tell you what to do. They tell you how to live inside yourself. Even in a, a person of authority can come into your mind and you feel that you have to obey them. You don't. I'm not telling you to just disregard everybody in that sense and be rude, but you don't have to listen to anybody. You really don't. The inner man kind of doesn't. The inner man doesn't, you, you inside it kind of don't. You will, you will be in your bed and you'll close your eyes next to you know you're somewhere else inside yourself. You don't really care about the appearances as much as you think you do. Because many of the times people have panic attacks and fears from thoughts. So they don't really care. We don't really care about these senses as much as we think. We care more about how we live and dwell inside. And I'm telling you, as somebody who has dwelt in very desolate places inside myself, you are allowed to live in freedom inside. There are places in you where there's forgiveness. I'm going to give this idea. I was going to talk about this in the future, but I was meditating once and I stumbled upon this. And I didn't see it as clear as I would see you and me, but it was pretty clear. And I saw a wall. It was a giant infinite wall. And there's millions and millions of mouths on this wall. And they're all talking and yapping and spitting and just a bunch of mouths. And I felt that I could choose any mouth I wanted on this wall. There was one there was one that was silent, it was closed. There's one that was speaking just <laughs> bigotry and there's other ones. There's a bunch of mouths and I could have chosen whichever one and then I was taken to this other land and again, it was just a bunch of eyes, and I was able to see what I wanted to see, how I wanted to perceive myself. I was able to choose the eyes I wanted to look with. And then there was ears, a wall of ears, and I was able to hear what I wanted to hear. Inside here, I was able to build myself. I was able to choose the things I wanted inside here. And if you start to living inside, you will see that you are the God of thought inside. That thoughts really don't rule you. It's only your belief that they do rule you, that they do. It's just like Vanilla Sky when he gets when in the scene of the restaurant where the man comes up to him and he asks him or he tells him that this is his world that all these people are here because of him and he tells him to you know says to shut the fuck up and the next thing you know they all start talk they stop talking and he goes see that you can make them obey you and you can make them destroy you and they're you're their god and in a sense when you start living inward the senses become really a shadow it becomes an effect of life instead of feeling ruled by it just like how you would if you were to awake inside a dream you would start to imagine and change the dream the dream becomes an effect it becomes after not before but you might find yourself in a dream just the same way you'd find yourself in a dream you don't know how you got there you don't know really where you are but you know that you are and that's enough to know that you are aware to know that you're awake is enough to change the dream and Zenvo says, you can change the dream. And there's people who say, I work so hard at it. And he says, that's why you're failing. If you really believe that all things are possible to God, and God is your own wonderful human imagination, and that his ways are higher than your ways, then what are you interfering with that state for? Just assume it and let it be. And he goes, so many times people tell me that I work so hard at it. And he says, that's why you're failing. So it's not something that you have to strive for. Again, there's no earning inside. It's truly an acceptance that you can live there now. You have to see that the moment inside yourself, you start to see yourself in a new way, in a new light. You imagine yourself in a new way. You are allowed to stay there now. You don't have to revert back. No one, there's no rule inside of you that tells you you must stay in this state of mind. You have to refrain it because the senses show, because the people have said, you have to stay here. You don't. The senses, these five senses and these, these people's words, they, they come into your, into your mind and they really start to dictate things. And you allow it. I'm telling you, don't allow it. There was this woman who really had these, um, 
she had financial problems. And she came up to Neville and she gave him a whole list, a laundry list of all the problems she had. And he said he just looked at her and he just smiled and said, don't accept it. And I have that same attitude when it comes, cause just because I've, ta- I've been talked to so terribly in my life for so long. And I've had so many words said to me that have entered my mind and I've allowed them to just dictate where I live and what I should do inside myself. And I'm telling you, don't allow it. You don't need anyone's permission inside to change. You don't need my permission to stay there. Now, you might need a push, that's fine, but you don't need permission from anyone. The inner man does not need permission. The inner man's allowed to deny the senses if it wants. And that's really you. That's what I mean by the inner. The inner man's just awareness. You really don't, there's no rules inside. You don't even have to have thoughts if you don't want to. You don't have to think of anything. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to judge yourself. You know, we're taught so much in this world to judge ourselves. The moment we look, we, you know, the, this, a lot of, I'm just going to be honest, a lot of the world thrives off of your insecurities. It thrives on putting insecurities in you and making you believe it. It thrives on making you believe you don't have things. And then it tells you that it has the thing you need. It tries to make you feel like you need things. And I'm telling you, don't do that. You don't have to believe that. You're allowed to feel deep down that you have it. That's the test. To believe I have something I don't. That's the test. Can I do that? And if you are successful, you will have it. But only I can really decide inside myself whether I have it or not. Am I trying to get it or do I have it? Am I still in desire? Then I should stop. And this is not something that is stressful. It's so relieving. As Neville said, it's a relief. So don't accept it. Don't allow it. Learn to break the habit of feeling that you need to be a desiring self inside and turn to being a fulfilled self inside because that is available to you. As all things are inside, you don't have to earn anything. Remember what it says in the book of Isaiah that come, eat, and drink without price. So there's no, I don't have to pay anything. It doesn't judge after my qualifications. Again, it doesn't look to the appearances. So don't disqualify yourself and don't compare yourself and judge yourself to oblivion and make yourself feel that you are unqualified to accept something. God doesn't judge after the appearances. We look through the appearances and we say, well, it's impossible. But that's not what the cause does. The thing inside of us doesn't look to it at all. It's asking us to believe. It's asking for our faith. You can't please him without faith. So I have to let go of my reason and go to faith. But I don't have faith in a God outside of me, but to the one within me. The only one that there is. So the way I've learned to build my own faith is by believing there are not two gods, there aren't two causes, there's only one, and the cause is within. That allows you to, if you, if I can tell you something to meditate upon for the rest of your life, it would be that there are not two gods. There's only one cause, and it's imagination. If I can just get you to assume that and dwell upon it and really play with it, You will let go of this God and you'll let go of those person's words. You'll drop that judgment. You will realize that this person really doesn't understand what they're saying. You will just learn to drop all the gods in the in the sky. You'll bring them down. You'll realize that none of them really have any power to do anything. You realize that everything we do is made from our own hands. And these are all just symbolic messages or symbols representing that this world really is feeling clothed in symbolic form. And when you see it that way, you will stop worshiping it. We create these buildings to worship wood and stone. But really the, the true worship is having faith in the one being, which is within us. And when you really feel and firmly believe that there is only one cause and it's imagination, when you really, really accept it, you will live your life upon it and you won't go to anything else because you know you can't and you allow yourself to give yourself the good now because the one who gives me the bad is the same one who gives me the good and this connects and I'm going to end this with the connection between the book of Job and us as Neville said that the book of Job is not that Job was wrong or he was a wrong person it's that he imagined the wrong things and that's the same for you and I that you're not wrong, you just imagine the wrong things. And 
the one who creates the wrong in me is the one who creates the right, or the one who creates the bad is the one who creates the good. And I trust that. And when you accept it, you live upon it, and you will create a beautiful life inside of you, and you will live from the inside out. So I'm glad it helped. So I recently had a dream where Neville was involved, and I've had several dreams where Neville was involved, but I never shared them because I felt that they were pretty personal. Um, I think I was too much in my own head as to how they would be perceived. But this dream I had, I wouldn't say it was the most emotionally impactful, but it was the one that really has made me contemplate on it for the past week. So I've had this dream, I haven't shared it because I really needed to think it through. It was a very interesting dream. And so the setting, I'll just give the setting. The setting is basically a large grassy field and the blades of grass are like medium length. And there's a giant, like a giant bright light. Kind of like in a circular form, but it's just a bright light. And around it, there's darkness. But this light is just, it's so bright. And it's casting a very dark shadow on the blades of grass. And I see Neville, and he he's walking to the light. I see him looking at the light and walking to it. And I remember feeling like, oh, I got I to gotta go talk to him. And I, I was semi-conscious, but I wouldn't say I was fully awake. And I did, I felt, I guess what I mean by that is I felt like if you ever feel like when you go on a dream, you feel like you join like a roller coaster, you're just like midway on the ride. That's kind of what this felt like, but I also was somewhat aware. And I ran up to him and I caught up to him and I said, I, I kind of felt like every time he appears in my dreams, he's always so busy. And I remember feeling kind of sad about that. I mentioned it. I said, you know, Neville, every time I see, and he, we're just walking. And I said, you know, every time I see you in my dreams, you're always so busy. You never have any time for me. And what I felt, I said those words, but what I felt was more that, in, in a sense, I did feel that. I was like, I put so much time into your work and... I felt like I really studied it and I really take this so seriously and I really believe in what you're teaching, even the stuff that doesn't really make sense to me, I believe it. And I felt like I wanted him to be in some sense proud. I guess I wanted him to give me some form of validation and he could feel that from me. And when he, the moment I knew he felt it, because the moment he felt it, he turned around, he stopped looking at the light, he stopped, turned towards me, and he pulled out a letter. He go, he puts his hand in his uh, chest pocket. He he had like a kind of a light jacket on. He pulled out a letter and gave it to me. And when he handed me the letter, I opened it, and it was just all it said was "thank you." And I felt um, a deep, genuine thankfulness from him. And I had a lot of mixed emotions in this moment because a part of me felt like I felt his thankfulness, but then this other part of me was very personal because growing up, I had a very difficult life and I would feel that I felt like a servant most of my life, to be honest. And whenever I felt like I did something, that I was commanded to do and I was told thank you after. I, I never felt like the thank you was enough. I never felt like that thank you was at all fulfilling. I actually hated hearing thank you. I, I, I dreaded those words because I felt like I'm only being thanked because I'm being obedient. And so those words were very personal to me. And then... So while I'm having all these emotions, I'm sort of wondering, well, what is it that I'm expecting Neville to give me? Like, why do I need so much from him? And I'm thinking of all of this. And then he turns around and he just starts going towards the light again. And I remember just putting the, I was like, I looked at him, I was like, I looked up and, and he was, I should say this, he was on my peripherals while I was reading the letter, which just said, thank you. But it felt like I read it for a while because I was staring at it, contemplating on my emotions. 
he was kind of smiling with, he didn't show his teeth, but he was just gently smiling. And then he turned around and he went towards the light again. And that's when I put the letter in my pocket and I just started following him. And I woke up. That was the dream. And there were so many thoughts that I've had after. I just had so many emotional uh, waves and just a lot of mountains that I had to climb in my mind to really see what's going on. And so I shared the dream with a friend and he thought it was beautiful. And then I shared it with my lovely partner. And she, she had an interesting take on it that really put into perspective the dream on a certain level. There's different levels to this dream. And on the one level she pointed out, she said, it seems like you wanted his validation so badly. It seems like the desire for Neville's validation was greater than the light because you didn't even look at the light that he was looking at. And it almost seemed like you were consumed with fulfilling your little ego and fulfilling the little desires of it. And I really took that message to heart. And the more I thought about it, it was true. Um, my desires were far greater. They, it totally exceeded. Um, it, my desires had my full attention. And I didn't have it in the light. And I think it's quite difficult because the dream really dissolved a lot of my self in a way, or at least what I thought was myself. I have been questioning a lot of my motives and been questioning what really I desire in life. I thought I wanted things and now I don't know if I want them anymore. And so this dream really shook me because it did feel like my desires were so small and yet I made them so big where they completely had my entire attention. And yet Neville's attention wasn't on me, it was on the light. And I felt ignored by him. And I expressed my distress towards him. And yet, I never even thought about the light. I never looked at it. I never. I, I knew it was there, but I didn't care for it. I just wanted uh, my desire to be fulfilled. I wanted my validation. I wanted my acceptance. And I'm so thankful that he, he gave me his own thankfulness. That, you know, the idea that I was trying to make Neville proud, it's almost as if I think he lacks that feeling in him. I want to give it to him so he can give it back to me. And the idea of me needing his validation so bad was, it really showed me how my desire there hasn't been fulfilled within myself. As I said before, that the things we want from others to give us are really the things we want to give ourselves. So I was really seeking my own validation. And yet I was looking to him to give it to me. And he didn't. He gave me his genuine thankfulness. And to be honest, I'm so glad he did that because it dissolved this desire that I needed to be quenched. I felt like I, I, he just showed me, you don't need me to do that. You don't need, you don't lack anything is what I felt. And so her interpretation was very eye-opening for me. And it's really made me question what's important in life to a very strong degree. And, and I want to take it from another angle because on the one hand, it's true that my desires were, had all my attention it's also true that when I went back into the dream, I revised it, but I didn't necessarily change anything. I just took what she said seriously and I instead looked at the light. So I went back in the dream and when he was walking in front of me as I was following him, 
I revised it and looked at the light instead. And when I tell you, I felt a very profound feeling when I stared at this light. I felt a feeling of togetherness with Neville, like a deep connection, and which was odd because when I would look back at Neville, I felt very alone, I felt lonely. Yet when we both looked at the light, I felt together, and I just kept doing it back and forth. And when I stared at this light, I didn't have a single desire. And and then I started to feel that we're looking at ourself, that that light is us. And that's why I feel together with it. I felt that I was looking at myself and I couldn't believe that I was a light. And then the more I thought about the dream, I remember Neville's words saying that he always talks about how the scriptures are going to be fulfilled within you. And I take that seriously. I don't take it from a religious standpoint. I think it's a journey. And when I read the scriptures and it says that I'm the light of the world and that those who follow me will not be in darkness, will not walk in darkness, and then I find myself in a dream and I'm following Neville and we're going towards a light and yet my desires blinded me. But yet I was still on the same course, but my desires did blind me. And when I read this character that Neville spoke so much about Jesus Christ speak, say that I'm the light of the world, I felt like within me I, I found that light. And it's in all of us. It's in Neville, it's in me, it's in you. And yet, validation was more important. And I realize how much I've convinced myself that I desire things that I really don't have to desire. And we shouldn't desire things, because we don't have to desire. And when people hear that, they think I'm telling them to just be homeless and, you know, don't even wear shoes because, you know, don't desire shoes. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying you don't have to live in desire. It's it's a freedom that I that has been offered here. And this light was only seen because I really believed in Neville's message. I believed in what he said. Even though I really didn't have evidence. He said if and this is really the message that God became man so that man will become God. And if you take that message and accept it, it's a seed. It will plant itself within you and you will be given these dreams. You will see, you will see Neville in your dreams as well. And you both will look at that light and you'll know you're looking at yourself. And in order to see myself as that light, I have to dissolve Edward. And even Edward, this is just an avatar. This is just a name I created. Everything that Edward is, is because I am. So if Edward is whatever, it's because that's really how I am. But Edward can't be without me. So why am I so concerned with, you know, boasting and trying to puff up this Edward when Edward really isn't anything? It's just I created Edward. It's nothing without me. And that's how I felt about this light. Like, what are my desires? compared to this light. And so this character that Neville talks about so much called Jesus Christ tells us how to use our inner ears and our inner eyes and our inner mouths that we're told by this light to hear good news. That if it's, you know, the the saying says that, you know, it's four months until harvest. And he says... He says to wake up and use your eyes and see that the fields are ripe and ready for harvest. And this is not a one act. This is not something you just do one time. You don't just look to the world and say, oh, it's four months into harvest. Oh, well, I'm going to visualize that it's ripe one time. No, this is an everyday thing. This is an every moment to everything. You don't judge by the senses on any level. You're always seeing ripe harvest. You're always seeing your neighbor fulfilled. You're always seeing... It's an infinite power. You're always seeing um, them happy and joyful. You see them 
you see yourself the way you want to see yourself. You don't allow yourself to fall into sin and desire inside yourself. That's really all sin is. And that this light came to forgive sin. And when I felt I'm, I forced myself to merge with it. And I felt like I was, I was that light itself. But in order for me to be that light, I'd have to get rid of my, this lowly being that I was inside myself. And now I understand why Neville was looking at it. I thought he was ignoring me, but he wasn't ignoring me at all. He was looking at himself. And then when I saw myself in that light, I felt together with him. I felt one with him. And this light is in everyone. It's the one cause. That's what it felt like. There was no darkness in this light. And that's what it tells us, that there's no darkness in God. It tells us that God's light. And what does William Blake say? That for those poor souls, God appears as light to those poor souls who dwell in night. But does the human form display to those who live in the realms of day? So you and I are living in the realms of day, and we display this human form. But we really are that light. And when God appears as light, it's because we're living in darkness. But that light is not found on the outside. It's not the sun in the sky. It's a light from within. And this light, you don't place it underneath a table. You don't place the lamp underneath the table. You let it shine. And I would say that it transforms you when you look at it. You don't judge it. You just look at it. And speaking of judgments, when you start to live and you start to live in this way of the imagination and you hear good news, and you, regardless of what you heard, you hear with your inner ears good news, you speak wonderful things inside. Because it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, it's what comes out. And that voice is the inner voice. What comes out of that is what defiles a man. So it's not, so God is so intimate. This light, this being is in us, it sees everything. It doesn't judge after our senses. It doesn't really care about our senses, what I've learned. And I think I was so blinded by desiring all these things that I didn't even see my own sin. I was so concerned with fulfilling it instead of walking in that fulfillment, walking as if the, the, uh, the harvest was already ripe. And so when you start following the teachings of imagination, which is to hear good news, to see the ripe harvest, when you start to follow this, you're following the ways of that light. You're following the ways of, right? And when Jesus says, if I'm your Lord, then follow my teachings. Well, that Lord is the light of the world that I saw. So I'm following its teachings that Neville laid out. But Neville didn't really didn't lay it out because he was just reading the Bible as well. And it really has nothing to do with good or good or bad. It had nothing to do with it. Your judgments of good and evil should be gone. That is us using our imaginations to eat the fruit of good and evil, to judge whether things are right and wrong. It's not what we're here to do. It tells us that this light didn't come to judge the world or to condemn it, but to forgive it. So it's all good news. I didn't feel that that light was embarrassed by me. I felt one with it. I didn't feel that by being one with it, I was bringing it down. And then I understood this is why Neville's looking at it. He's looking at God. He's looking at himself. But it's not done on the outside. There is no God on the outside. There is no God on the outside. It's within. And that's what this journey is all about. It's an inward journey. That's what William Blake said, although it, appears, although it appears without, it is within, in your own wonderful human imagination. And I don't say that to parrot Neville. Um, I don't care to parrot. I, I, and to be honest, I feel like he's written so much and said so much. Um, I just like to share it, what I learned from him. But I feel like he's laid out so much that I don't know how much more there is to add. I can maybe add my own way of saying it, but 
in the end, it's the same light that he saw that I was looking at. It's the same light that anybody saw when they speak of the light. And so, I think that this message can be very practical because I used to think that you fulfill a desire and then you have another desire and you fulfill it. No, it's walking totally feeling fulfilled all the time. It's to practice the ways of that light. It doesn't see me. It sees me as himself. And then if you take it on a deeper level, well, who's having this dream? Who's the dreamer? Who's dreaming up Neville? And who's dreaming up the light? It's all me. And so I didn't, I didn't feel that Neville was bringing that light down by making himself equal with it. He really, I could tell Neville, just by the look in his eyes, I could tell that he was, he was amazed by what he was looking at. He was, his attention was so on it. And the only thing that stopped him was him feeling my distress. That was the only thing. But he, it only stopped it for a second. He turned right back around and started looking at that light again. And now seeing it from all these different angles, I was able to feel a connection instead of feeling lonely as I you know, did in the beginning of the dream. And I think that the war that we have within ourselves of this, this fighting between good and evil, it starts to cease, it goes away because you stop judging after the senses. You stop wondering if you're good or if you're bad. You instead eat on the tree of, the, of life, which is a uh, desire fulfilled. You start eating on that tree. And the tree of life is, is Jesus Christ. It's the light. It's the same light I saw. That is the tree of life. And that's how we use our imaginations. So don't, I, didn't, I didn't feel that any bit of what I've done here as far as me writing on Neville's work and me talking about it, I don't feel that it gave me any more merit with God, with that being within me. I didn't feel like it, you know, pat me on the head and said, you know, you're better, you're good. I didn't feel any of that. I felt the same. I feel the same as anybody else. I don't think that you can gain merit with this thing. I don't think it can't you you do outward actions <laughs> so many so many times I mean there are people who live in gesture they just want to do the gesture they don't but deep down they have a whole different thinking and speaking and they think that they're fooling the thing on the outside but yet it is God cannot be mocked he hears every word you say inside because God is not on the outside the cause is within so there are people who just want to do the gesture. They just want to do what they think the right thing is. And some think they gain merit. As the Pharisees did in the, in the scriptures, they gave their ten, their ten leaves of mint. And they think they're gaining merit with God, but you don't gain merit. You're already one with it. Um, there's a lot more to this that I need to look into, but I'm just sharing an experience I had. And I've had other dreams that I can share with Neville, but this one... I wanted to share because I felt like it was relevant to everyone. I didn't feel that this was something very personal. I mean, even I had a personal element because it is my dream. It felt like it needed to be shared. And it felt like it was something that could free somebody. And I think that the way this works is that you have to accept that message that Neville gave. And I know his I know his spiritual stuff can sound so boring. And take it from me, I was somebody who used to just skip all that stuff. I, I would just skim it and be like, okay, cool, 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 whatever he has to say. Yeah, but what about the law? <laughs> just being honest, that's how I was. But over the past maybe year and a half, I haven't wanted to know anything about the law. All I wanted to know was about the promise. That's all I wanted to know. And I think that famine that the scriptures speak of came upon me. I didn't really think I could be satisfied by anything. I felt like I was trading in a very temporal desire for that light. And then I started to understand how weird it looks to worship 
wood and stone. Imagine if you created a, a being and you're its creator and it just decides to worship a tree and you're kind of confused. You look at it very confused. Like, I made you. Why are you worshiping the tree? And doesn't it tell us that this God's a jealous God, that he's going to get us all back? He says, what did I, you know, the, the people in the scriptures turned away from God to worship these idols. And these idols, it says, are worthless. And by them worshiping these idols, they became worthless themselves, just like the idols they worship. So we become the things we worship. And if we worship useless wood, then guess what we're going to be? Ourselves. But it doesn't judge you. It just tells you to come back. This God's jealous. He says, what did I do to you? To, to, this is, now imagine this being the cause speaking. What did I do to you to find, to find fault in me that you leave me? It even says that you're being a harlot and going to all these gods. Come back to me. And so I, f- I feel that it, well, it, this is a very important message that Neville gave. And I think it's not well understood because it sounds cryptic, but he's really just speaking about experiences that he had within himself. And I feel like I finally understand what he means. That we really are one. We are all that one being, that we're all going to eventually see that we are that light. And that light in us is us. And that light caused everything. And you're not going to bring it down by making yourself equal to it. You are equal to it. So I hope this message really, I hope you take it and you plant it in yourself. I hope you accept it. That God actually became you. That you may become God. So, and I don't say this to not use the law, but just learn to not desire so much. Learn to be fulfilled. I think what the dream showed me was that I was so used to desiring that I almost didn't know what I was if I wasn't desiring. I almost didn't know. I feel like my whole identity was wrapped around desiring. So who am I if I'm not desiring? So I hope that, again, I hope that this message really reaches you in in the depths of your being. I don't want it to reach the shallow parts. You're much deeper than you think. You're actually the deep, you are essential. You are, you are essential to this. And we are all going to awake, but we're not going to awake. We're going to be totally transformed into that light. That's, that is us. I don't know how else to share it, but that is us. So I, I want you to take this message and just learn the ways of imagination by not living in lack inside yourself. So whatever it is that you're wanting, just learn to ignore the senses and really walk feeling fulfilled. I don't care if someone says you don't have it or you're never going to have it. Just focus in on that light inside. Focus in on the inner world. Truly. Not as something that you do once here and there, but really live upon this. Like, really test it. Really feel fulfilled. Try to go a whole day feeling fulfilled. The moment a desire comes, just fulfill it. Don't say four months until harvest. Don't say that inside. Don't feel that. But feel it's already ripe. All the time. So you feel very abundant inside but to be honest it doesn't really matter if you live in desire or not you are forgiven that that light is your essence of your being so whether you use the imagination lovingly or unlovingly it doesn't really matter but life here is really this is death this is darkness really but it's all flipped now So you're going to need money and food here. So use your imagination wisely and feel that you're fulfilled in those areas. 
in all areas. Just be in that state. Learn to not be in the state of desire, even if you've habitually been desiring for so long as I, I mean, my desire was so, my, my desire, my little desire was so big, I, I literally didn't care about the light in front of me that Neville, Neville was so interested in. So take it from me. You don't need to desire. You really dissolved all of it. To be honest, a lot of my desires almost seem silly when I think about it. But hey, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting something in this world. I think everybody does. But I don't view the world the same anymore. I really view it the way Neville viewed it. And I am having my own experience with it. Maybe I didn't have the direct experiences that he had, but mine is very similar. It's the same idea that this light that he talks about, you find it within yourself and really know that you're looking at yourself, that you are the light of the world. And I don't, I do not say this to make you egotistical or narcissistic. I, I really don't. That's not why I'm saying this. I, I mean it. I really mean that. You really are the light of the world. It's almost incredible, but it, it's, he's right. It's true. I don't exactly know what happens from here, but all I know is that there is a way to live upon the imagination. As I said, to speak good words, to hear good news, to see good things. And that is the, the first act, is repentance. That's, the first, that's what we first should do. And then we believe that message that Neville gave. Just accept it. Just accept that you're the light of the world. Don't think, oh, maybe it'll happen tonight, or you'll have a dream tonight, but don't seek for it in the world. It's not, the light is not out there. The more outward you go here, you're, you're just losing sight. And so if you want to stop walking in darkness, go inward and just accept it. You know, you don't have to, as Neville said, you don't have to feel arrogant about it. Just walk knowing that you're, you are that. Ignore the senses and just walk just as though you are it. So I hope you take this message and you accept it. I'm just sharing, as Neville said so often, from my own experience. And I want you to look at this thumbnail. And I want you to see how there's only one shadow, but two men staring at the light. That we really are one when we look at it. And so I invite you to look at yourself. To accept that that is you. And I hope that you, like me, dissolve your desires you dissolve this little ego and you do not feel that you're underneath that light. And understand that this light doesn't care what you've done in the sense world, in this world. It doesn't care. It doesn't really matter what you've done. Now is a perfect time to assume something new. It doesn't matter. You are allowed to completely change right now because you are the cause of the person you are right now. You are the cause of the change inside you. So if you dislike a certain state you're in and then you go to change your state but you still feel the urge or the nagging voice of the old state, that old man is you. You, are, you keep it alive as much as you want it to be alive. You are allowed to completely be different if you want to be. You are allowed to stop desiring the thing you desire so badly. You are allowed to walk in fulfillment. And that is what it means to pray ceaselessly. That's what it means to be in prayer always. And so the greatest war, we have all these wars between countries and we have so many wars in our lifetimes. And yet the greatest war of all is the war for God. It is between the false God and the true God. That is the greatest war, and that's within ourselves. It's greater than the war of good and evil within ourselves. 
is we have those, the, you know, the little, everyone knows about the, the little devil on your right shoulder, or I don't, know, I don't remember which one it is, but it's like the left shoulder is an angel and they whisper things in your ear. Well, that has a cause. And that causes you. So the cause of good and evil is you. So you don't have to keep judging after those things and trying to figure all that out. You instead assume something new for you. And you don't need to do anything on the outside. All change and movement is in the inside. Just trust that. Really trust it. And really test that. Really have faith in yourself. Don't wait for someone to come to believe in you. Don't be like me waiting for Neville's approval. I should have given myself that approval. I should have given myself my own validation. That's what I should have done. And that's what I learned. And it, there was no harsh feelings or anything. It's all wiped away. I understood the message. I had a desire that I needed to be quenched, and it was quenched. But I found something way more than that. I understand why he stares at that light. So when the day comes and the war ends, you'll be left with that light. There won't be another God. And you'll see the cause of your good and evil inside yourself. And you'll stop eating off that tree. And you'll start truly seeing with your divine eyes. And you'll truly hear with your divine ears. And you'll speak with that divine mouth. It's when we take ownership do we really take care of things. I mean, I, I, I've been in places where, you know, I've seen people at parties where like they drop a beer and glass shatters and it's just a mess, but it's not their house, so they leave it. I've seen them, they just left. They're like, well, it's not my place. You know, it's when we have ownership, do we really take care of things? And when you don't think you have the ownership of your own inner voice, your own thoughts, that you have the ownership of thoughts, that you have the ownership of your feelings, you have the ownership of your imagination, of your own inner ears and your eyes, that these are yours. The moment you accept ownership is when you really start to take care of it. When you really prune and you revise at the end of the night, you change it to what you want it to be, you plant a new seed for the morrow, you really take care of your own garden. But it's only when you feel ownership. So you feel ownership over the things you desire. Feel ownership over your everything on the inside. Just feel total ownership of it. And then you'll do something about it naturally. So I know this video is longer than normal, and I don't mind doing these. It's just I needed to share this. This had to be said. And I waited because I wanted to say it in a way that I hope seeps in. Because no two people are going to hear me in this video the same way. You might even listen to this video multiple times and then one day you're going to, you're going to, it's going to click. And I hope it clicks. The moment you have those, um, really the eureka moments, but nobody uses that word anymore. When you have that moment where you, it clicks for you in my videos, understand why it clicked. Don't let that go. Pa like pause the video or just, or just pay attention to repeat why that freed you. Repeat it through your day. What was it that freed me from this? And the moment it clicks again, do it again. Just contemplate on what frees you. It's all I do with Neville. I read him and whatever I feel freeing, I accept it. And I just try to understand why that freed me. That's all I do. And when he was sharing the, the story of the gospel, the good news, through his lens, I felt something. I felt that click moment. And I've, I, I've been writing about it for months, but this was the first time I had an experience. I've been journaling about, I've been saying, I've been talking about this light for so long in my own private journal, yet this is the first time I had an experience with it. I actually had an experience. And the experience did not take place on the outside. There is no Savior coming. Give it up. There's no God coming to save us. It's on the inside. Don't reject that inner Savior. It seems pointless. It seems useless. But then you gain everything. Because those who cling on to this life, this temporal life of death, those who cling on to this, they lose. They injure themselves. When you desire inside, you injure yourself. So, I hope that this becomes spiritual and practical for you. 
and that you learn to not put so much importance on this life, and instead put your focus on what Neville speaks about when he says that you are God. Really try to understand it. It is the thing that matters the most. And I hope that you too can see that you're that light as well. I hope that you have the same intensity that Neville had. And I hope you don't make your desires so big that you completely ignore this message that I've been there as well, that you completely ignore the spiritual things because you need it to work. I've been there. But just entertain yourself with this idea. And I hope that you have the same drive and the same attention and intensity that Neville had. And if you made it this far, thank you for listening. You know, William Blake, in my opinion, coined a term that, or I'm not sure if he coined it, but I just love this term that he said. He said, organ perception. He says that he doesn't obey organ perception. And it's the same thing that Neville says when he talks about the senses. But when you think of them truly as organs, and if you obey what your organs see and hear, um, you're going to always be desiring because you're never going to really see what you want to see and you're never really feeling like your your stomach is always hungry. No matter how much food you give it, it just becomes hungry again. And these organs are addressed in the scriptures. It's, you know, I'm the bread of life. Those who are like, I'm the living water. Those who, you know, drink the water that I give them, you know, they'll never thirst again. These organs become fulfilled. And so, so it's Christ who fulfills these uh, cries of the organs, right? Our hearts never want to be broken again. Our um, ears want to hear good news. Our eyes want to see what we want to see. Uh, and we, our stomachs want to be fed and we want to be f- uh, satisfied. And every organ, we gave them the gift of language and they speak to us. And some scream louder than others and we try to fulfill these organs. But we try to fulfill them with outer means. And we when you do that, you seem to run into a loop. You find yourself acting like the organs. You always, uh, you're hungry, and you know, you, you know, when you eat, you're gonna be hungry again. You never really feel satisfied because you are connected. Your your sense of self is connected to your organs. And when William Blake says he doesn't obey organ perception. I I am trying to get you to see that when he says that, he is being literal, like he's absolutely being 100% serious. He doesn't obey his organs. He sees them as windows. So the outer world that we're in, when you see a window, you, you can see your eyes. So you can uh, make things, you can attribute human qualities to these objects, and we can see ourselves in these objects, and then we can see how life is really a reflection of us. And by us, I don't mean our bodies. I mean the man within, you. When I make these videos, I try to poke you. I sh- try to shake you from your sleep. I, when I say the words, stop desiring, what tends to happen is the organs or the, the mortal ears, when they hear that, uh, and that those words travel down to the stomach, the stomach almost replies with, what do you mean I'm not, I'm not going to desire? You're going to tell me I'm not going to eat food? You're going to tell me I'm not going to eat anymore? How, how can I not... Uh, be hungry again. What do you mean? You know, this is um, this is why Christ doesn't make sense to people because they're trying to talk with their organs. They're, they they don't allow these words to penetrate within them. Within them, they just hit the organs and bounce off, and just reflect back or they react back. But what I'm trying to speak, who I'm trying to speak to, is the inner man. So when I say stop desiring, I am speaking to the inner man to stop desiring. And it makes so much more sense when you see it that way. You can get that moment where you understand what's being said. That is the inner man listening. You're no longer listening with your organs. You're no longer observing with your eyes. And I know this is very this is, sounds surreal, um, which in a, in a way I, I love surrealism. As, as my favorite art form, if you can't tell by my thumbnails, and I actually do surrealism myself. It's because I want to try to convey a message through images. Sometimes speaking is not enough. Because speaking, can I can inspire you. I can um, teach you what I know by my language. But 
images can provide a certain feeling that I'm trying to convey, um, and that can penetrate deeper than just words. So there's, there's, or I should say, it's different variations of penetrating the mind with the same idea, uh, given in word form, you know, uh, writing form or uh, art form or image form. So there's all these different types of forms that I try to convey with my with the paintings I choose. I try to establish a feeling in the painting. And I'm trying to establish that for the inner man, for you, not the organs again. And I'm going to keep repeating this because I I think in it, this has to be understood when Neville says that he doesn't obey his senses or he has he dies to himself and he resurrects to something new. These ideas sound ludicrous to the outer man. If the outer man were to hear this message, they would not understand it on any level. And I don't mean human being. I mean the the idea that man thinks he's his, his organs. He will react very badly to this message. It won't make sense um, when Christ says, "Don't say it's four four months until harvest. Look within and see that the harvest is already ripe." Or open your eyes. Stop being blind. Well, if I said that to you, you would say, well, what are you talking about? I can see with my eyes. I would tell you to stop being hungry. Your stomach replies with, what are you talking about? Uh, I try to tell you some good news and you're like, no, absolutely not. That doesn't make, that's that's not logical. So the ears reject it. But again, it's these organs that we're dealing with. They're not evil. They just need to be satisfied. Uh, you can almost talk to your own, you can talk to yourself in a way. You can ask what it is that each organ's afraid of, and you'll find it responds with something. And just listen, and then fulfill it. Know that it will be fulfilled. Um, but that's just like a, a, a certain way I'm trying to convey a certain idea, um, that the idea of stop desiring is not to tell you that you shouldn't want anything in life. I'm not telling you that you're not allowed to, I mean, you shouldn't even <laughs> allow me to ever tell you that anyways. But you shouldn't, staying in desire doesn't get you to what you want. So it's, it, that, is, that isn't logical either. It doesn't make any sense to desire. It almost doesn't make sense. Certain desires can propel us and they can direct us. But continuously remaining there, I don't see how it aids us in any way. We have to learn to start being fulfilled. I don't mean the organs. I mean our, our inner selves. We have to start walking around in our imaginations feeling fulfilled. So when I say stop desired, again, I'm speaking to your immortal ears. I'm speaking to the ears that are invisible, to the eyes that are invisible, the ones that can you can close these organs and yet you can still see. Um, you can still hear. You're not gone yet. And you don't need a sense any kind of one of the five senses, you don't need one of them or any of them to assume something about yourself. You don't need one. And you also don't need any reason to believe it. So you can learn to eliminate these obstacles that you've created for yourself. You don't need a reason because you're still in desire. You still need a reason. You don't need one anyways to believe something. Again, you don't need a sense to assume something. Once you allow yourself that freedom, the freedom to assume and the freedom to believe, I'm talking to you, the inner man, then you can actually start seeing what you want to see. You can stop being blind. You can start seeing the right, the ripe harvest. You can start hearing the news you want to hear. Um, and this message the devil gives is good news. It really is wonderful news. And the crux of it all is this, that God dreamt to be man in hopes that man may dream to be God. And I want, and just take that, what I just said, and just think about that for the next year. Just think about it. Really try to understand what's being said there. Because when you take the time to really chew on it, to chew on the idea, you can extract more from it. Because I didn't come to these ideas overnight. I really took whatever freed me that Neville said, that I felt that, um, opening inside me. I really wanted to understand what was being said. I took maybe a month or two just just thinking about that and trying to find different ways to say it that makes sense to me and try to um, feel that feeling of that freedom and try to label it something that I could understand. And the more you do that, the more you will get his message and why I guess I do speak about the promise more, why I'm so interested in it because I find 
it to be way more freeing than trying to figure out how to get the next item. I don't find that to be fulfilling. I don't think I've ever had a thing in my life that really fulfilled me that long. I think I became hungry again. But what I'm learning is the art of not desiring inside myself. And it's open to everybody that this message is for everyone to practice. It's a different way of using the imagination. We can spend our times using our imaginations to judge after good and evil, to wonder whether it's right or wrong, and to really argue with ourselves. But I, I find feasting upon a new tree, a new fruit, really it's not new, it's been said before, but the idea of feasting on fulfillment, then I think that if you can learn to change the imagining inside, you will create a better life within yourself and that will express itself externally. Now that's in the baseline. But when I spoke about the dream that I had about the light, that light is not, the light that Neville was staring at, it's not here to create another ism or another religion. It's not here to demand, a. <laughs> it's not here to create a political uh, movement. It's here to transform you from the inside out, to make the man of death into a life-giving spirit. That is, the, that is the promise that Neville speaks about. And I can't help but feel so interested in it. And I find myself, I found myself very bored with hearing about his message about the law when I would read him. And I was curious because I didn't quite understand him when he would speak about this light. I, I couldn't visualize it. I didn't understand what he meant. But now I really feel like I do get what he is saying. And it is a wonderful message that the light, the cause that you're looking for is not outside of you. You know, everyone thinks that there's a God outside of them that is watching them, that is critiquing their gestures and seeing what foods they put in their mouth. <laughs> and it tells you that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. Because what comes out of him comes from the, his mind. It's not what goes into a man. So it's not about the outside. So if, you, if you're shaming yourself for what you've done in the sense world, uh, you're wasting your time. You're, you're not even judged by your appearances. God doesn't judge after appearances, so he doesn't look at the execution of the act. He sees what happened inside. That's why you can't mock him. People think that they can lie to, to someone, but you, can, you cannot lie to God, or else you're proclaiming that God can be mocked. And that makes no sense. So this idea of this outside being, this outside God, truly, when I say the word God, you cannot think of something outside of yourself, as Neville said. You know, when I was younger, I went to Mass, um, and <laughs> there, was no, there was no seating in the pews, so I had to stand. And I'm standing there, and I remember, I'm not sure who told me, but someone told me that if you get on your knees, uh, it's more of, uh, you're kind of suffering for Christ. Your knees will start to, you'll start to feel the pains that he felt when he was, um, the, you know, Catholics love this imagery of Christ being flogged. I, I don't know why, but they do, uh, obviously. <laughs> but in this case, they're telling me that if I felt the pain on my knees, then I'm sort of more connected to Christ. So I connect to Christ through suffering is what I was taught. And I remember really feeling the pain in my knees when I was doing it. And I, I realized I couldn't help but feel like, well, I hope this God's watching because this hurts. You know, I hope he repays me. If he doesn't repay me with money, then I would hope he repays me with something because I'm not, I don't, I don't want to do this for free. I don't really like it. And I wouldn't understand why I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> but I really thought that if I did that, I would gain some type of merit. I would, um, he would look at me like I'm a good boy. You know, he would tap my head and tell me, good job. I was looking for that by doing that. And I see now how silly it is. But at the time, I didn't. And now that I, I see it's silly because I find God within. I, it, it's not on the outside to be worshipped. It says, make no images of me. And then what do we do? We make a bunch of images of this being. It says, make no images of me. So he doesn't have an image um, on the outside. He's all within. It is all within us. 
That light, I did not find it outside of me. It is within me, and it's within you. It's within every single person. Um, but if I'm speaking to your organs, it makes no sense. Because when you close your eyes, you see darkness. But inside myself in this dream, there was a bright light. And it, again, it, grasped, it grabbed Neville's attention. And I, I know that in the end, I'm the dreamer of all of this drama. But again, I need to share this message. I think it needs to be told that the organs that you obey every single day and the judgments that you carry with you, are, you're going to eventually have to shed them like a snake with its skin. Because the pearl of great price asks for everything of you. And we hold on, we come up to the merchant who's trying to sell us this pearl, and we're clutching our judgments and our prejudices. And we're clutching them, and so how much is it? And he says, all of it. It's cost every single prejudice. It costs every judgment of yourself. It costs everything. And we think that's too much of a price. So we turn away. We say, no, it's too expensive. That's way too expensive. We might even, you know, meet with some other people and say, could you believe that the guy's charging that for the price of that pearl? You know, it's probably a crappy pearl anyways. And we come up with these reasons on why we justify our, why we hold on to our prejudices and our judgments and why we hold on to this false God on the outside. We think that if we judge a certain way, think a certain way, feel a certain way, then this God will thank us. This God will feel worshipped. But again, God is not on the outside. There is no God on the outside to worship. So then what do we do? Well, it tells us to worship him with thanksgiving. To really feel thankful that we have. To feel fulfilled. We obey his commandments. And what does he say? To not obey your, sen your, your senses or your organs. And see that your harvest is ripe. Actually, he says the word see it. You know, and again in Isaiah it says, I will make something new. Don't think about the past. I'm going to make something new. Do you see it? Well, if, my, if I obey my organs, of course I don't see it. If I listen to my stomach, of course I'm going to always desire food. But I'm not speaking to your outer self. I'm trying to awake again. I'm trying to shake you as the way Neville shook me. And I understood his message. I didn't quite understand him again. I didn't really get what he was saying. But then I, I did. And then I wondered, like, am I going crazy? And I think it's okay. I'm totally fine with people thinking that. I have no problem with it. Because I feel so at peace right now. I feel like I'm understanding his spiritual message. And I think that's what I wanted more than his message on the law. And I'm receiving what I want. So I don't feel, I feel okay. Because it, whether or not someone thinks I'm crazy it doesn't stop me from being fulfilled. It doesn't stop me. Again, they might, I have, might even have people tell me that I'm crazy. Well, if, that's, if my ears are hit, hearing that, I don't have to hear that with my inner ears. I'm allowed to feel and create what I want to create. I don't have to feel like my mind's hijacked. And I don't have to feel like I'm being told what to desire and what to think. It's all my choosing within me. I don't have to have the same thoughts and the same reactions as my parents or anyone around me. I don't have to. And I don't have to tell anyone anything because God doesn't speak. He doesn't, he doesn't, sorry, he doesn't want me to speak with my lips when I pray. That's what a heathen is. A heathen is somebody who thinks of a God outside of them. And they will, they will, they will use their mouth and speak so loudly, hoping that that God's listening to the to the words they're saying, like they'll craft these beautiful words and messages and they hope this God's listening. Or they give to the needy in hopes this God watches. Um, I've done that before. I've given to people in hopes that the, um, the God that I was taught to believe in as a child watched me and saw it and said, oh, he did a good deed today. But I didn't realize that this whole drama is taking within ourselves. It's something that... It's, it, again, it is an instrument. It's something that you're going to learn how to play. Learn how to fulfill yourself. Learn how to feel fulfilled. Learn how to stop desiring, stop sinning, and start hitting your marks inside. And have faith in that you hit your mark. Learn the art of faith. Don't dismiss this message as being crazy. Really try to utilize this instrument called the imagination. It is a power as well. It's a light, but it also is a power for us to curse or bless. Um, but... Learn to be fulfilled instead. Um, 
take this message to heart. You, the inner man, really learn to stop desiring in, the, in, in there. And I think that this message, at least it, it hit me. It really opened me up to a world within myself that I didn't know I had. And it brought me into a place where I felt like I could finally rest. And I have no problem sharing that to people. I have no problem wanting to express that, that I, through Neville's work, found something worth sharing. And I go within myself, and then I come back here to tell you, and whether I'm believed or not, um, I guess it doesn't really matter because it's my experience. I'm still going to rest here. And I've had just... And I'm going to share more dreams that I've had of him that I had a few years ago that really opened me up that I can see why now I'm, I guess I should just share it. I can see why I'm teaching this now. About two years ago, I had a dream where I was in a um, auditorium, or I was outside of this auditorium and I could hear Neville teaching, but I wasn't in the auditorium. And I, I ended up trying to find, um, I was going through the hallways. It kind of felt like a school and I ended up finding this auditorium, I ended up finding Neville speaking and I went in there and I sat down and I was kind of coming to the end of his lecture and he wanted us to interpret, I think it was like Mark chapter five or something and from the Bible. And we all pulled out our Bibles for, and my seat ended up having one and it was open to Mark chapter five and he was going around asking what's your guys' interpretation. He was looking for a specific answer and some people the, the answers they would give, he would say, oh, no, not that. Like, And he went to somebody else and he'd say, oh, no, not that. And then we had a moment where he, everyone was just, because what he was trying to do was trying to find someone who can interpret this to be a student of his. And we all shot our hands up. And I remember hearing somebody in the audience saying, like, I'm going to imagine winning. I remember hearing their thoughts. And I remember I, raised, I rose my hand up and there was maybe like five around me. And he called on me to give a response, but I didn't read the book. I didn't read Mark chapter five, but I ended up just looking down. I was able to piece together. It was weird. It was like set up in a way where it was like Christ is the king and David is the king. It was like kind of going like Christ and David, like, and I could just see that they were all the same being. They were the same character. And when I said, oh, well, uh, Jesus is David, they're the same. And then he got really close to my face. Like he that he, like he heard the interpretation he wanted. And to be honest with you, I don't really know why that was the interpretation he wanted. But that, regardless, he, he seemed to like that answer. And he was staring at me, and I kind of saw his... I could see his face quite clearly, actually. And he ended up uh, accepting the answer, so he told me to rise. And he told me, he told me to get behind him, in a way. Like, I kind of got behind him. And when I was walking behind him, I heard a lot of people moaning and groaning like they didn't like or I heard some people they didn't like that I was picked um, but regardless he had me sit behind him and he started writing on a chalkboard like each month it was like every month he was writing like a number was growing every month it was like a, a, a number just kept growing and I sat down behind him and I looked at his back and his back was really sweaty it was like I don't know he looked like he was ill almost like he was going to leave soon and I could feel that and then um, I looked down at my hands and then the dream ended. And that was a few years ago. And I wasn't talking about this stuff because I didn't feel like I really understood his spiritual message. Or at least I didn't feel confident in it to speak about it. But now I'm at a point where I've had s several dreams after that that have really were, <laughs> they were really strong experiences compared to this world. And they changed my attitude and I could, it, and it really lined up with what he was saying. Like he would say, if you start doing this, then you are most likely going to have this type of dream. And then I would have it. And it was really weird. It really, it really kind of freaked me out to be honest. And then I really started to believe his more spiritual talks because of these dreams. So I didn't dismiss my dreams. They're not normal dreams. They're not like a dream where you feel like you just jumped on a roller coaster and you're just kind of midway on it and you don't really have any uh, autonomy. You can't really, you're just sort of on the ride. This is different. This is like a dream where I don't even know if I would say it's completely lucid because it's like in the middle. It's like I am aware of what's going on, but I'm also on the ride. I'm going along with it. And I that dream is the reason why I'm even talking today because I felt chosen and I 
And then Neville says that in one of his lectures, he says to feel chosen. So he wants everyone to feel chosen. And I remember I felt it and I had that dream. And that is not just available to me. Anybody can feel chosen. That's the good news. I would, I would truly walk around feeling chosen. Don't worry about what you're chosen for. Just feel chosen. It's, it's a good feeling. It feels that you feel important. You feel like you're supposed to do something. Um, and in this case, I feel like I'm supposed to talk about this. I enjoy it. Um, I feel it ignites me after. I, almost, I feel energized when I speak about this. And I know it sounds surreal, and I know it can sound crazy to the organs, but um, I hope this message reaches you, the deeper you, the, the inner self, the one that you can't see. You know you're there. The awareness that I'm speaking to, the one who imagines, the dreamer, the, the thinker, the one who isn't the thought but thinking the thought. That's the one I want to talk to. I'm interested in him or her or them. Whoever. It's, it's a spirit. I'm interested in the spirit of you. And I think it's asleep. I think we're, we are asleep in a way. And we need to wake ourselves up and truly see that the harvest is ripe. And pract- that's the practice of it. But the awakening that Neville speaks about, I think is, it's even deeper than the dream I recently had. I think, it's even, I think it even goes deeper than that. I think there are way more levels to this that are deeper that I don't know if I fully have reached yet, but I know that the, you're on the right path. At least I feel like I'm on the right path. Um, I feel like I'm on the same path as he was on, but I, I feel like it goes deeper. And I think that if you listen to this message and you've made it this far, I think you're somebody who questions. I think you're somebody who is interested in, maybe you saw through all these gods, or maybe you're seeing that you're not all these things you've claimed to be, or you see that you have, you're not your beliefs, right? You've had so many beliefs now, and you know you're not them. You're not your thoughts, you know, you're not like you're, you feel like you're maybe removing the, uh, the clothing, the articles of clothing of beliefs that you've held on to yourself. And you might not, you might see through that. It's not about just gaining items. It's that there's something deeper to life. And I think that you're more of a seeker. You want to understand. And again, if you've made it this far, I think you are interested in Neville's spiritual teachings. I would take, um, I would take some time and really meditate on the things you don't understand about what he is saying. Because if you take the time to understand what his spiritual talks are saying, I, th- I believe that you'll get, be- if you accept them, if you don't judge him um, based on his time or his ego, if you just accept what he is saying, that God dreamt to be man and hopes that man may dream to be God, um, if you take that and just really chew on it, I think you're going to be given a peace that you're not going to be able to find in the things of the world. It's a peace that you can't lose because it was never outside of you. You can't drop it. So I hope that you take the time to take it seriously, the message that he gave over and over again for years and try to understand it. And I'm going to speak about how I see these teachings and and the experiences I've had with them. And Neville, given his experience, really helped me. So I'm sure that if I give my experiences with this, it will help you as well. And this is an inner journey. It's not, if I said that you're going to awake you would say, oh, what do you mean I'm, I'm, I'm awake right now listening to you speak? Of course I'm awake. I'm not sleeping. But we are. Spiritually, we're sleeping. And we will awake. That's the promise. We will awake. It will happen to everyone. And this message of awakening happens from the inside out. So we don't wait upon a God to arouse us. We don't wake up, wait upon that. We It happens from within. And... I hope you can take this message as good news and set your hope upon that and feel that it will be fulfilled, that you will awake and you will understand Neville's message much more clearly. It will become clear to you. You'll be able to see with the the true eyes, the immortal eyes of what he is saying. And you will have the experiences similar to him. And because I know I have. And so I hope that this message truly reaches you and that 
um, you really obtain that peace. So when it comes to this idea of uh, imagining that things are fulfilled, I think a very important word that Neville uses all the time is already. You know, in the in the book at your command, and I don't I don't really write notes on these videos, so I'm just going off the top of my head. And I just woke up, so my voice might sound deeper. But he says that we should view ourselves as already being loving, already being good, already being these things, that they're not things that we have to uh, achieve or acquire inside. So I think when he uses the word already, it really pins you against your, as I said, your organs, because your eyes will tell you no. But when you think in terms of already being it, in my opinion, I think that it forces you to go beyond your senses and I think that it will make you want to go beyond your senses because you will feel uh, a deep fulfillment in that word already. And it's not the word, but it's just what it implies, right? You are already, um, whatever it is that you're desiring to be because you can imagine being it. And when I'm not speaking to the outer man, but you, the inner man, can imagine being it. You can imagine actually being that already. You don't sit there and imagine every night to try to become it. You fall asleep in already being it. You know, when Neville gives an example of wanting to move into a home, he told somebody, sleep there tonight. He doesn't say, imagine sleeping in that house so that you can get it one day. He says, sleep there as if it's already there, as if you're already there as if you're already in that bed, as if you already own the house. So it's about the scene, if you will, if you want to use a scene or the audio, implying. It's all in the implication of things. Because the things themselves don't really matter, but it's what it implies about you. And you can change the audio inside your mind to hearing good things. I had someone ask me recently, they said, they asked me, how I want to make videos as well, speaking about Neville, but what should I do as far as uh, how should I imagine about my audience? How should I, how should I, what should, things should I hear uh, in regards to my growth in my um, either YouTube channel or just like him lecturing? And I said, this is what I do. I actually do what Neville does when he said that eavesdrop on people uh, speaking good things about you. So in my mind, I, I, I developed a habit just from early on. Um, I actually did this as a child um, before Neville. And that's kind of another reason why Neville spoke to me so deeply because I really resonated with the idea of imagining beyond your circumstances. I think that everybody who really wants to understand this, I think you've come to a point maybe where, at least this is what happened to me, I felt like I was suffering really bad. And I really couldn't handle what my eyes were seeing anymore and what they were experiencing, the things I was hearing with my ears. And I didn't want to escape, but I wanted to at least go beyond it. I wanted to change it. Um, And I have, I've successfully changed a lot of the things that my eyes have seen for years. I see different things now and I hear different things now, but I did this through already feeling that I hear these things, that they already are so about myself. It's about the self. So when, I, when he asked me this question, I told him that I do the eavesdropping. Um, it's not really a technique. It's just a way I imagine. It's just a, to me, it was something I've always done. So I will purposely hear other people, and I don't know them in my mind, but I just hear other people speak about um, my teachings are wonderful. They, they helped them out, or they're brilliant, or they're insightful, or they're mind-blowing, whatever it is. And I, I seem to always just receive that message back, but I've been doing that for a while, and I don't do it as often anymore because I don't feel like I need to, but I do it for fun sometimes. Um, so I told him you should really start hearing, just just hear it um, and take the attitude of listening, uh, the attitude of receiving. Really don't just repeat affirmations for the hell of it to just uh, hear your voice. Really listen to what you're saying. Um, truly, I, when, I, when I eavesdrop on people saying how... Um, wonderful they like my or how wonderful my teachings are I just listen and trust it 
I really like pay attention to what they're saying. And I, and I can't help it. I just have an emotional reaction to it. And I just smile. And I think this is something you can utilize in all areas in your life. Um, so I don't always do just like a scene because I think what happens is that when you try to do what happens that instead of feeling that you already are it or you're creating um, either audio or scenes to imply that you already are it. I think what happens is that we meddle in the middle and we try to create the perfect scene or create the perfect audio. It's about what it implies. Um, so when I, I want to hear that my teachings um, are insightful from Neville's teachings. I really want to hear that. So I do. Um, but it's me, the inner man, who wants to hear it. So I want to hear it inside. I, it's all about the inside. It's learning how to not look inside yourself and see that there's still four months into harvest, but really looking inside yourself and seeing that it's already ripe. Learning to, to see and hear the good news um, about yourself or about another. But I would say first start with self. Try to understand that when you imagine, um, you're imagined to imply something about you. And it's, the implication is that it's already that case. It's already the case. It's not like you're trying to get to the desire. You're trying to imagine to achieve the desire. The desire is already done. It's just you're now hearing confirmation. It's just the, confirm, the, the, the confirming either audio or scene. And when you do it just to simply do the imaginal act, just to do it, because um, you're going to imagine anyways, if you just do it, um, for the sake of it, or just n to not try but experience it, um, again, that is another way to become free inside. Because I do think that if you are imagining to try to make things so all the time, instead of feeling that it already is so, when you try to make it so, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. You're going to, because you're so externally focused on it becoming so, that you're going to be clutching your hands, you're going to be hoping that it happens. You know, there's so many times where I just thought, well, what if it doesn't work and what if it doesn't work? But I didn't, I didn't really yield into already being it. I was focused on, yeah, okay, I imagined it, but how do I know I'm going to get confirmation? Because I thought my confirmation always was for my organs. But confirmation is not just for the organs, it's, it's for the inside. I confirm it within myself. And I become my own witness to my own confirmation or to already be in it. So when I make videos uh, or these teachings, I feel that I already spoke something good, something of value. Even though I didn't yet, I just assume it. I just assume it to be the case. And it's truly an ignoring of all the facts. I, don't, don't get me wrong. I have, um, I will have certain insecurities that come up. What if I say the wrong thing? And what if I, but I, all of that to me, completely removes itself the moment I feel like I already have done it. I don't think about my insecurities as much anymore. And if they do pop up, they're so it's so easily dismissed now because I'm the one doing it. Right? I'm the cause of my own wealth and my own poverty. I'm the cause of the good and my own bad. I'm the cause of me being violent or me being kind. I'm the cause of these both. And I accept that I'm the cause of it. I take responsibility inside myself for being the cause of how I am inside myself. You know, there is many, there are many rooms to us, and we can neglect certain rooms. We can feel like we're not, um, as Neville said, some people are embarrassed to go into an expensive store in the mall. They feel like they can't afford it, so why go in it? Um, but Neville says, go in there regardless in your mind. So become free inside. You know, there's all these judgments that come from, that are given to us by either our society or our families. And these judgments, we, we wake up in the mornings and we look to ourselves and then we think, okay, it's time to judge myself negatively, um, just like I did yesterday. But we don't have to. We can feel that we already are it. And it's, again, I'm speaking to the inner man, that you already are what you want to be. You already are it. And if you just accept that, you will have a change in your thinking and you'll start thinking from these positions, from already being it. So the already is, in my opinion, such a beautiful word when it comes to Neville's work because it really pins you against your own ideas. It pins you against your insecurities. It, the war is on now, right? The, that's the battle. The battle for um, your own freedom 
your own uh, freedom to assume your own freedom of expression is now being called into question because you want to hold on to your insecurities that you've held on for so many years. You want to keep uh, imagining that you uh, lack confidence or that you lack um, brilliance or that, or because you, the way you look, you lack this, or you, we come up with all these reasons on why um, our judgments or the organs will tell us why we lack something. But if we can just speak to the spirit of man and not his ears, his physical ears, but speak to his spiritual ears, and I want to open his spiritual eyes to feeling that he already is it, um, I think that then a, a new war starts. And now he's in a war against his own fears compared to his own freedoms. And he will, and you will, choose freedom. You will choose the freedoms inside because um, they are available to you. You just... I think it's more ignorance than anything. I think I, I think I was ignorant. I don't think anyone's stupid. I think I was ignorant of that, uh, of feeling that I already am it, of seeing that I already am it. I just didn't understand. I held on to my insecurities thinking that, not. I mean, they didn't help me, but I held on to them because it's all I knew. Who am I without my insecurities? Who am I if I'm not desiring? Who am I if I'm not just... Being a, uh, just having prejudices against certain people. Who am I if I'm not angry about this? Who am I? And when we learn to um, have that battle within ourselves, we will choose the alreadys that I already am because I'm the cause of what I am, my insecurity now. Um, I also am the cause of this new security or whatever it is. Or if you don't want to think in terms of uh, duality, you could just think in terms of fulfillment. What is it that I desire? Think in terms of desire and fulfillment, error and truth, as Neville would say, instead of good and evil. Um, and the truth is that you're the light, that you already obtain the things that you're desiring inside yourself. That desire is, again, from within, and it's the inner man who's desiring, and it's the inner man who can cause his own fulfillment. And that's just, uh, again, that is the law, but the deeper part of you is going to awake. This is, you're dreaming up dreams of society. You're dreaming up the dreams that society has given you, that, you know, you, you should, you, you know that you should have certain types, a uh, certain amount of money, certain amount of food. You know that you need these things. So imagine that you have them. Just truly feel that you have them there. From what I've seen from that dream is that that light became us so that we may become it. But, you know, there's a there's an idea. One time I was meditating, and I saw this idea of a of a king, and the king was on its on his throne, and I saw a bird, just like a normal everyday bird. And this bird wanted a worm, and went down and swooped down into the grass, and it grabbed its worm, and it got it. And I saw I went back to the king, and I saw this king. It was and he was just desiring more and more power, and all I could feel was that the bird is better off. Because the bird's not sinning, the bird's not desiring. So a bird who has its worm is greater than a king who desires. And the, I, the more I thought about that, um, I saw that, I thought of that scripture where it says that even the birds are fed. You know, how much more are you, how much more are you special to God than the birds? And I really take that seriously. I really feel special that the light actually became you, that you, are, you were chosen to have life inside you uh, really feel that you are more important than the birds um, just allow it that if the birds are fed how much more me so but we don't we a lot of us don't take that attitude we instead decide to use this power to uh, cause uh, deep insecurities in ourselves to cause fears within ourselves and a lot of these fears are just externally are coming from the external so if you just learn to let go of the external and um, become interested and curious about who you are within, uh, you will find the same conclusions that I did because all I'm doing is going inward, observing what is so, and then coming back. And what I found is that we can resurrect the past insecurities in ourselves and think about them in the present and experience them in the future. But we can also become, um, we can also let go of these past and present ideas and imagine as if there is no past and present then it becomes more of an already being so. It is so. That's what amen means, right? It is, it is so. Or it's so, so be it. So it, it, it's, um, it's truly a freedom there as well. Another freedom that you can take with you throughout your day. Just think about the words, 
already be in it and allow it to you you'll see yourself calming down you'll see yourself your your there'll be a new feeling coming up that springs and that is that is the fulfillment that you're looking for and don't be afraid of it um realize that it already is so and that's why you're feeling that so um i know the last couple of messages have been more spiritual but uh, i hope that this is more practical that you actually stop um, a lot of people want to just critique neville's work they just want to critique it or they want to judge the work instead of actually practicing it or testing it really i want you to be i want you to be like a scientist and test this um really start to feel take like a month or a couple months and just feel that i already am it fall asleep tonight feeling that you're and don't worry about the external just say can i really change myself from within can I change myself from the inside out? Can I really do that? Will this have an effect on my life? And how would I go about the change? Well, Neville says, go to the end, to what it already it already is so. It's not you're going to the end to make it so. It already is so. When he wanted to get out of the army, he was already back home in his mind. And he, he said he couldn't help but feel so... This is his saying. I'm not saying you have to feel this or there's a formula to it, but he said he felt very... Uh, joyful and happy be, while he was doing his uh, daily trainings because in his mind he was already back at home i mean he was really there the reality he said the reality of he's back at home so um the more i that's a good story to read because he i love that he says the reality of me so the reality of me already is it because imagination is my reality so i i accept it um i accept it without judgment i accept my imagination telling me that I already am it without judgment. I don't judge it. Just accept it. You might say, well, how is it going to happen? All these questions, well, how is it going to, I don't understand how it's going to, the brain might ask you, oh, well, this doesn't make logical sense. Just accept it. Um, accept that you already are and allow that to be the change from within. And don't, um, don't think that, um, don't go back to the organs of the eyes and say, well, I don't see it still. I don't see it. Just keep focusing on the internal change. Keep your eyes inward. Really focus that you um, that it already is. So ignore your senses. Ignore the words that have been told to you. And open your eyes and see that you already are it. Thanks for listening. So the question of should I desire or should I not desire? I want to see if I can take these two ideas and sew them together into the same cloth. Because on the one hand, Neville's telling us that we should have a burning, consuming desire. And on the other hand, he's telling us not to desire at all. He says, if you're desiring, stop it right now. What would, what would it feel like if you had the fulfillment? And so it's, it'd be quite confusing. And so I want to, I think what needs to, when you read Neville, you have to read him as him speaking to the inner man. And that's where I think this all comes together. It's because you must want to be different. You must want to be in a different reality. You must truly want it. And not just um, slightly, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see if there's going to be a change or not. No, you really want a change. But when I say you, man thinks of this outer man. It's the inner man I'm speaking to. You, the inner man, must want to be different. You must want to be in a different inner world, in a different inner reality. You must want to have a new experience inside. You must want to change yourself inside. But if you could see that all you're changing are the states, not the actual being itself, which is you, you remain the same. You remain the same. Your sense of self remains the same. It's just that the arrangement of the thoughts are different. They're according to a different nature, according to the nature in which you give it. Because thoughts, really, everything inside it comes from the same essence, which is thought. And how we sh sh you know, shape it and mold it is dependent upon us. But we stay the same. But we shape and mold these thoughts to our own liking. But when it comes to these thoughts, we shouldn't view thoughts and then judge them whether they're right or they're wrong. That's what Neville says not to do. Don't judge after good and evil. Don't judge these thoughts and pinpoint one and grab the other one and say, well, let me compare these two. Let me see if I can figure it out. Um, that's not really the point. The point is to find what you want. 
the burning, consuming desire and then feel you have it, feel that you're fulfilled by it, that you no longer, until you no longer desire it. So you really feel like you are experiencing that reality inside. You no longer desire it inside. I understand that physically it might not have manifested yet, but or it hasn't really expressed itself. I don't really like the word manifest, but just because it's can be kind of trendy. But um, the expression of it hasn't unfolded yet. But within yourself, it's already been expressed. It's being expressed. It's being experienced on the inside. Of and it, you can't experience things. Um, at least I can't experience things when, unless they already are so. In my mind, I don't really think about the how. It already is that way. In my mind, I can conjure up what I really want, and then it's already fulfilled. It just takes me to actually change into that reality and to actually feel that that reality is my new arrangement inside. And I live in there. I don't visit it like I would visit um, a vacation. I stay there. And, and I don't judge it because the moment you start judging your thoughts, whether they're good or they're bad, you call into question your own self because if your thought, if you start thinking your thought is evil, you might even think you're evil. You might think that you you are bad instead of the, instead of seeing the arrangement of the thought itself. Um, you're not seeing you aren't your thoughts, right? You are the creator, uh, the the molder, the the potter, as Neville would say, of the thought. But the thought itself is not you, and so you could you can call, fall into this bad mode where you might be thinking of violence or thinking of just not good thoughts that you want to have. But then on the other hand, if you start going the other way and start thinking of good thoughts, you might start thinking that you're not worthy to have those thoughts. You might think that this, you, you can think the thought, but you can't have the thought. You're worthy enough to think about it, but you're not worthy enough to actually feel like you have it. Because you start thinking the thought is so good, you think it's so grand, and you think it's so much greater than you, again, not realizing the relationship between you and thought itself on the inside, that you two are separate from each other, in a way, but in another way, it can't really exist without you. Because it's your conception of yourself, or your conception of the way you molded the thought. And so when you remove good and evil from the mind, and stop judging your thoughts after good and evil, and you start to um, eat from the tree of life, as the Bible would say, which is to feel a wish fulfilled, to feel a desire fulfilled so that your heart is not sick. And so, um, you know, the, the, it says that I wound and I heal. And do you trust that? Do you trust that I do both? Because we, we can fall into the, the mindset that we only wound ourselves, but we don't heal. But we do heal. We do both. And so um, instead of viewing it from good and evil, you view it from truth and error. And truth in the Bible, when you view things from truth and error, truth is always coupled with love. And so you think about things that you love and that you're thinking truthful things. You're thinking, the, you're thinking thoughts that are true instead of thinking thoughts that are good or bad. Uh, truth and error is where you start um, feasting upon this tree instead of eating upon good and evil. It's a different way of, again, using the imagination, but it tells us that thinking of good and evil displeases us. It displeases God. And so we start to use our imagination and it displeases us because we, in my opinion, we can't figure that out. I think trying to figure out whether or not certain thoughts are good and evil based upon my limited uh ideas of what I think good and evil are, I think it's kind of silly and pointless to even debate that in my mind. It's better to go to something you want than it is trying to untangle good and evil. And so uh, back to desire, when you want to desire something, um, remember it's the inner man who is desiring. It's the inner man who wants a new change. It's you. It's you, the inside, who wants a new change inside. You want to see yourself differently. You might want, remember again, if you want other people to see you differently, it's actually you who wants to see you differently because what you want from others is really what you want to give yourself. You can always grant yourself what you want inside. The way Neville described it was that the inside, you know, he said, I would close my eyes and then imagine so-and-so's complimenting me or so-and-so's congratulating me or, or not just so-and-so, just people are um, to, he goes, it's a mirror. It's a mirror, a living mirror is what he called it. And so it's reflecting back to me. It's living, yeah, but it's reflecting back to me my conception of myself. The same way I would walk in front of a mirror and it would reflect to me the outer man, what he does. Well, the inner world is reflected. It's my living mirror. It reflects what I do and what I am. And so the, but what I, my I amness stays the same. It's just the arrangement changes. The mirror changes. I change myself and the mirror inside starts to change. And I want to mold it 
to my own liking. And you can do that. So you remember to leave the outside world alone entirely. You let it, with all its denials and all its facts, you completely let go and you just change your movement. You move inside. And that's where true movement comes from. As Neville said, I think in one of his lectures, he called the movement of the mind, that all movement truly is within. That we don't move on the outside. We truly move from within and then we move on the outside. And so many, including myself, many of us might visit places inside, but we don't really stay. We don't really commit to them. We're not loyal to this idea of ourselves. We betray it or we go back on it and we're just doing it to ourselves. But being able to stay in it or dwell in it or feel fulfilled in it um, and understanding that you don't have to judge whether or not that idea of yourself is good or if it's bad and simply just view it as a it, it's something you love, well then fulfill it. And you're now feasting upon truth and error instead of good and evil, in which you will then question yourself to oblivion and you'll question yourself if you're good or evil. And I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling good or, or lovely. It's just um, to pick apart thoughts and judge them that way. It's a waste of your time. It's far better to feast upon this new tree of life, this new fruit that actually produces life in you, you start to actually feel fulfilled. And you'll realize that it was never on the outside that I was desiring. It was never on the outside. It was the inside in which I was desiring. It was the inside that I wanted to change. It was the inside that I wanted to be different. It was the inside that I wanted to mirror me back what I desired to be. And so I don't go to anybody inside of me and tell them, hey, tell me, what I am, I say, I, I make them tell me what I am. They're my mirror. And you could do this for other people. Mirror back to someone else, congratulate them on their fortune. It's, it can be truly harmonious um, and truly beautiful. And I just want to share the, the difference between desiring and not desiring. So you must want to change in reality, but why keep desiring that change in reality inside yourself and actually change it? Actually commit to the change and how you see yourself and don't wait upon another to give it to you. Don't wait and hesitate inside and be afraid to change it or feel unworthy and make the thought bigger than you. Instead, remold the thought to your own. Like your thought is like a horse. It's like you want to guide it into the direction you want it to go. Thought is like, it's everything. Thought is really everything in life. But the way you... You thought, thought is like your paintbrushes and your paint and it's all these symbols. It's the same idea. And if you want to uh, change your inner world, you, it, you, it's truly up to you. And if you want to commit to that change, it's up to you. It's really in your hands inside. And it's not in the hands of anybody else. It's not in the hands of anyone else. You can discard labels, you can remove the idea of yourself and change it and mold it, but you, the being, stays the same. I'm going to talk more about this. I just wanted to share this in a shorter message, but um, I will expand upon it, expand upon it in the future. Um, thank you for listening. Every thought that is created inside of you is caused by you. There, there's no other thing inside of you that is telling you to think this thing or feel that thing or you should think this. There's only one being inside. You're alone in a sense inside. You're one. To think that there's, you know, a separate entity inside of you telling you and dictating to you what you should think and how you should judge yourself and what and why you should obey reason and why you should bend at the knee of all your thoughts that you call reason there's no other cause inside but you you're the only thing that there is inside so the ideas of fear come from this idea that the image or the thought that i'm having or the voice that i'm hearing is separate from me it's independent and so this creates a psychological fear inside that I'm not alone, that there's something in me that could uh, attack me at any moment, especially if you have fear in, in, in your mind. If you don't feel safe in it, 
And how could you feel safe if you think that there's people in you who can do whatever they want to you? No, there's no other cause to thought itself. You can learn to be indifferent to the thoughts you don't want to have, as Neville says all the time. Indifference truly is the answer to your doubts. It's not to counter them or fight with them or give them attention. Indifference really is the opposite of attention. You give no attention. You can give a, a fearful attention, hateful attention to thoughts, but there are certain thoughts in our minds that we can feel and be convinced that is separate from us, but it's not. It's all within us. And there's only one being inside. There's only one cause. And so, you know, for, for a long time I thought, I used to catastrophize all the time in my mind. And a lot of these catastrophes actually happened. And it used to scare me. And then I just saw that I'm a really crazy creator. I'm really wild inside myself. I don't have any discipline. I don't understand yet that it's just me doing this. I think that there's a different cause to my suffering inside. There's a different cause to my fulfillment, a different cause to my desire. I have all these ideas that I think that I have to go to something outside of me to get the fulfillment in me. And that desire feels like it's something I can never really have. And I think I have to um, plead with something in order to get my desire fulfilled. And all these ideas just got in the way of being more free inside, being able to express oneself inside, being able to feel alone inside. Not to feel lonely, but to feel alone. To feel calm inside. It's something I've learned from Neville's teachings, was that there was no outside God. There was no creator outside of me, you know, that I had to become moral enough for you know we think that we must earn this love that is within us that we must become moral on the outside to get what we want within that this god doesn't give me what i want because i'm not enough yet you know these are all silly ideas that were just they had to be pummeled into you because the idea of being worthless doesn't really come natural to us does it it has to be pummeled into us and so just by studying Neville's works for so long now, I have, I've seen that it's not really about obtaining a bunch of things. The consumeristic way is not the way. But I have found that it's more about understanding there is only one creator. It's coming back to a oneness. It's by realizing that there is no other creator to the words I'm saying. It all comes back to me, to my imagination, to me. And he says, man is all imagination. That the outer man is all imagination. That all of this is all imagination. That what is within, although it appears without, it is within. In which this world is a shadow, as William Blake said, and Neville repeated so often. I do believe that. I, I've, I've witnessed it. And this relationship between the spirit and the external is a dance in a way. They fight with each other. They also can love each other. We can... But in the end, the spirit, in my opinion, what I've learned from Neville is what reigns after. So, I guess I just wanted to speak about just studying his work, how it's impacted my life. And it's taught me that any kind of fear that I have inside my own self is caused by me. And at first that kind of freaked me out because I didn't know how to not be afraid. I was so used to it. But really understanding what he is saying there, that there's no other cause to my desire and my fulfillment. There's no other cause to my fear. 
There's no other cause that he that man has to grasp this concept or else he's just none of Neville's work's gonna make sense. He was so you know, he really, really tried to pummel that thought into you, which was that there is no other cause but imagination. There's no other creator. Don't go outside of yourself. And it's not about changing the external world. It's not about changing the facts of the day or the people of the morrow. It's about changing oneself and only changing oneself to prove that by the change of oneself, his external world changes with him. That he gets to use this power that is it within him, that he can't lose, he can't drop it. You know how you can you lost uh, your toy when you were a child? You can't lose this. It is you. It's a power, but it's also you. It's your essence. It's what creates the thought. And so you can see how one's inner world is formed by one substance. And you can call it thought, you can call it imagination, but it's formed by one substance. And how one rearranges and forms the essence of thought within them is up to them. It's really about changing where you live psychologically. I think he says in the Law of the Promise that it's about where you dwell, not where you visit, but where you dwell. And this this whole this ability to be able to walk inside my own mind and feel unafraid in it, feel that there's control, feel that the things I want in it I can have, that I don't need to desire, that I don't need to desire any kind of thing in here, that I don't need to be afraid of anything, that everything really is just an arrangement of thought. So Neville has a lecture called Rearrange the Mind in which he talks about this. But as words, they can get old and they can change, but rearranging thought itself and realizing that you're one with it is the key to understanding Neville's teachings. And so life really is a dance between man's imagination and this Eve, this this outside, our Eve. We fell in love with this world. We fell in love with all of this, this external. We love it. Uh, we may not like to desire. We may not like to suffer. But we do, in the end, love this. We love humanity. And I'm not speaking as a as just an you know this outer being. There's much more to us than just our organs. We're not we're not just a collection of organs. It's part it's part of it, but it's not really you. They're representations of you. There's life is feeling clothed in symbolic form. Or you can say physical symbolic form. Spirit clothed in flesh. And that's a that could be a mystical way, like a romantic way of describing life, but I prefer to describe it that way. But Neville's works really have been very eye-opening for me. And he really opened my inner eyes. He really opened my inner ears. And I and I started to hear his message differently when I started to identify and associate myself with imagination and not my organs. That I feel like I'm in a body. And I don't have to be afraid of that. And I haven't found a piece like this anywhere else. By the understanding of it has brought me a piece that I I never really got anywhere else. I felt complete and more whole with understanding Neville's works this way. And so take his work and just listen to it. And throughout your day, think about it. Don't try to figure out his work. I don't think it's useless to, to contemplate on. Just take a sentence that maybe freed you a bit and just repeat it throughout the day, maybe while you're grocery shopping. And try to understand this journey is about 
it's an inward journey. It's not about freeing you about your your grocery shopping. It's it's not about the external. It's about understanding what's going on inside oneself. Who is one is one inside oneself? I know that you are a um a person here and you have a social securities number and you have all these identifications, these different forms of identifications. But who are you inside? That's who Neville was interested in. And that's what he went to go see and explore. And I find his his way of speaking about life and his way of understanding it, it can seem ancient to some, but it seems so eye-opening to me. So it seems revolutionary, and yet it was already said long ago. And... You know, he said that the things that are most spiritual are the most practical. And I agree with him. That the idea that thought itself, you're its God, it sounds mystical. But it actually becomes very practical. Because any kind of thought you have, regardless of what it is, it can't be independent of you. And so you don't have to fear it. It can't exist without you. Exactly like Edward. Edward art is a creation. It doesn't, it's a puppet. It's what I make it. I can make Edward be whatever I want Edward to be. Because Edward doesn't really exist without me. Same goes for any thought I have. And so should I fear Edward if Edward gets angry? (laughs) If Edward says some scary things, should I feel scared? You know, if I create thoughts that are scary, should I feel afraid of them? Knowing I'm its creator, does the artist fear its own paintings? No. And so we are one with thought. It it rearranges itself according to us. You're not a victim of thought. You're not beneath it. You're actually one with it. And you're given this power to direct it in which way you want. And then you can boldly claim that although it appears without, it is within. This man seems outside of me, but he's actually within me, as all things are. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to do that. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you're going to understand everything I'm saying right now. But I do think that if you just contemplate on this material and just repeat it under your breath, kind of meditatively, and they're lovely things to say anyways, like it's very love, like you should listen to, I'm going to put in the description, a video called I Am The Power. And it's one of my favorite videos of his. It's maybe 10 minutes long about how I, I just need to change the inside. Let me first find the change inside and see if it expresses. And if it does, then I know what to change, what I need to change in my life. I won't go to somebody outside of me. I won't go pray to some God. I won't call someone to tell me what to do. I will go, I'll change the thing I know what worked before, which was myself, which was my own imagination. I changed my imagination. I changed what I had inside. I changed who I was inside. And if you listen to this video, really just play with it and enjoy what's being said almost like it's po- it's just like poetry it's just beautiful words and it's just good to say beautiful words sometimes but you'll find a lot of meaning in what he is saying you will feel much more powerful and don't don't care where you're at physically forget the physical for a second who cares where you're at physically where are you psychologically we all know where you're at physically it's not hard to figure that out but where are you psych- where where do you dwell the most And when you see that the place you dwell in is caused by you and the place you want to dwell in is also caused by you, you will move. You'll actually make a movement inside and you'll see that true movement. It actually has to be movement, not you move and run back. True movement on the inside is where movement is held. So movement is on the inside as all things are. He's, you know, you know, the Bible says that if you put your hand on a plow and you look back, you're not fit for it. 
And so when I move somewhere, I don't look back. But I can move anywhere, inside myself. I can occupy anything in me. Because all things are in me. So I may occupy a state of desire in this one area and occupy another state of fulfillment in another. But it's not until I see that all, all the cause of desire, all my desires are caused by me, inside of me. And so I become fulfilled. I change self. And it does work. And so... um. Please just listen to this video and, and, and just try to understand what he is saying. Try to really listen and, and contemplate on it. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to be philosophical and, and all. Think of it just like, a, like if, as if you're like a little child again listening to something. You hear him say that you are the power and just accept it and see what you do with that idea. See what comes up. And take this with you throughout your day, that you are desiring thought, but you already have the thoughts you want, for thoughts are things. But you have, you have thought itself, and you can rearrange it. So there's no thoughts you should be wanting. You want to change your thinking. You want to change your thoughts, but you can. You know, you can't, I can't bring a dollar bill within me and, and pay for a thought. Thoughts are not, there's no price to pay on a thought. They don't cost anything. It says, come, eat, and drink without a price. Regardless of the thought itself, again, it's just rearrangement. And so Caesar can't grant me what I want in here. I can't go to something outside of me to grant me this, this thought that's within me. Only I can grant it. Only I can feel that I have that. I have that thought. It's my new thinking. It's my new dwelling place. You don't have to feel stuck anymore. And I'm speaking to you, the inner man, the one who is actually wanting to be freed. So thank you for listening. Now let me show you from my own experience what I know about this law. I can waste power in the world of Caesar. We're doing it by the billions every year with our little war and all the nonsense we have in the world. This power you can't waste. You can misuse it, but you can't waste it. I can misuse it every moment of time by imagining unlovely things about people, unlovely things about myself. And I can use it hatefully, but I can't waste it. I'll show you why you can't waste it. One night, many, many years ago, I suddenly became aware of two beings. I am the one perceiving them. So there are three, but I am the perceiver. Here above me stands the most beautiful woman imaginable, an angel. <clears throat> an angel of beauty and of everything that was lovely. And below me, the most monstrous thing that man could ever conceive. Covered in hair, like an ape, but it could speak. It spoke gutturally. I looked at it, then it looked at me, and then it pointed to this beautiful angelic being, and it called this woman, Mother. Well, I was so annoyed with this monstrous thing that I pummeled it. It gloated. It loved violence. It fed on violence. Every time I was violent, it became stronger. And this beautiful thing, glowing, but this one is calling it mother. And suddenly, as I am beating this thing, I realize that this is the embodiment of all of my misspent energy. As this one is the embodiment and personification of every noble thought I've ever entertained. I looked at this thing, I had no one with whom I could swear. I felt a compassion I have never known before. I looked at this monstrous thing and realized it 
is but the result of my own misused energy. It never should have been given birth. And I say to myself, I will redeem you if it takes me eternity. I pledge myself to redeem it. Do you know what happened? At that very moment before my eyes, the whole thing with it, that monstrous thing, the embodiment of power, horrible looking thing, it all got smaller and smaller and smaller and left no trace of ever having been present. But as it got smaller and smaller and disappeared, the energy returned to me. I felt infinite power. I felt like without anything, the power returned to me. It wasn't wasted. It was misused, but not lost. Nothing is lost in all my holy mountain. So you can't lose the power. You can misuse the power, but you can't lose it. But you'll confront it one day in a monstrous thing like that. And you'll exactly what I did. You won't wait to redeem him at the very moment that you pledge yourself and you meet it. I'll redeem you if it takes me eternity. At that moment, that monstrous thing with us gets smaller and smaller, and this one glows. It becomes radiant like a star. She is the embodiment and the permanent personification getting ever greater of your own noble, wonderful thoughts. Every lovely act of yours feeds her. Every ignoble act of yours feeds him. And they walk with you. This one whispers the lovely things, encouraging you to be noble. And this one whispers the violent things. If you are at the crossroads as to what you should do, this one wants to be fed. He can only feed on violence. And this one can only feed on the noble, lovely thoughts of man. And man creates them. You see your own creation. And it's all the same power of your own wonderful human imagination. From then on, you know where you are. You are a creative power. And you go out to change everything in your world to make it conform to something lovelier. And you don't do it on the outside, you do it on the inside. You do it all in your imagination. Imagination is God, and there is no other God. His name is I Am, forever and forever and forever. That's God. So here, in this wonderful world of ours, you have the power. You don't need financial power, that won't do it. You can buy health, you can buy respect, or you can buy it for a little while, but they don't really respect you. Let the money go and they don't respect you. You don't need anything in the world of Caesar to buy what you want. Come, you're told, buy it, without price, without money. When you say, buy it without price, well, then you see it's not Caesar's coin that you will. You use your own wonderful human imagination. So I ask everyone here to try it. Don't just listen to it and not try it. You are the operant power. It doesn't operate itself. And so when I know what I should do, well, then do it. Go to sleep tonight, all right. How am I sleeping? In what state of consciousness am I sleeping? As someone that is unwanted, well then, that's, I'll rise tomorrow to find myself unwanted. Ignore the facts of life and assume that you are wanted. Ignore the facts of life and assume that you are affluent. And see how things work in your world. They all come your way. You are creating out of a power that is infinite. And you don't need any contacts in the world. You don't need to know the right people or anything else in the world. All you need to know is Christ, and Christ is your own wonderful human imagination. So if this building is yours, suppose it burns tonight, so what? You know what you did to build it, build another one. You, tomorrow you may have the whole thing burn flat. And so don't be concerned about what you have accumulated as things in the world. Find God and worship only God. And God is not on the outside. You'll never see him on the outside. You see him within because can you see I am? You can see I am a man and see the man reflected. You can say I'm a poor man and see the man reflected in the eyes of those who know he's poor. And you can see every concept you hold of self, but the conceiving being you don't see. That's God. My concept of myself could be this, that or the other. The concepts will be reflected in society. And men will tell me who I am conceiving myself to be, but no man knows who I really am. 
either conceive or they don't know. But they know what I've conceived myself to be. My bank balance will tell the bank of what I've conceived myself to be in the financial world. And all these concepts, men will see concepts, but they can't see me the conceiver. Well, don't forget the conceiver, that's God. And that being is your own wonderful I am this, that's God. And there never was another. So I tell you, unmarried ladies, if you desire to be married, maybe you don't. If you do, that's the way to do it. And you'll come out of the nowhere. You don't have to go and buy anyone or try to meet the right people. Usually when you try to meet the right one, he's always the wrong one. So don't go searching. Those who go searching for love only make manifest their own lovelessness. And the loveless never find love. Only the loving find love and they never have to seek for it. So you fall in love, you don't have to seek for it. You draw them. They come to you. So here, this is the power of which I speak. The power of the universe, the power that created and sustains the universe is resident in you as your own wonderful human imagination. That's God. One night sitting in the silence, rather than an afternoon, I was thinking of nothing in particular, and suddenly before my eyes came this quartz, an enormous quartz. As I looked at it, it fragmented itself, <coughs> broke into numbless little pieces, and then it reassembled itself. As it reassembled itself, it was not into a quartz, but into a man, seated in the lotus posture. I'm looking at this man, all seated now, perfect man. As I looked at him, I'm looking at myself. Here I am, the perceiver, observing myself, seated in the lotus posture, this deep, deep meditation. And as I became aware that I'm looking at myself, it began to glow. And it glowed and glowed and glowed. When it reached the intensity of luminosity, it exploded. And then I returned to this level. Where did I see him within me? That being is meditating this. This is but a projection of itself in the world. And when he wakes within me, completely wakes, I am he. God actually became me, that I may become God. And he's put me through all the paces, allowing me to make all the mistakes, to make a monster like the thing that I talked, talked about earlier. I made that, and I made a lovely one. And he allows it in his meditation. He is the dreamer in me. And he's dreaming this, and dreaming everything that I dream in this world. And when he awakes, this will cease to be, and I am he. And he is God. I tell you, go out and try it. Begin tonight. I make you this promise. If you try it faithfully, you will not fail. So I recently had a vision that was different than these other visions. Um, and I'm going to read what I wrote. I usually don't do this, but every time I try to make a video on this, I seem to miss some key points and I just can't do it without reading it. So I'm going to read exactly word for word what I wrote, and then I'm going to explain maybe a few things about it, maybe expand on some things that I feel like I could expand on, and maybe I'll readjust so it sounds uh, cohesive, and then I'll, um, I just hope I get this message across well. And so I wrote, the title of this is called The King Who Conquered Death, and I start with a quote, I came so that you can have life, and that is the eye of man speaking. And I start this off by saying, if you are one who thinks they already know God, and your God can be found between the corner of this street and that street, then my teaching is not for you. I speak of a God not bound by the corners of concrete, nor a God who only communicates with those in society we deem holy. The holy people can want that position for power and not for God. I speak to those who want to know God's heart, but the desire must be there. You can go your whole life desiring money, sex, fame, and power, but eventually all these things you will not want. You will want to know God completely on your own. You don't go to some pastor or some priest or bow to some statue to know God. 
not to worship him with man's rules, but to know God. You feel deep within you that nothing will satisfy you until you have an experience of God. Everything that the world presents to you is not what you're truly looking for. Some will hear this message and completely blow it off. They will see it as nothing more than a crazy man believing his own fantasies. Or some will fall asleep for how boring it is. They're not interested. No desire at all for God. Or they will judge this outer man and say, He did this in his past. He's not as intelligent as this one. Not as handsome as that one. He has problems in his life. Relationship issues. This happened to Neville. A lady was reading Neville's book and she overheard he was divorced. And so she shut his book. And she thought to herself, how can a man who's, at, who's been divorced ever make such claims? So then she closes his book and goes on believing that a god will be upset with her if she ate this food or that food. They believe the morals of this individual was not followed perfectly, so God must not be in their life. Some will see biblical scriptures and mentally check out. They will point to a terrible experience they had with those who used this book to gain silly temporal power. They will say, but I'm not a Christian, I'm an atheist. And all this biblical talk is ancient nonsense. The point is no one who reads this experience or Neville's experiences will see it the same way. I'll tell you this. One who says I do not believe in God may be closer to God than one who shouts God's praises. And these are the scriptures to start this off. God does not judge after appearances. And God is looking for one after his own heart. The days are coming when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst of water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. So God is not looking at your mistakes, your failures, or your appearance. He judges to see the one after his own heart. This is a true deliberate act on man's part. You want to know God. Nothing in Caesar's world is satisfying anymore. Not like it used to be. Blaming others feels pointless, and blindly following religious leaders feels wrong. It feels wrong to worship a person. Strange to hear one who says they speak with God, speak with man's agenda in mind. One who preaches on giving, but is greedy with their intent. But this is a famine of which I speak. It is not a famine observed by mortal eyes, but it's an internal famine. I've been reading, practicing, and believing Neville's work for some years now, and I've never had these types of experiences before. I had a few dreams here and there, but not the ones of this nature this divine nature. I ignored the promise for more things in the world. I wanted these things more than to hear one more word of the promise. I would skip Neville's entire lecture and only read about the law. I felt irritated at times when he would not speak about the law, but repeat the same story of the promise. His ideas and instructions on the law were far more interesting to me than any word on the promise. And yet now, I want to know his experiences that happened within him. These experiences are just, if not more impactful than the outer ones. I recently had a vision that, or I recently had an experience that felt like a vision. It was not a dream because I I was completely awake and my eyes were open. It felt like it was happening to me, not an effort-based construction of my imagination, even though its source is imagination. I know the difference between imagining a scene to experience it and a dream that feels just as real as this world. This was a vision. I was awake, but this experience took my attention away from the physical world and placed me in another world. Similar to Neville's lectures, I will give my experience and then my thoughts on the law. And here's the vision. I'll tell you exactly what happened to me. I found myself in front of a table, and there were several people around that table, and Neville was there. They all had a glass of wine, and it felt as though they were waiting for me. I looked over at Neville because I felt that he was the only one I knew and felt connected to. I looked right into his eyes and he directly looked at me. And all I could feel and what I said was, in my heart, He is the Son of God. He is God. That's all I could feel looking at him. Then with the, without his lips, only his mind, he spoke to me and said, You can only behold yourself. And in that moment I understood and I said, I am God as well. I meant it fully. And then they all took their wine glasses and they raised them and said, He has risen. And I felt completely one with everybody there. And this peace was so overwhelming that I felt. And the only way I could describe the peace was that you want to feel afraid 
out of habit. You want to resist it out of habit, but you can't because the peace is so overwhelming. It consumes you in a way, consumes your fear. And then I looked back at Neville and I said, and felt fully, I suffered from a dream. He nodded his head and he said, you're awake. And in that moment, I felt so clear-minded. And I said in my own heart, wow, it was all just a dream. And then I felt immortal. And so did Neville and everybody in that table felt immortal. I felt perfect like everybody else there. But then a worry came to me. And out of my worry, I thought about the ones I love. And I said in my own self, what about them? I love them. I want them to experience this too. Neville knew what I was thinking and he said these scriptures and he felt like he bolted these into my mind. He said, truly I tell you that some are standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. And then he said, the wolf will lay with the lamb. And in the first scripture that he said, I felt him telling me with a feeling that they can all awake just like you before death. And in the second scripture, I felt him tell me with a secure, strong feeling that all will be redeemed and is being redeemed. I felt a deep, deep peace flood over me again. And I felt these scriptures took my worry away. Knowing that everything was going to be redeemed, I didn't feel worry. And then I felt what I would only describe as a brotherhood. It has nothing to do with gender, but it's the spirit of a brotherhood. That we're all so intimately close, all of us. In fact, we all know we're the same source, that we feel completely one with it. And there's no nearness, but oneness. And the peace is stilling. You can't help but feel it. You want to resist it out of habit, but you can't. You want to fear, but you can't. And then this is the understanding that was given to me. I was told that this is the shadow of the valley of death, that man is the valley, valley, that man is God individualized. But we are redeemed from death, redeemed into a whole other world. And none of this I experienced in the physical flesh, of course, because Neville died years ago. But he's alive, I'm telling you. We are all destined for it, to conquer our enemy, death. Man conquers nations, but God conquers death. It is conquered in us. Imagine you, but you know and fully you are God. And he gives you the kingdom, but you cannot have it without being him. If you wish to know, if I wish to know, I must be it. And so I wish to know God's heart, then I must be God. To truly know him, I must be him. And God is a king that conquers death. He is the dreamer who awakes. He is forever giving and full of grace completely full. And then I sat on God's throne and something in me said, I don't deserve it. And then I heard this voice say that you are my beloved bride and I, your husband, who loves you. You are my son and who I'm well pleased. I wanted to fight it, but I couldn't. It was pure grace and pure truth. That was the vision. And there was nothing you can do on the outside to gain these experiences. There's no moral code you must uphold, and there's no meditation to force this to unfold. You simply believe in the story. You believe in this gospel, this redemption of death, this redemption in us. And so you set your hope upon, you have hope, and you set this hope upon this message. So you don't believe in Neville. Neville is just a little person like me. You don't believe Neville existed like you believe Jesus Christ existed 2,000 years ago. You don't believe in him but you believe in the pattern that unfolded in him. In other words, you don't, you don't believe in me, Edward. I'm fragile like you. But you believe what happened in me, knowing that it will happen within you too. You believe in this pattern. And then I saw that they at this table, they all went through this valley. Everyone, including Neville, already experienced the valley of death. And these visions, they already had these visions, and I felt intimate with them. And all I could feel them say to me was, And this is to you too, that you will be okay, that all will be okay, that we are okay and we went, like they tell me that we are okay and we went through the furnace too. Don't be afraid. I felt them say this to me as if they had their hand, they didn't have their hands on me, but it felt like they had their hands on me to comfort me. And so in the end, nothing in God's world dies because there's resurrection in us. God is gold and if we must be like him, we must go through this furnace. And you can't escape this life. There's another feeling that I got was that you couldn't escape this life by killing your garment, this flesh suit. 
Some think that it's the garment that keeps them from awakening inside, from this pattern from erupting and unfolding. It is not. You cannot kill the flesh suit and think you'll be saved or escape this valley of death. We are in it, and we must drink it to the last drop. Death is a drink, and we're drinking this thing to the last drop. And nobody escapes, but all will be saved. And no, it's not some savior on the outside, but from within, where all things are. So your savior is within. And man creates so many enemies in this world, yet his greatest enemy, our greatest enemy is death. And so I had this experience on a deeper level of my own being. I was in the same place physically, but I moved there mentally. I moved there mentally from all imagination. If I just believe where I, you know, where I am at physically, then I didn't move at all. But I am a multi-layered being. And on a deeper part of me, this is where I moved. And the only thing that f- made it feel independent of me was that I wanted to feel fear, but I wasn't able to. That's what made me feel confused in the moment. I felt this was a true vision because I, I tried to do something in it and I wasn't almost allowed to. I tried to be scared, but I couldn't. I felt too at peace with everything. I felt too connected to them. And so these, these experiences happen in us. And then we must come and clean up and refresh in this atmosphere. Because this is an awakening event that happens in us and then it becomes a tradition of man. And then it must be cleaned up once more. Man has these inner divine experiences and they become tradition. They think it has to do with the sun or the moon. And they create these images and they bow before these statues and they wear these robes for their holiness. These divine experiences become dirty and dusty and tampered with. And then it takes another to come and clean it up again. And then Neville, he gave me this tip on the law. This is what he says. He says, before you go back into the valley of death, he says, take this with you. He says, you have the power of not just dependence, but independence as well. And then he said, what you do is you imagine your desire, then begin to feel, and he emphasizes on feel, that it is independent of you, that the dream is separate. He said, of course, it cannot be because all things come from you, but you feel it that it's independent of you, like it's happening to you, like a deceiving victim of this wonderful dream. That's what he said to me. And I felt him mean that the moment you have fearful thoughts, You remember the power of dependency, that the fear is not independent of you, that it's dependent upon you, can't exist without you, and then this neutralizes it. But when it comes to your wish fulfilled, you feel that it's happening to you, for this is how it would feel in this world. You mimic it on the inside. Remember when he said that you feel as if it's happening in the here and now, he means you feel it's independent of you, and you hold this power to do so, to become a victim of your own wish fulfilled. And so you will take off the crown of the thorns by which you suffer and you'll be replaced with the crown of God. For you will be the king that conquers death, the egg that hatches. You will have hope and you've set your hope upon this message. Believe the message, not the messenger. I'm fragile like you, remember that. But I had these experiences happen in me and they will happen in you too if you believe in the pattern. And so I left my body and I came back to my flesh suit to continue this valley, the journey of this valley. And I knew I had to come back and continue the valley. I wasn't done. That's all I could feel was that I had more responsibility here. And Neville was about mid-twenties in this vision. Okay, so now that I'm out of that trance of reading, I'm going to now speak uh, more openly and fluidly on what I feel like I gained from this experience. I gained a peace towards death. I gained, I I felt like I came in contact with people who conquered this. And I felt like everyone here is destined for it. And I felt that we truly have, we can't escape this until we we go, we, we enter death's door. We fell as one man named Adam. We will all rise as one man named Christ. We fell as one and we will be resurrected as one individually. But it takes all of us to make God all of us individually, and it's constantly happening. And the, again, I want to stress the peace I felt that, you know, the way they, the way they made me feel was when they said that it's all going to be okay. Like, I really felt that it is, that this doesn't end yet at death's door. It doesn't end. It's, it's an experience we go through that enriches us. It bonds us even closer together. We get even more connected because we went through something. We went through death's door. We conquered it together. 
but everyone has to go through it alone. Everyone. I don't care how rich you are or how poor you are. You have to go through death. And you don't get to leave. You don't get to think that if I kill the body, then I'm going to be gone. And I don't have to do this. We all have to do it. And we all have to conquer it. It's our destiny. It's, it's what we're destined to do. And as I said, man conquers nations, but God conquers death. That's our greatest enemy. It's not you and me. I'm not your enemy. It's our enemy is death. And we conquer it. That's the, that's the redemption that happens in us. So we don't look to some man to save you. A lot of people are looking to some individual on the outside to come save them from all these troubles. But your Savior is not outside of you. Nothing's outside of you. If you're looking for a Savior, He's within. Look within for everything. And then I felt this understanding that when it came to dying to oneself, like we, we have all these states that we have, and you have to learn, you actually have to die. And there are so many states that you have in you that you've carried with you for 20 years, 30 years, and that you've become almost companions. They're like your friends. And no matter how sabotaging the states are, you still hold on to them because you're familiar. I had a friend tell me it's, it's just, it feels, it's just all familiar and that's why we can't let them go. And I agree. We can't let these things go because we don't know who we are without them. But I'm telling you, you're never the state. You can, no matter how long you've carried a state with you, no matter how long you've been dreaming of yourself this way, you can awake from that state. You can awake from that dream and change it. But you truly have to die to it. And there are some things that I've had in my life where I've been a certain way for a very long time and I had to give it up. I wanted to change myself, but I had to give up the state I wanted. I didn't want anymore. I had to give up my present state for it. And I grieved. I grieved as if a part of me died, but another part of me was born. But I've grieved from moving on from states. And so I know that uh, William Blake said that death is the greatest thing to life because, you know, you're allowed to die and resurrect and be different. But he never mentioned that you might grieve a certain states, that you, you want to be different, but you, you hold on to it as if you're still gaining something from the limiting state you're in. You're going to have to die to it. You're eventually going to have to give it up. But don't be scared to do it. Allow yourself to be free and allow yourself to be the being that enters into and exits out of states. You're always that being. You're never the, no matter how long you've been in it, you're never the state itself. And so these states are these little dreams that we dream about ourselves and we can awake from them. And so I felt, also felt like Neville gave me that tip to share so that even though we're in a furnace and we have to go through the furnace of afflictions, you can make yourself more comfortable here. And when he said that you imagine as if it's independent of you, what he really means is that you really feel that the wish is happening to you. Like he said, a deceiving victim. You're a deceiving victim because it's you who's deceiving yourself. But you feel like a victim of just wonderful wish fulfilled. You feel like you couldn't help it. It's just the way it is now. He also said another way of you let people see you the way you want to be. I, I imagine the way I want to be and I let them see me that way. And so you feel that it's independent. You, you just start to imagine the scene and feel that it's happening to you. You can't control it almost. Let go of the effort of trying to control the scene. A lot of times uh, we tend to use a lot of effort-based uh, mental construction, even though it should be effortless. In order to make it effortless, you feel it's independent. Let them tell you who you are. Obviously, in the end, it's just you, but you feel it as if it's not. But when it comes to the things that you fear inside, understand their dependency on you, and it becomes neutralized. And so this, this, this vision has been one of the most eye-opening things. And you can take it literally as well. But when it, when it came to the idea that you are my beloved bride and I, your husband, that loves you, you are my son and who I'm well pleased, the whole idea there is that it's, it's a fulfillment. Everyone wants to be the bride who has the husband that loves them. Everybody wants to be the son in whom they're well pleased. Um, but, you know, the parent tells them that. So it felt like a, it was all fulfillment. That's all I could feel was everyone, we fulfill... Um, death, or we, we conquer our enemy, we, we become the bride that is loved by their husband. It's all, we are the, the egg that hatches. We, it's all fulfillment. That's all I could feel from this. And when they said that he's risen, I felt it was like an initiation. It's all I could feel. 
And they all felt perfect. Every single one of them, including Neville, they all felt perfect. And then I had this vision about four weeks ago, and that's why I haven't made a video. And because it really shocked me. I had to think about it for a while. And I read recently, I just, as Neville said, there's sometimes where you are in a mood and then you go and grab your, a book from your library. It could be any book and it mimics the thing you're feeling. And I started reading a lecture randomly. And he said, you know, if, if I see you in a vision, that means that I feel intimate with you because you believed my story. You believed the pattern and you believed it like a little child because it's too good to be true. The redemption of death in us, that all things are in us. I believed it. I truly believe the story. I realized quickly that I don't think I could find satisfaction here in Caesar's world. I realized there weren't, weren't really many things here where I was desperately desiring. I needed something else. I wanted to know God. I've always, I've always been interested in God, but I was always interested in how to worship him and how to become a good boy for him. <laughs> how to... Um, you know, really make him think he's well-pleased in me. It's all grace. It's nothing you can do. I mean, there's nothing, there's, as that, that lady closed his book and said, he's divorced. You know, I'm not going to listen to this guy. But regardless of his divorce, I believed in his message. Maybe Neville made mistakes, but I believed in his message that these things happened in him, regardless of what he looks like, regardless of the time he was born, regardless of what he's done. He says that this happened in him. And it was a story of inspiration, of victory, and it felt intimate. And I believed in that story. And it unfolded, it unfolded itself and erupted in me. And I still think it's going to keep happening. I don't think it's over yet. And so I know that um, this is a very mystical teaching, but I don't try to make it that way. I'm just trying to share with you what happened. And I know there are other people that they have had this happen to them, even more intense experiences than mine. But I should share it. And I hope that you believe in that message, that your redemption, your Savior, whatever it is you're desiring, is in you. And he gave me that tip before I left. It really felt like, like you have to go back, but don't, don't be afraid. Like, really don't be scared. Um, it's not how, it doesn't end the way you think. That's all I could feel. Like, we are completely okay. And I could feel their presence, that they were okay. And I could feel that they already did this life. They are what we call life, but it really is death. We all enter death's door. People think this is life. They think their gods are outside of them. And so they, they think God's outside of them. So they think they can trick God. And so they feel one thing inside, but they act one way outside. And they think they're tricking God. But God is found within, as all things are. And so it's a, it's a message of inspiration, of conquering victory again. It's a redemptive story about you. And this all happens in the individual, and you become your own witness. You don't, I don't need you to tell me that this, you know, if you told me this never happened or this is silly, it doesn't make a difference to me. It's my experience that I had. And that's what I've always said. He talked from experience and not from theory. And so use the law while you're here. That's all I can say is that I don't know how these things happen, but it started happening when you know, I really took the law seriously. These experiences started happening the moment I tried to believe in myself that I couldn't see physically with my eyes. I really imagined something great about me, and I believed it fully. I kept trying to do it. Even if I would fail, I kept trying to believe in myself. And the next thing I know, I, I tried to repent here and there. And then, and then I had these, a dream popped up. And then, and then I became curious about that dream. And then another happened. And then another vision happened. And then I started becoming way more intrigued on these visions. They felt more impactful than, and I know it's an impactful feeling when you imagine something that happens in this world. It's really, it's really, uh, you really changed the dream here. But this felt like, there was a purpose to all of this, and it was showing me the purpose. That life isn't purposeless, as we often believe. It is purposeless if you live for Caesar. It becomes purposeless for sure. There's no point to it. But there is a point to all of this. And it's not to live for Caesar. It's to know who you are. Society really answers what you should do, what you should think, what you should feel. Um, but it doesn't answer the question of who you are. The question is, who am I? 
There should be no question or no question that's more interesting than that one. No YouTube video that should be more interesting than the question, who am I? Because can, you can tell me what you do in your life. You can tell me what your name is. You can tell me what your identifications are that society has given you. But tell me who you are. And man often shrugs his shoulders and goes back to digging holes. He doesn't know. And when you hear that God's name is I am, and he's found within, ask yourself, who am I? Really? Who's, who? Why is it that everything in life and society wants my focus and wants my belief? Why does it desperate? Why does every ism want my belief? What is it about my belief that it wants so bad? Who, who am I, the one who believes? And you keep asking yourself these questions. Am I really this? Am I just that? That society tells me? That my family has told me? What, who am I really? And you'll find yourself to be the dreamer. You'll find yourself to be the king that conquers death. And we do. We all wear the, cor- the, the, the crown of thorns. We all wear it. We all suffer. But it gets replaced with the crown of God. And it's all given by grace. And I know this is biblical in nature. And I don't know how you feel about that. But all I can say is that this happened to me. In me. And it's been a very exciting vision. It's, I don't know what else is important to talk about. Learn how to use your imagination wisely. Learn how to enjoy yourself in it. Really, you're allowed to. This, it doesn't really matter. You are going to conquer this place. You're going to conquer death itself. That's your goal. That's the one enemy of God. It tells you that God's enemy is death. Well, what's man's enemy? It's death. It's not his neighbor. It's death. All our enemy is death. Every single one of us has the same enemy. And it tells us that's God's enemy. And God's victorious. Well, do I identify myself with God? If I do, then I'll be given the visions to confirm that. So don't be, as Neville says, be embarrassed to claim, to believe in this message of redemption in you. Don't be embarrassed to say that you are the dreamer, that you're God. Allow these visions to unfold in you. And uh, don't believe me, Edward. Believe in what happened to me. It happened in me. And it'll happen in you too. And you'll understand the peace I'm talking about. You'll see that it's, um, it's what you're looking for. It's not going to be found in a, in a temple here. You can't, there's no God outside of you that you need to please in order to get what you want. It's all found within, truly. And, and, it, and as it says, you know, whatsoever you desire, believe you have and you will. It's another way of, that's the same thing that Neville told me, that feel it, it's independent of you. Because that's how it would feel in this world. If you had what you want in this world, it would feel independent. It would feel like it's happening to you. But you know deep down it's not. And you can always change the dream here as long as you change yourself. And in order to change yourself, you have to die to certain parts. Parts that you've been in for a very long time. And so don't go to some, don't go to anybody to save you. You don't need to. Where when, I, when I had that dream where I saw the light in me, it was in me. It wasn't me. There, I, if, if I saw a light outside of me, I'd say, oh, that's the light. It's not me. But this happened in me. If I saw a king that conquered death outside of me, I'd say, oh, that's the king. That's not me. But this happened in me. And it was me, first person, who conquered it. It was first person me who, who rose. It was first person me where everyone surrounded me and said, he, he was, he's risen. And everybody can have this experience. It's not bound just to the rich or to a certain class of people. It does. It happens in us. So... I, I'm glad I shared this in a way that I felt conveyed the message because it took me a while to share it. And um, I want to stress this, that we're all so intimately close. All of us. We all are going through this. And we will be victorious through it. It's truly a battle. Um, but victory is God's. And when you feel that nothing in this world is satisfying anymore, then you've entered the famine. You want to hear this word. And it happened to me. I, I, it, I wasn't in the famine when I first met Neville. I'm just going to be honest. I wasn't. I didn't, I didn't care at all about the promise. I wanted to know how to get more things. <laughs> but I just realized that these that things just kind of, it, it kind of sucks. To be honest, it kind of gets boring. Um, it's fun at first. And then you just kind of like left a little bit like, yeah, but what else is there? Um, I just get a nicer thing. I just keep getting nicer things. Um, and I felt 
pointless in blaming people and it felt pointless in trying to shame people. It felt pointless. I didn't like power in the world. I just didn't care for all these things. I didn't care to follow a religious person. I didn't want to follow a leader anymore. I didn't want someone telling me who God is. I wanted to know for myself firsthand experience and I found him as myself. And that, and you'll find God as yourself. You will. And I am excited for you. I really am. <laughs> and I, I might, I'm going to sound like a broken record in the future because I'm going to talk about this more and more because it's true. I can't think of anything more important to talk about. But utilize the law wisely. Be wise, truly. Really be wise. And, and don't listen to anybody who disagrees or disbelieves in your imagination. Believe in your imagination. Put your belief in them or in it, in it, not in the people around you. Really believe in your imagination. Believe in the dream. Make it a reality inside of you. Feel it's independent of you. Feel like a victim to it. And change yourself and you'll see it. You'll see it reflect in your world. It's, it, it will happen. But thank you for listening. It is of my belief that a heart that is willing to change is greater than anything that is in the world of things or the world of Caesar or the outside, the shadow world, whatever it is you want to call it. I think a heart that is willing to change is greater than any of those things that are in it. Because if you have a heart that is willing to change, you know, and as Neville said, you must want to be different. You must have that fundamental desire to be different. If you don't have that, then you're not going to really want to change at all. You don't really want to occupy anything new inside yourself. You're satisfied with where you live. You're comfortable. But you must want to be different. If you want the law to work, you must really want to be different. And the one thing I love is when I was reading Neville is that he said that he would let people see him the way he imagined himself to be. And I find this so important because I think for a long time, even in myself, I was so focused on the details of things. And I really got good. <laughs> I really got good at imagining details. But that didn't change me. You have to change yourself, and then the outside will change. And the way I, the, the reason why I liked the way that Neville said he'd let people see him the way he wanted to be seen is that he said that he would freeze the people inside his mind. He would, he would see himself the way he would want to see himself, and then he would let those inside of him see him that way. He would allow it. It's that he already was the thing, and now he's allowing it to reflect back to him as a living mirror. Because I think that many times we focus on trying to change the things in order to change ourselves. It's that we've changed ourselves, and so the things change. And, you know, we have a choice. And I really wish I knew when I first started my journey on Neville. Of course, I didn't know. But if I, I wish I would have known. Is that everything I'm seeking from others is what I want to give myself. And everything that I'm seeking is within me. If I could, if you could just take those two ideas and meditate upon them, you can extract just like a really, really juicy orange. You can extract a lot of juice from that because that those two things I think are going to question, call into question a lot of your ideas that you use to doubt yourself, your reason. And, you know, you can use your imagination to imagine reason or you can use it to imagine the wish fulfilled. But it's going to call into question, it's like when Christ said, don't say it's four months until harvest, but see that it's ripe now. The reason why I love that is because it pins you against time. And to be pinned against time can be a little bit uncomfortable. You have an instant reaction to say, well, it's not here. But that's not the point. The point is when you imagine, you don't allow time to be an obstacle to your wish fulfilled. Nothing is an obstacle to you inside, besides yourself and besides what you imagine with reason. And that's why William Blake paints the character your, your reason. He paints it with shackles because your reason becomes your shackles in this case. What was once what you lived by becomes your bondage. Um, when you listen to Neville, he asks you to give up reason. And reason is anything, as I said, that gets in the way of your wish fulfilled. And it's feeling it in the now that you already are. You know, so you have to fight against these 
Goliaths of time in your mind when you imagine the Goliath of you know disbelief in yourself that it can't happen. You know these are things that you're going to have to war against, but you will be the victor if you really feel that you are already the thing you want to be or you have it. You're the victor, and you have to hold on to that faith and and find something as Neville said you love because then you'll commit to it, meaning you'll you will if you want to change you'll be loyal to your change. You won't go back. You know, a man who has his hand on the plow but looks backwards is not fit. So don't you don't look backwards. You move from one state to another, like one thought from another thought. You just jump. And I think you have to have the willingness to be different. And what Neville said in the in the um, vision I had about imagining as things are independent of you, what he meant was it's a feeling. It's like feeling like the it's just happening. Like you're experiencing it to its full degree. Like imagine someone congratulating you in your mind and you just let it happen as if like you're not even controlling them. They're just, they're just extending their hand up to you to congratulate you. And it's, it feels totally independent. Like it's just totally on their own free will. You just, you imagine as if it's happening to you. And that to me feels natural. It feels like you're, as a friend said, surrendering to it. You surrender to these uh, scenes. And don't be so concerned about making the scene perfect or making it so detailed. The scene is there to represent the change of you. Change yourself first, and the scene's there to imply it. That's all. It has to come to a change of self. Without the change of self, nothing changes. And I know that from experience. When I found out that I was focused on the details, I was focused on, well, is this enough, or is this the right way, or I never changed myself. I was, I was battling within my own reason. That's all I did. I never really moved. To move from one state to another state is the complete letting go of the previous state. You cannot change in your mind unless you let go of what you are now. You have to be willing to let go of it. You have to be willing to change. Without it... Um, don't be surprised that you wake up tomorrow morning the same person. You went to bed that way. And that's why I love when Neville says, that. Well, what state of consciousness am I sleeping in? Because that, that's the state I'm going to wake up in. And I've witnessed that in my life. You know, it's difficult to disprove this when you actually practice it. And that's the point, is I want you to be, um, I want you to feel fired up to test the law. Really, to, to truly test it, you have to, Find something within you that is a great enough yes that you don't want anything else. That it has to be a great big yes or else you're going to wander in your own mind. You're going to be a wanderer, not really a conqueror. You're not really going to be something that occupies. You're going to always be in limbo in a way. And I was in that state for a long time because I was imagining within reason. I'd argue with myself about the timing or how it would happen or... What if something goes wrong and I, and I couldn't let go and just actually be it? I was more concerned with everything else. I was more concerned with anything else besides changing my actual self. And that was where my problem came in. That's what I needed to solve within me, was learning to actually move from one thing to the other without looking back. And I mean that. I am being a, I'm being absolutely serious that you cannot let any kind of thought about your past about the ideas of what you think your future is going to be like or your habits or whatever it is that you think can get in the way, you have to not allow that to get in the way in your imagination. You move fully. And you, you, don't, um, you don't feel guilty for moving into a better state in your mind. It has nothing to do with that. It's all about movement. You, you use your feet of faith and you move somewhere new. If you don't do that, then you're not going to find success in this. You become indifferent totally to the yourself. You become indifferent to yourself about that part of you that wants to keep you in the limiting state that you're in. For some reason, you want to imagine yourself out of it. There's a great enough desire in you to be different. And so you have that privilege. You have the approval, the, the validation. At one point, I needed validation. I didn't think it was within me. I thought it had to come from somebody else. And that was my mistake. And I find myself always making that mistake, not realizing that the thing I'm desiring is actually within me. And when I did, when I discover that, when I remember it, I stop forgetting, I stop desiring. 
I don't question myself as to like, you know, is it possible or is it that I, you know, I don't really know if that's going to work. I don't bother myself with that. I'm told to believe I have it. That's all I'm told to do. And I'm going to try to test that. And what I've noticed is that when you test the law over time, you will become curious about something else. I think the law will bore you. And then you will become curious about the question, who am I? And that is a journey of itself. But I think that you should use the law to first try to change things about yourself. But you have to be willing. I'm going to repeat that a heart willing to change is it's greater than anything that you can offer yourself, that you can give yourself in the world is a heart that's willing to change. Always, always ready to uh, experience fulfillment. That's what I would say. A heart that's ready to experience fulfillment. I think that if you have that, then you can learn the law very well. You can utilize it to your advantage in a way that I think Neville did. I think, you know, Neville said he one time spent like two hours imagining himself to be different. And I think that's because he, you know, he doesn't say that in his later work. He says, oh, it's pretty simple. But I think it's because he opened himself up to change. I think it takes hours sometimes to actually think of ourselves differently, which if you could just see that the problem right now is that you think of yourself one way and you feel stuck in thinking of yourself that way. And you can't imagine yourself thinking of yourself in a different way. You have that power because you have it right now. But it's difficult to see when you're in that, in those shitty states. I'm just going to say, when you're in those states, it can be so challenging to see an out. But you are your out. To see that light, it's you. You are the light you're looking for. That, that, you are that change you're seeking. You know, it says you want to, you want to, you want to change so badly. It's like, um, I think he said like a, a tiger in a drought that wants water. Like you want to, you want it so bad. You're thirsting for a difference inside yourself. And I'm just trying to give you motivation and uh, maybe uh, some understanding in how to be more effortless inside yourself. You don't have to be so difficult um, on making everything perfect. So don't go about your life trying to disprove negative states of yourself. Like, oh, if you think of yourself as a negative way and you try to disprove it, don't go disproving it. Go to changing yourself. Become indifferent to the states in you that don't need your belief anymore. And I'm going to end this with giving you the inner man ownership and power and realize that you get to let those see you in the way you changed. You get to let them. And you own everything that's inside of you. You own all the states inside of you. You own them. You have ownership over every thought you have within you. And so don't feel unworthy to have anything inside. If you can let go of that, I think that you can truly live and in, in, in bask in a, in a peaceful environment inside. Then you can start to use the law and actually be able to be like the dog who knows his owner. You know your Lord. You know your creator. And it's within you, as all things are. Permission, validation, acceptance, fulfillment, having, not having, are all things within us. Everything is within us. And even the change of self is within us. The change in environment is within us. True movement is within us. Everything that we are wanting is within us. And speaking of permission, you know, Neville said all the time, you don't need anyone's permission. Really, the only permission you need is yourself. And you only need your own consent. Because, as all things, consent is within us. And I once said that if you can't say no to a state inside of you, then you can't really say yes to a state. If you can't say no, you can't truly say yes. If you can't let go, then you can't really commit to something new. And so you have this, this old man, the old man, the, the state you don't want to be in, has to die off. You have to kill it. You have to let it go. You have to move from it. Um, and if you can't say no to your old man, you won't be able to embrace your new one. You won't be able to embrace the change. You will hold on to You might have reasons why you're holding on to it, but regardless of the reasons, you're still holding on to it. So until you can learn to actually say no to something in you, you will learn how to say yes to it. And that comes from Scripture, right? Let the no's be no's and let your yeses be yeses. And this is all something you practice on the inside. Everything is done on the inside. You clean the inside of the cup first. 
right? You don't just clean the outside and leave the inside filled with greed and jealousy and and you know all of that. Um, the seven deadly sins or the you know those deadly sins that you reap a harvest that you're you're going to regret. And that's really what a lot of the prophets are talking about, is that it's, it's man imagining out of jealousy and greed and hatred. And the locusts are coming, you know, the plagues are coming to him. You know, regardless, his harvest will appear. He will have to reap what he sowed. And they're telling you to repent and to change your ways, to not go down that path of envying that person in front of you, of thinking that they're in your way as to what you can have inside of yourself, as to thinking that the enemy is external to you as if it's not yourself inside. And so they're telling you to repent. They, they use these um, amazing descriptions to show you kind of like the, the feeling of what's going to come, like a, like a snapping turtle that bites its prey, like who can escape its jaws type of mentality, the, like who can escape the, the harvest that's coming. Uh, and you're going to receive your harvest. And if you've been imagining in terms of, if you imagine in in ill terms of jealousy and greed, then you're not going to receive a, a bountiful harvest. And honestly, imagining out of jealousy and hatred can actually, you know, the, as I said, the locusts come and it can ruin everything you've ever done inside yourself. All the good harvest that you've, you know, uh, planted. And so if you learn to repent, which is to become indifferent to the things you don't want to be, and you actually go towards what you want to be, and you sustain that within yourself because sustain, you know, sustaining oneself is within as well, as all things are. And so, if you don't want a harvest that you are, you know, you have to reap your harvest. And if you don't want to reap a harvest that you know will leave you in torment, then it's good to become indifferent to what you have planted and learn to plant something new in its place. So, when you go to imagine a scene, and you find yourself, the scene, the environment is there to imply, imply the change that has already been made in you and go into the scene with an open acceptance of change. You might come out of that scene after, like I, I tend to feel a, a deep sense of relief while I experience the scene. To the, I might even take a nap, actually. I feel just a deep sense of acceptance, a deep sense of being it, a deep sense of just relief. And after you might come out of it, you might go back into thinking of yourself again the same way you were before you did the scene. And when you fall back or you fall off the horse and you, you feel down, the, the best thing you can do from what I've practiced, just practicing Neville's work, is to become indifferent to when you fall off the horse. Becoming indifferent to the old man or when, even when you do go back is the quickest way to find yourself uh, fusing again with the new state that you want to be in. Instead of having to argue with yourself or try to flip the thoughts or try to fix them or think that you are your thoughts and then you start having bad thoughts, now you think that you need to change and fix yourself when you weren't the thoughts to begin with. You learn to become indifferent. Indifference is a, is a, a great, it's, it's almost like a blessing to be able to do it. And so you, if you really are dedicated to changing yourself inside, um, don't fight with the old man when he comes back. And you won't feed that side of you. Because in the end, that old man is you. It's you fully, just in a state. It was you in a state. And so you are, in a sense, rejecting yourself. Your rejection is within. Um, acceptance is within. All of these things, consent is within. You consent to being a new man. All of these things... Um, are within us, so we don't have to feel like we need to go outside of ourselves to find validation, or to go outside of ourselves to find permission. You can actually create the scene that you would like that would imply that you have the validation. You can use scenes to, if you really lose yourself in the scene, like a, a, good, a good way to do it is to practice the congratulatory scene that Neville talks about. Have someone shake your hand and really feel that they are doing it on their own free will. Just try it. The same way Neville would say, you know, go up a ladder, use your imaginary right arm and your left arm, you go up and down a ladder. You kind of experience whatever you would experience in this world. But in this case, you if someone was congratulating you, you would just say thank you, right? And if you trusted their congratulations and if they meant something to you, then you would believe them. And so you trust that they're congratulating you and you feel thankful. It's just a natural gratitude. That's all you have to do. 
it implies I wouldn't question it so much. It, it implies something about it. just feel that it was done out of you must have done something wonderful to have that. It doesn't really matter what it is. I wouldn't be too concerned of getting into the details of that, but I would be more concerned on feeling that you moved from one state to another. And I think most people can do that. But when it comes to falling back or going back to your old state, this is where I think people struggle. I think they struggle with, what do I do now? If I fell off the, the state I was in, I'm back in my old man, what do I do? Again, learn to be indifferent. Don't become emotionally reactive towards yourself. Don't hate yourself. Don't think you made a mistake so it's over. Don't think it's, it's done with. You can always, you're always fluid inside. So if you feel stuck inside, then you're not really moving. And when you don't move inside, you feel like you're dying inside. And so if you always want to be in a continual state, at least have the potential to change and the potential to move. If you always have that, then you can learn to be indifferent. That you're always open to moving back into your new state. You're always open to changing your new state. Even if you fall back, you're open to going back into the new state. And that allows you to be indifferent. So being open, learning um, true consent of having your yeses and your noes be yeses and noes. These are all uh, powerful tools to feel more powerful on the inside. And you do it all on the inside. Leave the entire world alone and you go within and you completely change yourself from within. And don't, uh, you don't have to uh, hear anyone's doubting words on the outside stop you. You don't have to listen to what they have to say to you. you. They can say anything. That's the point. The point is you leave the entire world alone and you imagine an entirely different new world inside yourself and you, you remain loyal to it. And when you do that, you remain loyal to a change. It has to change itself in reality. But the goal is to remember, find the change within. Change is within. Do not worry so much about the external. Learn to change and move within because that's where true movement and change lies. As all things do, they lie within. And I keep repeating that because whenever you find yourself wanting something, it's within you. You do not have to look any further. You can imagine, and it will find its expression in this world. You don't have to take what people say. You don't have to take their doubting words. I'd advise you not to take them. If someone doesn't understand what you're imagining, that's fine. Let them not understand. Let them have the freedom to have that. But you, regardless, at the end of the night, assume something new about yourself. You fall asleep in the, in the experience of the scene that implies a change in you, or you feel that you have change in the way you want to be. You feel like you have it. Regardless of what you do, you find yourself in a new state of consciousness. You find yourself in a new state of mind. That's the goal. The goal is to be in a new state. And you can always move states. So if you have a harvest that you fear is coming or you feel like you haven't been imagining uh, in, in the way you want, don't fear. Just become indifferent to yourself. Don't shame yourself. Just become indifferent. Don't become afraid. Just become indifferent. And go back into what you want it to be. It's a true freedom. It's, um, gosh, I spent so much time trying to solve thoughts. And I've been spending so much time trying to figure out the states I'm in instead of moving. I spent so much time contemplating instead of actually moving. And there's a time and place for contemplation, but I don't think it's good to remain there. I think it's always good to be open to a new change or be open to at least being indifferent to yourself here. Um, I found myself always falling in the same holes or tripping or like over the same thing over and over again and found myself just wondering, oh, how do I get around this one? Or, oh, I don't like this thought. Or, oh, I thought this thing. I hope it doesn't happen. That type of mentality. You learn to be indifferent to yourself. And that has helped me tremendously with feeling better about myself. Uh, tremendously thinking better about myself. Thinking from the positions instead of thinking about them. Um, learning to be indifferent allowed me to actually immerse myself in a new position inside myself. Immersions within. All things are really within us. And so you and I are the spirit that became flesh that's part of reality that the the spirit becomes flesh that it becomes it expresses itself here that's just how things work so if you want a new expression of yourself then you have to change yourself and you can't change yourself if you can't accept the new change within you if you can't accept the new change within you it's most likely because you can't say no to something inside of yourself that you are holding on to and if we're being honest with ourselves there are many things i think neville mentioned this once that you know, to have a secret love affair with your um, ideas of jealousy and hatred, um, you're going to have to give that up if you want to change. And so you might, you might actually love the things you think you hate. You might actually love them. You might love to think hatefully. But 
it's not really to live a moral life or to be morally perfect. That's not the goal. The goal is to actually choose what you want. But you have to suffer the consequences of what you choose. You have to reap your harvest. That's what I mean. And so if you are reaping a harvest that is filled with jealousy and desire and greed, um, you're going to receive that. And so if you don't want to receive, there's always time to repent. And repentance is simply a change of attitude. It's a gift. It's truly a gift that you can utilize whenever you want. It's forgiveness of oneself. And so to forgive oneself is to become totally indifferent to one's current state of mind and allow themselves to be accepting of a new state. And so I just want to make a video talking about learning how to keep your yeses as yeses and your noses as noes and learning to be indifferent. Maybe you immersed yourself in the scene, you found yourself changing within, but then you found yourself going back and it's like, what do I do? Well, you find yourself to be indifferent and get back on the horse. Because I know that many times people will fall into the habit of thinking that they failed or that they didn't sustain it long enough or whatever it may be. Uh, again, become indifferent to the external, become indifferent to your um, last state and learn to be embracing and learn to be open to a new change within you. And when you do that, then uh, you won't be so scared. And it's truly a forgiveness. It's forgiving your own harvest that's coming. It's always coming. Your harvest comes every day. We always plant seeds every single day in what we say to ourselves, within ourselves. You know how when you hear a secret, you're, when someone comes a whisper in your ear, your ears open. Well, these are the secrets of all secrets. It's what we say within our own bosoms, right? It's what we say in our own minds. And God opens his ear to us. So if we wish to change our harvest, then his ears open and we can whisper something new within ourselves. And when you learn these ideas of yeses and nos, you learn the ideas of not of everything being within you, then you actually have the authority to say to, within yourself that whatever I desire, if I believe it will come to pass, it will. If I believe I have it, then I will. You can say this as your own words. And when you take ownership over these words, you'll accept them and you'll live by them. Thanks for listening. So I found a quote that I felt it needed to be expanded upon. I've read it many times, but it's a quote that I think can help everyone. And Neville said this. He said, If one could lift himself up to believe in the reality of that unseen imaginal act, it's done. But the average person will say, What little me? I couldn't be that powerful. I don't have the intellectual, the social, the financial background. None of these. Then he says, You don't need any background. And this parallels a scripture, Isaiah 55, 1, where he says, Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And so those two parallel each other. And and so no background is required of you to imagine or to use the imagination or the, um, the cause of whatever it is that you're struggling with. And so... You know, the world of Caesar will demand a resume, will demand some type of qualifications, and yet it's not asking for that. And the world of Caesar will demand a certain price to pay. And so there's no price, there's no money to give the imagination that will make it happen in a sense, or that you will become the thing you want to be. It's also not asking you to be something else than what you are. You know, we can question if we're intellectual enough, if we're, if you're not in the academics and you're not smart enough to understand this or that, or um, we question if we're enough in something. And so you don't need to be anything other than what you are now to imagine. And it's, you know, wondering if, what if I don't have a social background? What if I don't know the correct people or the right circle of friends? Or what if I don't have the, the means to have people who are above me in a sense in societal's eyes to contact me? How, I mean, how could I get in contact with people I don't know? And so if money won't do it, and it's not asking for my resume, and it's not asking to, you know, for me to have a certain status in life, then what is it asking of me? And the answer is faith. It's asking for my complete trust in my imagination. I have to completely give it over to it, that I am that or have that. Because I'm told that, I, you know, for him who believes it will come to pass, to him who believes it will come to pass. And him who believes that you know he has, he will. And so I have to give over my doubts and I have to actually let them go and completely, as Neville said, I would yield into it, yield into believing that my wish is granted. Uh, he would completely fall backwards, he said, into it, into the state. Um, whatever it is, surrendering or faith is what's required. That's what it's asking of. 
And then there's this character that Neville spoke about in The Five Lessons, and it's Esau. And Esau is, to me, the mindset of the outer man. It's the man who doesn't realize that he's an inner being who is inside the world of imagination by which he can find his inner fears and conquer them and find his inner desires and fulfill them. And Esau is the one who hunts for his desires. He still, he, you know, it says that in Genesis, it says that he was overcome with the need for food. He just is always needing, always wanting, and he's never satisfied. And Esau is also a mindset that's the outer man, the societal man, or the, the one who prays to wood or, and, and, and bows down to states and doesn't see the being inside the state. It's the one who only focuses on the external, the one who only thinks in terms of gesture, in terms of acting a certain way instead of actually f- being a certain way. It's more interested in how things look than how things really feel and are in the deeper parts of ourselves. And so Esau is a mindset that I find it's, the, it's covered in hair, as it says. And Jacob is the one who deceives. And so if I want to change myself, I have to become, and these both characters are ourselves, and we self-deceive. We literally deceive ourselves into believing that we are what we want to be. We completely remove doubt that we don't have or aren't, and we remove the ideas of being enough, and we remove the ideas of time, and the ideas of not having the social circle, or the means. We remove the means, and we let go of thinking this outer world, this emanation, is not reflecting us. We let go of this idea that it's independent. We remove this idea and we find ourselves to be more one with it. We feel ourselves to be one with it. And so when I imagine, um, I let go entirely of the questions as to how and when, because I'm not interested in how and when, when I imagine. When I imagine personally, my goal is to fulfill myself, but I identify myself with the inner man. And so I want to fulfill me inside of myself where all things lie. So if all things lie within me and this world is but a shadow, in effect, then I have to go to cause and fulfill myself in cause. And the more I do that, the more I stop trying to manifest something, uh, stop trying to repeat words as robotically, which I've done, and I actually yield, or as Neville said, give myself over completely to it. I completely trust that I'm that, or that I have that. Um, that's my goal. And when I have that as a goal, I don't find myself feeling nervous. I used to feel like I was going to have a nervous breakdown. And there's been times where um, I've imagined things and it's happened quickly. And there are other times where it happened later. I don't try to figure out the time. I don't uh, try to walk. I don't walk wondering what's going to come to me next in the external and the emanation of things this is more of an uh, emanation is just uh, in my opinion rearrange it just rearranges itself according to consciousness so i find myself in consciousness moving in there and then i find myself moving in this external world but um it, it, it happens like a shadow like an effect and i've had i've witnessed it where i've imagined something so clear in my mind and I have experienced it in this world just as clearly. Like I experienced it and it happened the exact same way. And so I, I believe this off of testing it, not off of my, not off of being able to defend it with arguments or understanding the, the philosophical side of it. I, I believe this because I've tested it. And that's what I urge you to do. You will understand this far better if you test this all the time. And, and the testing is your own faith within yourself. So you, as, as where, where fears come from and courage comes from, these all things happen within ourselves, and so does faith. And so you are in competition with you. It's not with anyone else. You find you ask yourself, where am I within me? Where 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 am I dwelling? Where do I rest inside myself? Where do I sleep? Where do I rise? What is it that I'm doing inside here? It's not it's not about what I imagined in the past, and it's not about what I'm going to imagine. It's what I'm imagining myself to be now. So you may find yourself dealing with some fears within you, well, then that's where you have to conquer them, or within you, and you'll find them dissipating, and you'll feel energy coming back to yourself. You will actually feel a transfer of energy coming back to you. As Neville said, it was misused. It wasn't lost. So you can't lose the things, you can't lose states. You can't lose what's within you. You may misuse yourself. You might misuse this power, is another way of saying it, because the power in you really are one. So you might misuse it. 
but you can't lose anything within you. You know, I, at one point I thought I lost connection with myself. I thought I lost control with myself. I thought I lost myself. But I, once I believed that I had these things, actually yielded and trusted that I had them, I did. And so the, and if I'm looking for something, whatever it is, I know it's within me. I always know it's within me. I don't seek some outer, I don't go to emanation to rearrange emanation. I go within myself. And that's our Eve. That's what we've clung to. We've clung onto this external and we're married to it. And so you don't need any background. You don't need any intellect. You don't need more than what you are now. All you need is Christ, your imagination. That's all you need, your Savior. That's all you need to know. That's the only one you need to know. And when you hold on to your self-concept, the, uh, there will be a bridge that will be provided. It will be provided. And if it takes people changing their minds, if it takes money or it takes forgiveness or it takes a change of someone's attitude or changing yourself or whatever it is, it will be provided. And you trust that. And you walk in your faith that you are what you desire to be. You have what you desire to have. You move in that way. So, you, so your inner feet, the way you move is through faith. Faith is your inner feet. And so you may find yourself thinking in ways you dislike about yourself. Well, then ask yourself if you are able to entertain its opposite. Can I have faith in its opposite? You know, can I actually see myself as not the one who is the state, but the one who is occupying it? If I can distinguish myself, then I can move. I can actually have faith in myself that I am what I want to be. And so this is all self-deception. It's abandonment of, not necessarily self, but it's, as Neville said, it's all about self-abandonment. But it's another way of saying it, just abandoning the state that you're in. It's abandoning states and occupying other ones. It's detaching and attaching. It's indifference and loving a new state. It's That's the the way you compete with yourself within yourself. It's letting go and holding on to a new one. And you will walk that way. And you will walk by faith and no longer by your sight. And this is your own faith that you walk by, not another's. It's your own within yourself. So I hope this this thought that just came to me was um, was freeing, that you don't need anything to imagine. Just try to test it. Instead of trying to understand its arguments, let your faith become an experiment. When it comes to the world within us, we are dealing with feelings. Everything is a feeling inside. And there are many feelings that we were taught to feel about ourselves, and many feelings that we were taught to feel powerless by, and many feelings we were taught how to handle and how not to handle. And we were taught which feelings to accept and not to accept. And yet every single feeling is within you. That this world really is a world of feeling clothed in this symbolic form. And yet when I go within myself, I can't take these things within me. Yet I see them, but they're representations of what I'm feeling. And so I have certain thoughts and they align in a certain nature of my feeling about myself. And the self is the dreamer. When you create a scene inside yourself, you are dreaming the scene. It's you who is dreaming it. And if you forget that, you will think that you are the conception. And when you think you are the conception, when you think you are something, you can't change it because that's who you think you are. Once you detach yourself from these scenes, detach yourself from these conceptions and see that you're the dreamer, the self that precedes the concept, the self that precedes the self-concept, then you can move. You can change the concept. But if you keep thinking you're the concept, if you keep thinking that you're the, the thoughts or you're the feelings, if you don't detach yourself from them, then you can't really move. You'll be stuck. You'll feel stuck. And all things within us are feelings. But the inner man cannot be stuck inside his own imagination. He's only believing that he's stuck. He believes he lost control. He believes he lost freedom. He believes he lost whatever it is that he is suffering in. He believes he lost something. And it's you, the inner man, inside imagination who believes this. And so there's no feelings that you're powerless by, and there's no feelings you can't accept, and there's no permission you need to feel something about yourself. And that's what Neville says, a change in feeling is a change in destiny. Because the way I feel towards myself is directly correlated to the quality of life I have. 
and the nature of my life. If I live in a hell, you can bet that my, my assumptions of myself are hell-like. They're probably terrible. And so I change the self, the concepts of myself. By I, I, the self, remain the same. As Neville said, you can be aware of being something. You can be aware of being this or that, but you can never stop being aware that you are. What you're aware of may change, but you can never stop being aware. And when I change the way I feel towards myself, I inevitably ch change my destiny because it's linked. Myself and my life are directly linked. And so if I want to change my life, I have to change myself, how I feel towards myself. It never would say change the feeling of I. The I there is the thing that precedes everyone's I. You can't talk about another when you say I. And that I is God. That is the causal power. And I don't use hyperbole. I mean that seriously. If you change your feeling towards yourself, you change your feeling of I, you will change your life because your I is your life. It's your awareness of being. You can't, you can't be a concept without being the self. And so you, you mistakenly place the concepts, you put them on a pedestal above you. Or you may have taken a person and put them above you. As Neville said, you know, um, Abdullah once told him, he told Neville, never, make, never let anyone make you feel small, Neville. He says that the moment someone tries to make you feel small, just imagine them on the toilet, just having a bowel movement. And you can do this. You can imagine someone doing that. And I know it's kind of funny, but it proves a point that everyone is a slave to these bodies. No one is not. I don't care how rich you are. You have to, you are, have to assimilate your food. You have to digest it. You are not freed from these bodies. So don't let anyone make you feel small. And there might be doubting words coming at you, but you really prove your power in being indifferent to these things. As Neville said, the be perfectly indifferent to your senses, that you may feel the naturalness of your desire. And so if I want to feel natural about having it, then I associate myself with the inner man who does have it. I become indifferent to my senses. I become indifferent to the doubts. I become indifferent to the reason. And I find myself expressing what I desire within myself. And I trust that. I give my, I trust, as well as I trust imagination implicitly. I completely give my trust over to it. But never forget that you're the dreamer and in your scenes. You're always the dreamer. These, these, this scene can't exist without you. These conceptions can't exist without you. So its reality is dependent upon you. It doesn't really exist without you until you occupy it. And how do I occupy a state? Well, I become completely indifferent to the states that I was in. I, as Neville says, you let go. You, you, never, you don't remember the state you were. You forget it. You completely forget it. And now you enter the state that you want to be in. But we can become such slaves to time. This is what Neville said, that we become such slaves to time that the moment we do not see our conceptions embodying itself immediately, we go back to our former state. But who is going back to the former state? It's the inner man. So the inner man either enters a new state or he goes back to his previous state. He's always in a state. You're always in a state no matter what. So if you are leaving a state to enter into a greater state that you conceive is greater, why go back? You left for a reason. There's a reason why you're leaving the state you're in to go to something greater. Why look back? So you, remember, you don't remember your limitations anymore. You forget them. Man paints on a canvas, but God dreams. So start dreaming something new within you. Assume it to be the case. Not for another, but for yourself. You assume this about you. Entirely all about you. You don't let anyone else's opinion get in the way. Because who's doing it? Who does all things within me? Myself. Whether I harm myself, I shame myself, it's all done by me. One power. There's only one power and it's me. And so if I wish to raise myself, I don't go to something outside of me. If I wish to hinder myself, I don't go to something outside of me. You don't worship the things anymore. You don't worship gold. You give these things up and you go to its maker. And you'll find that all these gods were created by the imagination. All these things that people do is created by the imagination. All these things that people worship, all the people that people worship, are they're worshiping states. You see people worshiping states and they don't realize that they are the being that is occupying the state. The state is powerless without you. And so don't, don't go around trying to worship other people. You're just worshiping states. Instead, take the attitude of testing. Become 
become interested in testing this always. Don't be so concerned with trying to change the external if you can't really change the internal. Learn to settle in in a new state inside yourself. Occupy some new environment in you and test it. Take the attitude of testing it. You'll go a long way doing, doing it that way than you would forcing changes upon your life. Test these changes. Well, if I change myself, if I really see myself, if I know that everything really is a feeling in me, that poverty is a feeling, that shame is a feeling, that feeling uh, less than others is a feeling, if I, if I know that these things are feelings and if I can change the way I feel towards myself, if I can test this, then I should see some change in my external life. If I truly change within myself, well, how do I know I've changed? Why well, I don't look back. I feel something new about myself and I don't look back. Let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. And that's, what, that's the story. That's the story of all of us. We are always dying to ourselves and resurrecting new states within ourselves. But many of us don't consciously do it. We just let these things happen. We, we, we trip and we fall into a new state without even realizing it. But become aware of who you are, that you're the dreamer inside yourself. That you're the one dreaming these thoughts. And when you see that you're the dreamer and you assume that life's a dream, you can change it. Until then, you're going to feel like a complete victim of your thoughts. And you're not. You're no one's victim inside. You're no one's slave inside. You're completely free to imagine anything you wish. You are completely free to extend your power of belief beyond your senses and extend it within yourself. So I believe within myself. I, I extend this power to me. and no longer put it into the things of the world, but into the maker, which is myself. If I said that imagination creates these gods in this world, imagination creates the things in this world, you would say, well, I am imagination. My imagination does it. Yes, so we are one with imagination. We are one with the creator. There aren't two gods. There's only one God, one Lord that we should follow. And it's within us as everything is. Everything is with, even the gods are within us. All things are within us. And I don't care what it is. I don't care what you're searching for. It's within you. And you can't lose it. How can you lose things that are within you? So you can't lose these things. You can't lose these, this power. You can misuse it upon yourself, but you can't lose it. And this is the same story that's been said over and over again. That although it appears without, it is within. Do I actually believe that? If I do believe that, then I can test it. If I actually believe that what is without is within, that I don't need to go to anyone to change it. There's so much power in that. I go within myself. I feel myself to be changed. I feel myself to have. I feel myself to be. And don't look back to my former feeling. I don't look back. I don't need to. And I press forward ahead. You know, the, he who looks back is not fit for the kingdom. He puts his hand on his plow, but he looks back. He's not fit. So if I want to get fit, I have to stop looking back. And that's the story. So there's a certain phrase that Neville said that has stuck with me ever since he, since I've read it, which was a few years ago. And he said that he never barred himself. And I spoke about how he hadn't, you know, he said he never had any background and he had no financial status, no um, academic status, no financial status. He wasn't famous. He didn't have anything. He wasn't known. But he was a man who dreamed. And when he said that he never barred himself, even though he didn't have these qualifications and what he would call the world of Caesar. What he meant was that he never barred the inner man. There was this, there was a time that in my own inner world, my in, inside myself, there were certain places that felt restricted from me. Sort of like when I was a child and someone told me that I wasn't allowed to enter a certain space or a room. I applied that same rule within me. And there were certain spots and places that felt off limits to me. And I would bar myself from actually occupying or entering those rooms. I would feel that there were closed doors and I wasn't allowed in. I felt like there were certain things I wanted, like love and forgiveness, and I wanted to move on and I wanted to change. But these lands felt foreign to me. They felt like they were a myth. 
and they didn't feel real to me. And it felt like they had a gate surrounding them, and I was trying to enter this land of forgiveness, and I would bang on its doors to let me in. And I felt the doors were always closed on me. But I didn't see that I was, it was simply self-giving and self-denial, and I was barring myself. And I didn't know that myself was the inner man. I've been trying so hard to find freedom in the external that I forgot about my internal freedom. And I saw that that's actually what I've been seeking this whole time. And when, and when I read that he never barred himself, I started to apply that more into my life. I started to see that these places and these things that I once thought were myth, like love within me or freedom within me, they weren't, they weren't myths at all. And they weren't fantasies. They were actual realities. And all I had to do was turn my head, turn my attention that way. I had to start imagining those things. And I would restrict myself because I came up with reasons as to why those places were off limits to me. Whether it's my debate, my endless debate, whether I'm worthy or deserving or not, which I could never figure out. I could never figure out if I was worthy enough to have something. And so I gave up on it. I said, who do I ask? If I ask somebody and they passed away tomorrow, I'd have to move on and ask somebody else. And I have to eventually ask myself if I'm worthy of the thing that I want. And the answer is always yes. With me, if I want to be nice to myself, at least, it should always be yes. And that's what, if I had to say, take something that I've said and apply it, it would be this, never bar yourself. And I, I really do plead with you. And I mean you, the inner you. Don't bar yourself in your imagination. Don't restrict yourself. Don't keep placing limits upon yourself and conditions that first must be met. Do not place the condition of the outer things must be organized and rearranged a certain way before I can imagine. This is something I made a mistake on, was that I would wait for things to change before I changed. And regardless of what happens here, the goal is to try to change as quickly. If you can catch it quickly, it's better than for to wait for things to become hectic in your world for you to change something. Do it now. And that's something I've always learned was that you can learn to stop barring yourself if you do everything that you need now. And you don't wait till tomorrow to imagine something. You imagine it right now. And as I've spoken about how you imagine, you imagine being it. That's what you persist in. And so when you bar yourself, it means that you're not occupying the states you want to have. You're trying to imagine to keep trying to become it. You keep trying instead of persisting in being it. And that makes the difference. That's thinking from it and thinking about it. That's the difference. And this is something that you can apply every single day. Learn to never bar yourself. You're going to come into a certain spot within you that you're going to find yourself feeling stuck and restricted in. Apply that. Just tell yourself never by yourself. What is it that you're wanting inside? Free yourself from the inside out. Trust that plan. And trust that it will unfold. And when you start to move with your own faith, which is your own trust, really that's, that, those are your feet within is your own trust. When you start to occupy new places, you'll see that there is nothing that's off limits to you. There's nothing off limits to the inner man inside of the world of imagination. There's nothing off limits. Essentially, there is no no unless you create the no. And that is something hard to wrap one's head around because we might be in an addiction of saying no to oneself. It might be an addiction of self-denial. But I ask you to try to live in self-fulfillment. Try to change, and you have this power. The inner man has the power to change what is in imagination. You have this power. You have the power to settle in and to accept a new state. You don't have to keep visiting things. You can actually occupy them and take them. This is the word that Neville always used. He used appropriation, which is a very strong word. Appropriation means to take it without permission. And when you start to live this way inside yourself, you will see how much you've barred yourself as I did, I saw how much I didn't imagine. I would wait, or I would feel that I wasn't quite morally good yet, or I would feel that I haven't quite 
achieve something externally before I imagine it, which was <laughs> it goes against the whole point, right? And so learn from my mistake on that. And I am just a person, but I've learned a lot of things through, through these teachings. And what I've learned was to never bar yourself. It's the one thing that I'd have to teach. It's something that I've done. It's something that hit me so close to home, which was restrictions. All I knew was to be stuck inside. I was really in cycles. And I saw that I was the one who was creating the cycle. And it all started with me. But I didn't, didn't think me as this external person, but me, the internal man. That is who started this all. And so I went back. I went to see the scene. I went to the thought. I went to the feeling. And I saw who was the one observing these things, who was aware of having these experiences. And I saw that that's me. And and I've had a dream where I saw that I was the light. And that's you as well. Because me and you are the I of man together. So we individualize, but we are actually expanding. The I expands. It's the self inside. And that is who we're barring, which is us. So it really is all self-denial. That's something I learned from one of Neville's students, Linda. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll link it in the description. It's a video where he says, all denial is self-denial. And it's, that was another thing that stuck with me. The idea of denying oneself was something very... Because I know Neville once said that he thinks that revision was what he... you know Listen to this if you're going to listen to anything he says, which is learn to do revision. Which is don't end the night, don't end the day with the the habitual imagining. Change it. Don't end the day thinking that you can't change what you're thinking, if you will. Fall asleep in a different state or fall asleep reimagining the day. And I find that quite powerful, but I found to never bar oneself even more powerful for me and my journey. Because the amount of freedom that you get from not barring oneself, it really does produce a peace within you. And when you see that it's a peace that was created without any outside thing, and it was created by yourself, for yourself, you'll see how much of a loving act it is. And you'll see that it's something that you can continue all, all the time. And this isn't really about trying to manifest anything. This is about learning how to be, be, be things inside. This is learning about fulfillment inside. This is learning about changing things inside. That's why one of the first things it tells you to do in the scriptures is to, in the gospel is to repent, which is to change one's radically change one's mind. It uses the word radical. So you learn to be so the radical really is from within. If I want to be radical, it comes from within. Everything comes from within. So if I want to change something, I know I must know that change is within me. If I want to free myself from something, I must know that the freedom is within me. And the imprisonment is also within me. All things are within me. And I start there. And when you start there, you'll see that the self that Neville's talking about, that he, was bar- that he never barred, was his own imagination. Because he says man is all imagination. And since man is all imagination, when you go to imagine a version of yourself that you want to be, you must see that that version is entirely made up of imagination. So if you become it and embody it, you must be it. And if you must be it and it starts to express itself through you, then a version of you that was all imagination is now expressing. And so man truly is all imagination. And it's a, it's very freeing to accept this. And I don't question it like I used to anymore. Learning to not bar oneself has been one of the most, it, it's brought so much clarity to my inner world, was that no matter what it is, I don't say no to myself, no matter what. I might question whether or not I want it. I might question my desire of it. I might question if it's, it's something I want for me, but whatever it is, whatever I conclude on, I'm not going to say no to myself might take me a second to think about what it is I want. But I also, I always know that it's never going to be ended on no. And I trust the yes that I give myself entirely. And then I start to feel more one with my inner self instead of feeling so connected to this outer self. There really isn't an outer self. This is truly a shadow. It's just hard to imagine that this could be a shadow because we see shadow comes from light. And it's very hard for us to imagine that this three dimen- this, this fleshly world is a shadow. 
But it is. It's truly an effect. And you can test that if you know how to change, if you know how to move inside. And if you know how to move and you know how to sustain the move, you should see a change in your world because you're changing the only thing that is your world, which is yourself. And always, so you always start with self. And so I plead with you to not bar yourself. Really learn how to give yourself the freedom you want and the freedom you're seeking. No matter how free it is, no matter how much it is, you don't feel ashamed about it. You grant it. And then you will realize that the Savior you're seeking has always been within you. And I don't care what it is. It says, whatsoever you desire, believe you have it and you will. So I'm not called to figure out when. I'm not called to figure out how it's going to happen. I'm called to believe I have it. Or at least I'm told to believe I have it. And so I follow that teaching. I don't try to figure out if I'm worthy of it. I don't try to figure out if something bad's going to first happen for it to come into being. <laughs> I don't question that. I believe I have it. And that is learning to not bar yourself. As you practice that every single day. And you will find restrictions. You will find rooms that you will feel that are off limits to you. You might even be scared to actually occupy them. You might even realize that you have been living in a certain space within you that you've never wanted. And so you have these mental spaces within you that it must be pounded into the mind that there is no mental space that is off limits to you. If you can just accept that and don't become so skeptical and question it so much, you will see that all has already been said yes to within. If it's been conceived in the mind, it's already been said yes to. But it's us that we don't necessarily accept it. And this is why Neville says he's not talking about emotion, but about acceptance. It's the acceptance that the wish has been granted, or the, ex the belief that I have it. It's the same thing that's being said, and it will forever be the same thing that's going to be said. I give my take on it, but it's the same thing. Neville said, never bar yourself. It says to believe you have it, and I'm saying for your, you have all the mental spaces within you that you can occupy. It's the same exact thing. Basically, I want to give you, the inner man, the freedom that you've been wanting. You might, need, you might need some permission on the outside first, but you, you'll realize you never needed it. And so, so all of these videos are addressed to you, the inner man, the one who can change, the one who can, as I once said, the inner man can create a king in a basement. It doesn't need anything on the outside for it to assume a position. And that's the power if you can see that it's an actual power that you have, which is to be able to deny one's senses and assume something new in its place within you, and that change within you, if you sustain it, it comes into being. If you can see that, well, then you'll see it's a power. And you may have misused this power for a very long time, which is what was in my case. And when you realize that you've misused it, and you start to not bar yourself, you start to free yourself, you will be given, as Neville said, the energy back that you thought you lost. I mean, there's been so many times where I felt so down, and I, I looked at my imagining, and I saw that there were, those were things that I've been imagining for decades. If I was honest with myself, I saw that I held on to these certain thoughts that brought me down for a very long time, and they brought me down. And the moment I broke it, the moment I saw that it was me who was given it the power, that I was given the power to thought and not back to myself, that I wrongfully gave it to that, I let it become, I let it control me in a way. I saw that there was no thought that was greater than me. There was no feeling greater than me. And when I saw that, it felt like all of this energy returned to me. Like I was so thirsty and I finally found the water I was seeking. But it was not a water outside of me. It was a water truly within me. And so you practice not barring yourself through belief. Believing in oneself. And you persist in being things. No longer trying to become them. Although essentially you are becoming the new state. But you are imaginarily being the new state. And you try that every night. 
and you don't bar yourself, no matter what it is, no matter if it sounds silly to you, I don't question if it's possible. I'm called to believe I have it. And the freedom in that, it just, it puts a smile on my face because it's so, I've never had this happen to me where I like I studied Neville and then I started to see him in my dreams. I never had it where I started to have all these visions from learning from someone. And I'm telling you from my own study on this, that this is a gospel. This is a good news. It's all good news. And so you test the good news. Test that you know, believe you have it. It's really good news. Don't question, but believe you have it. Do that first before you try to figure out the questions. Try to prove it to yourself before you come up with all of the theories and questions. This is very common, which is, well, what if this person imagines that? And what if that person's... Don't worry about that. Or what about everyone you pushed out? Try to prove it instead of trying to figure it out. Try to prove it to oneself. Change, change yourself, meaning change you, the inner man. Occupy something new within you. That's what I mean by change oneself. I don't mean you now... Um, pick up jogging. I'm not talking about anything external to you. I'm saying occupy something new within you. Sustain that newness. Sustain it. Um, whatever it is. And if your world starts to reflect that, well then you found a key. And what you'll find is that the key you've been seeking all along, that master key that you've been wanting, is self. And so self is the key to all the doors and all the mental spaces that you want to be opened. A full acceptance that you have it. A full acceptance that you occupy it. A full acceptance that it is already so because it is to you the inner man. And so you identify and associate yourself with that being. The inner being. You just identify with it. Don't ask so many questions. Try to prove it to yourself instead of trying to figure out the answers to those questions. They'll come. But first try to prove it. I noticed the more you prove this the less questions you actually have. You'll see how true this these teachings truly are and how freeing they really are. And then you'll go on a, uh, the true voyage of life. Everyone, you know, you've seen people sail across the world on a voyage, but the true voyage of life, the true victory, the true void is self-discovery. Is when you discover the land within you, which is just yourself. And so that is the true voyage of life. And you don't need to do anything outside of yourself. So you get to let go of this external world. Meaning you get to see its effect and no longer feel like a victim to it. And I'm not claiming this is the easiest thing, but I am claiming that it's possible. And so... I want to just end this on another plea. Do not bar yourself. If you're close to doing it, just say those words to yourself. Never bar self. Practicing this type of work and knowing it are two different things. Listening to my work or to these videos or anybody's work is not practicing it. Reading Neville is not practicing it. That's simply learning the knowledge of it. Practicing it is much different. And so don't listen to my videos thinking that it's going to change anything. There's nothing to change but self. And self is not external. It's within. And so I don't use outside things to change myself. For self is not outside of me. And the way I would simply, if I had to give you, or the way I gave myself a simple understanding of this, I would say it's this. You want to enter or occupy the mental space where it already is done, where you already are that, where it already is so. That there is nothing else you need to do to get it. You occupy the space where it already is that. It already is the way you want it to be. That's the difference between success and failure, for success and failure are within us as all things are, including myself. And so if I don't occupy, because Neville uh, gave this word called, you know, he would say deferred occupancy is really the root of failure. And the reason why it's the root of failure 
if you think of it as the inner man, you will see that it is because if I don't embody it, then I'm not it. I must really embody what I want to be. And if imagining creates reality, as the claim goes, then I must imagine myself the way I want to be. I must be the thing. I must imagine myself as already being it if I want to be it. And so I don't feel scared or unworthy to do it. There's, that's the only way to do it. If imagining creates really, I must imagine myself as, as if I already am that. Not to become it, but to simply occupy this mental space. So I don't, I'm not trying to fix myself. I'm simply changing myself. And that, that is the key in the practice of this. It's persisting in the mental space where I already am that. And that is the difference between anxiety and peace. It's focusing on, the, on that change of it already being that way. And I made a video on this before, but it has to be repeated over and over again because it's going to click one day. You're going to understand exactly what I'm saying, that I'm addressing this to you, the inner man. If you don't embody it, you aren't it, but you can embody it. You, there is a mental space in you where it already is that way. It's, you're not embodying that space. You're not occupying it so it can be that way. You're occupying a space where it already is that way, where you already are that thing. That is what you occupy. That is what you persist in. And so I have to ask myself, am I occupying a space to get it or am I occupying a space where it already is that way? That's the, that's the difference. And that's what, I, that's what I persist in and that's the true practice of it. It's not listening to videos or reading, although I don't think that's wrong. I just think that, and I don't think really things are wrong. I just think that it's, uh, to practice it, it's really about going inward into oneself instead of listening outwardly to other people like me speak about this. It's good to gain knowledge, but you'll gain more knowledge if you go within yourself and change. You'll see the nuance in the change. And when you experience that feeling of it already being that way, when you experience that peace or that freedom, that it's not about trying to work your way into it. It's about occupying a space where it already is that way. That you're going to find persisting in that is far easier and far more peaceful and far more freeing than it would be in trying to make sure your thoughts are good, trying to make sure everything's fine. When Neville was in the army, he occupied the space inside of himself where he already was in New York. He wasn't imagining to get out. He was imagining already being in New York. That's the difference. The focus is completely different. The focus is not on the external, but in the change of where I want to occupy within myself. That is the change that Neville did. He changed where he occupied. He, instead of imagining himself to get to New York, he imagined himself already being in New York. That's the difference. That is what you persist in. And he said he felt lovely for like nine days. He just kept doing that and he felt amazing. I'm not saying, and it's not about feeling amazing. You will, that will happen. It elicits that response because why wouldn't it? If it's a fulfilled desire, it's a fulfilled wish. Why wouldn't it elicit that response? But it's not anything forceful. It's simply occupying that position where it already is that way. Now, what tends to happen is people visit these places within themselves. They don't stay. They don't feel worthy enough to actually stay in it. And so you want to be something, you imagine it already being that way, and you occupy that space. You stay there, but some visit. They just visit for a little time and they leave and they go back to their previous state. You will see that changing states is very simple, but it just requires your persistence. That's it. But the persistence is an already, it's already being that way. That's the persistence. That's the key in changing it. That is the difference between success and failure. For failure is a lack of embodiment for the inner man. I can change myself right away, right now, but it doesn't mean I'm going to persist in my change. I will go back. If I so choose, I can go back. But why go back if I'm already leaving it? But I don't go into a new space trying to get to that space. I go into it where it already is the case. That's the difference. That's success. That's hitting your mark. That's what that is. And you persist in that. And you don't allow yourself to let all the labels that have been thrown on you. You don't allow yourself for the circumstances that you've gone through to define you. For things don't define man. Man defines man. And you're man. You get to define yourself. And self is within. And so you start inward. 
You don't go outside of, to, to someone else to tell you who you are. You go within and you see the confirmation that comes out. And so what this is, is a man's testing of his, his ability to externalize. We are testing our ability to externalize. And what we want to externalize is things already being that way. It's, it says, don't say there's four months until harvest, but see it's already ripe. That's what I persist in. I know I've repeated myself in this, but this is crucial. This is something that needs to be repeated until it's, it penetrates the mind, until it saturates the mind with understanding. Because until then, you're most likely going to give yourself anxiety attacks. Because you're going to feel like, have I reached it? Have I reached it? How do I know I embodied it? You know you embodied it when you occupy the space where you already are that, instead of trying to get it. That's the difference. One is it's it's completely effortless. It feels wrong at first, but if you persist in it, you'll see that you'll start see, noticing changes in your because you're changing yourself. You'll notice changes in your life very quickly. And I wrote a post once that said, "The less you look, the more you see." And the point I'm trying to make that is, if you focus on the inner change within, if you sustain and persist inside, and you just by me by that I mean you simply stay or you visit the place of where it already is that way. And you just focus on that inwardly. And you focus on that feeling inwardly. You let, As I said, a thought is a catalyst, feeling is a sustenance. So the more you uh, feel it, you're sustaining it for yourself. The more you occupy it, you sustain it. And you don't focus so much on what's happening outside of you. You will, I noticed this for myself, the less I look to my external, I would, I would just turn my head or something would happen I'd hear something, it would just pop up, and it would be exactly what I imagined. And that's what I would know that if I, if I just stopped focusing so much on what's happening outside of me and pay attention to what's happening within me, I see its reflection quickly. So the less I look to the outside, the more I see what I'm actually doing within me. And the more I focus on what's happening within me, I will encounter my, I seem to encounter my manifestations quicker instead of becoming anxious on when is it going to happen outside of me? I focus on it already happened within me. That's what I focus on. That is the difference between success and failure. As I stated, these things are within us. Success and failure is within us. And so what tends to happen is that someone will have a desire and the desire will be something they've wanted for a while, but they'll find themselves manifesting things they other areas, which is fine, but then they won't find themselves manifesting or expressing the things they want in another area. And what I found for this is that the individual, including myself, tends to believe in two gods, that there's another God that creates that desire and a different God that creates this desire. There are not two gods. If you can stitch this together and create a unity, that there's only one God to all my desires, there's another freedom that you're given. It's another key that opens you up within. And you'll see that that is yourself. That you go within, you commune with yourself for that desire and the other desire that you feel can't be expressed. You go to the same God. This, you go within. That's what I'm trying to say. You don't think that there's one God for this desire and one God for that desire. That separation breeds nothing but confusion. And it breeds nothing but stagnation. Once you see there's only one, one God, you'll start to free yourself even more and more. And you do more and more and more. You don't just stop after one thing. Occupy something else after. Feel that you've already, you already are this other thing and feel that you're already that thing and feel that you already have this thing. Don't go to the position of trying to get it. Go to the position of already having it inside yourself and sustain it. It, it will feel so, it feels so wonderful. And so again, practicing it and knowing it are two different things. Practice it by by finding a new mental home or new mental position, occupy something new where it already is the case. That's the test you're going to have for yourself. Can I really believe it already is that way? Can I believe that? If I can, then I must become it because I must be what I embody. And if imagining creates reality, then I have to imagine myself already being the thing I want to be. I often get asked a question as to what should I do after I've imagined? Man thinks that he must do something. Man 
is convinced that man is out on the outside. But man is within, as all things are. The story is that God became man. He didn't become something else. He became man. And so God trips. God spills his beer. God sings and all these wonderful things because he became man. But man finds trouble to believe this. It seems too good to be true. But man is within. And so when I get asked, what should I do? They usually refer to the I in that question as something on the outside. But I is within. And so you ask yourself, what should I do? It really should be, where should I imagine myself to be inside myself? Because that is me. And so you identify yourself with imagination, not with your senses, as Neville has said. You see that the I and the imagination are one. That where I am at inside myself, that is where I reside. That is truly where I'm at. And so I don't need a savior on the outside. I can leave everything alone. I let others be so that I can be inside. But by me, I mean the inner me. The inner man. That is you. That is who you identify with. So you will no longer ask, what should I do? It's where you occupy it, inside yourself. That's the only thing you need to change is self. And so you let everyone have their thoughts and opinions, and you let everyone have every thought and opinion that they want. And you change self. You don't do it on the outside of yourself, you do it on the inside. You become the thing that you want to be, you occupy that space. But man has a difficulty with thinking that he is within, that man is within. And when you see this truth, because it is a truth, when you see the truth of this, as Neville has said, that you will find the core of reality when man identifies himself with his own imagination instead of his own senses, which we so often do. And so the inner man always sees things as already being so. The, to the inner man, the fig tree that was cursed was already cursed, and yet it happened the next day here in this, on this plane of existence. And so Christ curses the fig tree, but he did it in his imagination. And then it happened. But Christ is not a person. It's you. And what I mean is that the Christ, or this state, has states for itself that whatever I desire, I will believe I have it and I will. But these words become your words. You take upon this identity and you will see that it's the identity of the inner man who is truly you. And so these words become yours. You keep them as your own. You say them as your own. That whatsoever I desire, I'll believe I have it and I will. And to do that, you have to let everything be. To truly follow your own words, you have to let it all be. Don't think it's some Christ. Those words belong to some Christ long ago. To some Savior who, who existed 2,000 years ago. That Savior is within us, as all things are. The Savior we seek is within us. And we see it's ourselves. The I is our Savior. And so I go to occupy something. That's all that means is when it says to repent or to change oneself. It's just to occupy something new. You find a new place, a new home within you. And you rest there. And you find the mental breath of relief in you. As all things are, the breath is within you. Everyone knows the sigh of relief when one finds their peace. But find the mental breath of relief. It exists on a mental plane. That you can take anything on the outside here and duplicate it inside. You can create another image. 
And that one who sees that image is the inner man. That's Christ. That's God. But man thinks God is something else. He idealizes a, a human, and by doing that, he dehumanizes them. He degrades one, and then he dehumanizes a, a human. But man became humanity. They're one. And so you elevate humanity by seeing that it's one with God. It is God. And, that, and in that way, you find unity, a true unity. You don't idealize anyone because you don't have to. They're just a state. It's just God occupying a state. And I want to stress the message is that you take those words as your own and you live upon them as if they're your own. Whatsoever I desire, I believe I have and I will. These are your words. You walk by them. You apply them. You practice them. You don't go to anything outside of self to fulfill oneself. And so the question as to what do I do, sometimes it's not the, sometimes when I don't understand something, I'm not, maybe I'm not asking the right question. And I don't doubt my ability to understand. I just don't think I'm asking the right question in the right way. And in this case, the I is what we need to change. You have to relate to the I with the imagination. Then you'll understand it. You'll understand Neville. It's right there. You'll get it. And then you'll start moving. You'll start applying it. You'll start forgiving yourself. You'll start being new things. But you can't change self if you don't know what it is. If you don't know where it is. If you think man is on the outside then you're going to always seek for another savior. And so the true savior of life is within us. And it is us. And this is a redemptive story. And take what I'm saying seriously. Apply these words as your own. As if you are the Christ saying them. They're coming from your lips that you are the one who follows the teachings, that you don't wait for four months. You say the harvest is ripe. You apply these teachings as if they're your very own, and you take upon the identity of Christ, which is your true own identity. I cannot think of another state that is more important to occupy. It seems to me that over time, I have found nothing more worthy to imagine being. You can be this and that, but I found taking the words of Christ as your own to be so impactful that they feel I know they're true. And I don't wait upon anyone to, up, to accept these as my own. I just apply them as if they are my own. And the freedom that comes with accepting these words as your very own it's the peace that comes with it it's a true stilling of of a restless soul you finally find that area in you that mental breath of relief you find it through applying it and so if you want to truly understand this message in neville's teachings on a deep level Take those words as your very own and apply them, and you will see that you are the Christ. You are the Savior you've been seeking. It's you. And I don't mean you, the one that, the, I'm not speaking to the body of you or your senses or the name you were given. I'm speaking to the I in you, the consciousness in you. I'm speaking to that being. As I said, these videos are addressed to the inner man that it is already so to you. Now change you and change I when I speak and identify that with the spiritual man, the inner man. And then from there you will know what to do. You will know what to imagine. You will no longer seek another God. You will no longer seek another man to give you what you want. You will follow, those, you will follow that teaching 
whatsoever I desire, I will believe I have it, and I will. So we must become more concerned with the dreamer instead of the dream. Because the dreamer gives us the answer. And so we search for the who in life, and we no longer will seek a thing in life. And it tells us that who is Christ, and the who is the one who created all things. So I must find the who. I must find the I in man. I must discover what that is. What is the self inside? We can start simply by noticing that no matter what I fear inside myself, no matter what happens, no matter what happens inside of myself, I am doing it. I know that I'm the cause of my fear inside of me. And so fear becomes no longer something that feels independent, like a nightmare, but it becomes an illusion. It becomes something that can be conquered, something to let go of, because I know I'm the one creating it. And so when I said in my meditation that there is nothing to fear in here, I meant it. Because the only thing that there is to fear is what we create. And we don't have to create fear. No matter how far you've gone into your mind with creating the fearful thought, you can break it. You can stop it. You don't have to continue with it. And it's learning to say no to it. Learning to become indifferent to it. You're becoming indifferent to certain parts of yourself. You're becoming indifferent to creating in a certain way. You no longer want to create out of fear. You want to create out of abundance or out of love or whatever it is that you want. This is very important to know, to, to, to realize that the fears in me really aren't my own. Most of the time they're given to you by other people. Most of the time you're taught to fear this and fear that. And you have the power to let go of them. But that power is held by you, the inner man, who's creating it. And so I want you, meaning you, the inner man, to see that you're the one who causes your own fears. And so I'll never have to go outside of myself to discover myself or to find myself. If I were to right now imagine myself at a beach and I close my eyes and I find myself not where I'm sitting in front of a mic, but I'm at a beach, I see that myself is at a beach. So myself is in me. And so if I want to change myself, I have to go inward. That's where myself lies. And I exalt myself, or I change myself, whatever it is you want to say. Regardless, it's, in my opinion, an exalting. I find it to be very relieving when you move from a state of fear inside, you, the inner man, and you find yourself in a land of abundance, or a land of freedom, or a, as I said, you find the mental breath of relief. You mentally find the promised land. You mentally find the place within you that you desire to be. You don't wait for it to happen. And so night after night, you fall asleep as the one who already is, not the one who is waiting to be. This is the difference between how one sleeps in failure and one sleeps in success. And you don't want to be like a feather that gets blown around by the wind with rumors and, and people's uh, doubts and opinions. You stand firm in what you have convicted yourself of, what you've persuaded yourself of. And it's truly... It's sacred. You are seeing and hearing things that mortals cannot hear or see. It's something sacred. It's special. And it's a gift to yourself. And so we have the choice to listen to ourselves, which what I mean by that is listen to the inner man that already is that. When I fall asleep tonight and I want to fall asleep as someone who already is X, I have a choice to listen to that or to listen to the doubts or my senses of others. I have a choice. Who am I going to? Who's going to be my Lord? Who will I obey? And so I have to choose every night my Lord, and I'll find that my Lord is within me. My Savior is within me. And if you just listen closely, if you just listen inside yourself, you will hear the fulfillment of your dream. You will hear it, and it will taste good to your ears. I've been given gifts in Christmas and occasions, and it feels good to receive a gift. But I cannot think of a more freeing feeling than to abandon my reasoning and to actually hear my desire fulfilled or to actually see it, to actually see myself experiencing or being 
what I want. I cannot think of something more fulfilling because it's intimate. It's not something that anyone knows that I'm doing. So I can truly let go of the external and I'll find the who. Instead of looking outside for the cause, I will find it within myself. And so the world will always convince you that things are outside of you, that the cause is outside of you, that the God is outside of you, that everything is outside of you and it's happening to you. But just practice, live upon the idea as if it's reversed. See if you can reverse the order of things. And go to the maker, go to the who. Find the dreamer and stop feeling persuaded and stuck in the dream. When you fall asleep and you find yourself awake inside of your own dream, the last thing you will do is feel stuck. The last thing you will do is feel that you can't get out of it or that you can't change it. There's an example that Neville gave was that he's speaking about the inner man. He said, imagine yourself chained to a bench. That you can't, you're not free and you can't leave it. You're bound by this bench. And then he said, imagine yourself running. And he said, in this instant, you freed yourself from the chains of that bench. You freed yourself from that bondage. And now you're running. He's speaking solely about the inner man. And so you inside yourself might be in a position you dislike. You might be in a position where you feel like you are shackled or you're in bondage. It's up to you to free yourself, meaning you, the inner man, from that position inside of imagination and choose the position you want to be in. Move inside, use your imaginal feet and find yourself in a new place. Walk somewhere new, walk as a different person inside. And you'll see that it was just in an instant you went from being in bondage to your, pre, your one state to now being fulfilled in a new state. And that's all it takes. You moved, it might not seem that way because you didn't physically move your feet, but you moved internally. You have changed a position mentally. Operate now from that position. So you no longer, as Neville said, think about it, which would be to, really, I think thinking about it is just simply desiring it. It's simply, oh, it'd be nice. You just think about how nice it would be instead of actually feeling that it is so. It's a completely different feeling. They're night and day. One is, one is wishful. The other one is certain. The other one is knowing. The other one is... Con it's convicted of this truth of oneself. It's convicted. It's persuaded. It knows. It's the difference. So no matter how long you've been in one state, it really is that simple. No matter how long you've been bound to that bench, you can see yourself running. And so you will eventually leave that old state. You will die to it. You will spread its ashes and you will find yourself resurrected in a new state. And so where I position myself inside of my own imagination is up to me entirely. But I do not enter these states as though I'm unworthy to receive them or as though they are bigger than I am. And so then all states become mine. And then you'll start to live in abundance within. And you'll see that like all things, abundance is also within you. Your confidence is within you. Everything that you need is within you. If on the bridge to your fulfillment you need knowledge, you'll be given the knowledge. You'll be given the words to say, You'll be given the confidence you need. You don't lack anything. So far in my experience of life, I have found that the world may want to push you in certain directions into thinking things about yourself that you might personally not believe in. And it might try to persuade you and convince you to doubt yourself and make you question yourself. And what I found is that things like being powerless and things like being a slave to the world or feeling small, it comes from within us. Seeing the world through the eyes of the inner man, as Neville has described, has been something that I feel like I've awakened to. And I don't see reality the same way. I don't see myself just as a physical being, but as a mental one. I see that I do a lot of things within myself. I see that I act in certain ways within myself, inside my own imagination. And 
one of the ways I've interacted within myself has been feeling powerless within myself, feeling like a slave inside my own mind. And this has been something that I've struggled with for a long time. And I didn't know how to free myself. I didn't understand what it meant to free myself because I thought I myself was only the physical form. I didn't have a map inside of me. I didn't know where I was going. And this is where desire plays such a key role is find a purpose or find a desire in life and fulfill it. Because if you don't have one, it's it's just better to know where you're going than to try to figure, you know, guess it around and try to just jump on this bus and that bus. You should probably know the bus you're going to go on. Know what state you want instead of wondering, spending so much time wondering. I, I understand there's times to learn about yourself and understand what it is you want, but it's imperative that you find it because you have the ability to fulfill it and you know this through Neville's work. And as I said, interacting within myself as a slave has been not beneficial to me. I found certain thoughts in me that were really wonderful and beautiful, but I never felt, for some reason, I felt worthy to create them, but I never felt worthy to have them. I didn't find it necessarily wrong that I thought of something wonderful about myself but there was a level of feeling that I can't just have that. It was too good to be true about me. But I had such a limited scope on what self was. I thought self was reduced to behaviors. That's what I was taught. Whatever my behaviors were, that's myself. Or whatever my feelings are, that's myself. Or whatever my thoughts are, that's myself. But Neville helped peel the layers back, and I saw that I am the creator of my own thoughts. And I'm creating like a slave. I'm creating like somebody who's powerless within myself. I'm imagining things as if they're meant for someone else and not me. That the good thing is for someone better than me. I mean, I was pushed towards an edge where I wished I was always somebody else. I could tell other people were more free. You know, I I would get jealous looking at the birds and just wishing I was a bird. I felt envious of it. But I had such a limited perspective on what self was. I felt stuck within myself. I felt that whatever it is I wanted to be felt so out of reach. And when it came close to me, I felt I couldn't take it. I felt I had to remain small inside. As it says, We were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And that is the relationship between man's inner world and his outer world. That they truly are one, but one has the ability within to manipulate or to, I don't like using that word, but to change. You learn to start freeing that inner man who feels like a slave. You start within your own imagination. That is where you begin. And so that beginning point that Neville gave was very important to me. It allowed me to have a starting point. And then from there, I had noticed patterns inside of myself, just like how I noticed patterns in the world. I noticed these patterns in me. And these. there is a pattern that when I would fear a thought, it was this inability to say no to it. And I didn't have this word within me. I didn't, like I said, I felt like a slave. So I felt a slave to every thought. My relationship with thought was one in which reminded me of how powerless I feel. And so I repeated that pattern over and over again. And it was like learning Neville was very difficult because he provided so much power at first, but I had no control of it. It's like I knew for a fact that I was creating these thoughts and yet I couldn't stop doing it. And I didn't see the relationship between how I feel and the thoughts that I'm creating. And it wasn't until I started to feel more powerful, my thoughts became calmer. They became 
more, it became easier to imagine myself within the fulfillment of my desire. It became easier. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like it was a robbery for me to take within myself. I didn't, at first I did, but then I started to realize that no matter what I think, it's my own thought that I'm allowed to have. And reason, which really is just whatever society has taught me to believe, will tell me to reject that. And that is me rejecting myself. If I imagine myself being something and I become that, then myself is within me. And so I don't need to look any further to change myself. I don't have to wait upon anyone. And this is the good news that Neville tries to offer. And so the ability to let go of the powerlessness that I've felt, that I felt obligated to carry, letting that go has been it's been been actually very difficult, but also it's very simple. And that's what I found in this type of work. It's very easy to understand once you get it. But for some reason, it can take a lot of repetition to get it. The idea that within my own self, I was a slave. And I changed the way I thought of myself, and I changed the way I imagined it's very simple. It just takes some practice. And believe me, I understand practice because I've done this for a long time now. I started from a very, very low position. That is what I'm trying to say. Is that I started from a low position within imagination. I did not feel worthy pretty much of anything good in it. And I realized how much of a lie that was. I truly believed in a lie. And I lived upon that lie. And so don't let reason be your God. Don't let the world dictate, don't let the appearances dictate what it is that you are or what it is you're allowed to accept within. Because if you do that, you're going to be, you're not going to be able to see past your own appearance, your own, your own eyes, your own eyelashes, as it says. How can you change if you depend on the appearances? How can you change if your self is dependent on senses? And so when you free self from reason, from the senses, you embark on the true voyage of life, and it's the voyage of self. And you will start to naturally create new things for yourself that you won't feel unworthy of. Just as an artist signs their painting, you will see your signature attached to the thought. You'll see your, you will see its maker, and it'll be yourself. And so, truly, the the lie is to believe you're powerless, and for power is attached to you. It's an attribute. You can't have power without you. Power doesn't exist. And so start going inward and find yourself in there and see where it is you've placed yourself. And as Abdullah told Neville, never shame self, but change self. He says, find self, but never shame it. Just change. So I was meditating the other day and I was thinking about Neville's work. And I thought about William Blake and he mentions in a poem how to always see in double vision. And to always see in double vision would be to see things as symbolic messages or the representations of something mental or something about us and not seeing it through just the senses. And that would be single vision. So he said to always keep double vision. And when I opened my eyes, I saw that there was an object in front of me and I had a lamp on in the corner. And because I had that lamp on, it cast uh, cast a, a shadow from this object. And I really tried to see this through more of a mental lens, and I thought what I could learn from something so simple. Something obvious to me, which is a shadow I, and a lamp and a light source, I wanted to at least understand it from a perspective through Neville. And what I saw was that however I moved this object, or if I moved the lamp, the shadow would change. It would cast something different. And so the shadow is directly related with the relationship this object has with the light. And, well, I thought about that from Neville's work when he says that 
This outer man is simply a shadow of the inner man, who is the light. And I tried to uh, understand it through this, you can say, a physical message. And what I saw was that the light, the lamp, represents my imagination. And where I am at inside of my imagination, what relationship I have with it, I cast a shadow upon this world. And so if I change myself in relationship to this imagination or this light source, which I discovered was within me uh, in the dream that I had with Neville, that that ball of light was in me, where I decide to be in relationship to that light, I cast a shadow upon this world. And so I really tried to see from their perspective that this world is a shadow, it's an effect from that light. And so I could, in theory, pick up the object and move it two inches to the right or to the left and it would cast a different shadow. But these are it would, it, that's a very minor change in the reality. Um, if I want a larger change, then I would have to see what I am in reality. And I find myself in reality. And so if I want to change something in reality that's important to me, it would be myself. I'd have a bigger impact than just simply having small degrees of manipulation. And I don't like the word manipulation, but let's just say small degrees of movement in reality. If I want a larger movement in reality, then I must change something that's larger than simply moving an object two inches to the right. And so I see that the larger thing to change would be myself. And the way I change myself is I go inside of myself and I see myself in a new state of mind as if it's like a piece of clothing, as if I mentally put on new clothes, a new mental state of consciousness. I decide to occupy it. I decide to have it. I don't wonder anymore if I'm moral enough or if I'm deserving enough because I, we are told that it doesn't judge on the shadow. So whatever you've done in this shadow world it doesn't really matter. What matters is where you occupy mentally because all outer activity first starts and it first has imaginal activity before it. Now, I know this from my own experience. I've had arguments inside my head. And a week, two weeks later, the argument happens exactly as I worded it. I might have forgot what I've said, but if I remember, if I try to recall it, I will, if I see my harvest and think about when did I think this, I can find it. I can find something very similar. And so I start to see that reality is far more mental than I give it credit for. And something you can do every day is promise yourself in the morning when you wake up that whatever desire arises within you, that you will fulfill it within you by believing you have that. And just go with you, just live your day normally, but change what you're doing internally. People always ask me, well, what do I do after I've imagined? Don't do anything. Just imagine it. Imagine that you have the thing you desire. Change your position inside of yourself. Be more interested. Be more concerned if you worry a lot. Worry more about where you're at internally, although I wouldn't recommend you not worry. I would recommend you changing. Change your where you're at in relation to that light or in, to, uh, in relation to consciousness. And Think of it, if you really have a hard time taking ownership of it, think of it this way, that when you go to assume a new state within you, think of it as consciousness itself is clothing you with new mental clothes or a new mental state of, of mind. It's clothing you. It's giving it to you. It's like a new outfit, mental, a new mental outfit. That's what I would call it. You have to put on a new mental outfit. And I understand that there's many obstacles that can come in the way between you and the acceptance of this new mental outfit. You might wonder what others might think. You might wonder what you might think of yourself. You might wonder if you're worthy or not or whatever it may be or enough in this area, that area. You might judge yourself. But I would recommend instead of you judging yourself, you actually move and change. It says to repent. And repentance is a radical change of mind. It doesn't say first fix all the things that are wrong or remove your guilt or do this and then or you know right your wrongs and then imagine no it says change move find a movement within you and sustain the movement live somewhere else move as you would in this world many of us move into a new state a literal state here and we tend to not do that internally 
but become more interested in what you're doing internally, you have a larger movement in this outer reality for it's just a shadow. And then the what you'll find is that when you find movement to be more important than your judgment of yourself, then the umbilical cords of the past will be cut and the ligaments of the previous states will be ripped and you'll be set free from your own bondage. And before you change, maybe you're about to change, but you feel a bit afraid that what if it doesn't happen? Always remember this. Whenever I have fallen into that mindset where I wondered, I was kind of afraid of it wouldn't happen. I wondered, well, where else would I go to? To fulfill this desire, who else can I go to? I would wonder what God I could worship. There was this lecture that Neville gave where he said that many Catholics believed in the saints, and yet the church decided to claim certain saints as non-existent. And so you had thousands and thousands of people, millions of people, praying to saints that never existed. And so they were testing something outside of themselves. And that's not what the point is. The point is to test what is within us. That is what we test. We test the power in us. And when we test it and we see that it works, we can't go to another power. So we make the power one. We make everything one in a sense. Because the moment you go to one false god, you'll find another and another. Next thing you know, you're worshipping rocks and you're worshipping deities that don't exist, that don't speak back to you. You're worshipping things that will never show you that you already are the thing you want to be. As Neville says, but it's your refusal to believe it is the reason you don't see it. And so we start to live upon our mental eyes. And we start to fulfill our mental eyes. We start to fulfill our mental mouths by speaking the words we want. We start to fulfill our mental ears by hearing the things we desire. We no longer live in sin inside of ourselves. That's the good news. And it is good news. But to have it explained clearly can be difficult. And I am trying my best to try to manipulate and maneuver the English tongue to make it make sense to myself as well. But I hope I'm making sense that really you have this ability to move inside of yourself and you don't have to tell anybody. Nobody has to know where you desire to occupy. Let the world go. Let it be the way exactly as it is, as Neville has said. And find the mental breath of relief, as I've said inside. Find that mental place. Find the promised land. What is your desired land that you wish to live in, that you wish to have ownership of? Who else, if not you, will have ownership of it inside of you? Who else? There's no one else in you to occupy that state. You're the only one who can. And once you live upon your mental eyes, you'll start seeing with your mental eyes. You'll see that they're more important, your mental eyes, than your physical ones. And then you'll no longer live reacting to life reacting to your environment because if you re only react to your environment you can never surpass your environment because as Neville has said that if you judge by the appearances of things you'll forever be enslaved by them it's another way of saying that if you keep reacting to your environment you can't surpass it you have to think above your environment you have to think above your current self your current self you have to rise above where you think you are right now and it may be difficult you may struggle to believe it, but you're being shown it within you. You're hearing it within you. Learn to believe in that being, and you'll see it's your very self that you're believing in. And then you'll start to live upon a new authority, a new Lord, a new God to worship, but not one seen by mortal eyes, not one created by wood and hands, but one that is in you, that's your very self. Have you ever entered a room where there is many people in it? And you decided to take the observer perspective and you tried to just observe and try to see if you can hear um, conversations being spoken. You might notice that there are a few words that jump out at you. You might catch a few words here and there, but you don't actually know what's happening because it feels like things are being thrown at you. And then if you back out even more, 
and you try not to listen, but just try to hear the room, you will hear what sounds like white noise. And when we speak, we are trying to be heard and listened to. But what Neville is telling us through his work is that the true ear of God is within. And so God listens to what I say with my invisible lips, not with the ones I use physically. And this has been said so many times that people who pray, they will, a lot of religious people will pray outwardly. And whoever can say the words in this strong and powerful way with their voice, they think God will hear them because they think God is outside of them. And so we, what we actually want is for our inner words to be listened to. We are seeking the ear of life to hear us. But we don't need to use our physical lips to be heard. And it says that those who pray that way, outwardly, they receive their reward. So they do get what they want, which is to hear their own words, to feel like they're being seen praying. That's what they want. And they receive it. And so this, this societal man, or the outer man, which is really just a makeup of ideas given to you by society, you can put a bunch of these parts together, and you create an avatar of sorts. But this mental person or this thing is seeking a savior outside of itself. And so man is always walking through life, actually trying to find God. But it's, he's always seeking outside of him. And so we're looking for an ear, or we're looking for our own voice, or we're looking for our own power, or we're looking for our own ownership, because it's not until you feel that you have complete ownership over your imagination that you will feel responsible for what you put in it, because you need ownership to feel responsible. And if you think that you don't have ownership over your mind, then you're not going to care what goes in it because it's not yours, according to you. And, and so this societal man gets filled with ideas on what he thinks he, he is and should be. And what society does is that it gives you a few feelings to accept, a few feelings you're allowed to have. And I would actually as I said, feel beyond reason. So I'm telling you to feel beyond whatever your society has given you. You know, when I go into meditation, I start to feel what I want to feel. I don't really care what my senses say. I will feel elevated to extreme heights. I know society necessarily doesn't, there's nothing really in it that would make me feel that, but I will make myself feel it regardless. And so I have to go against the feelings the restrictions given to me placed on my mind. And I do that by feeling beyond my reason. And reason is what has been given to me to really my, my own limitations inside. And we become these parrots, and we parrot on the ideas of people before us, of the past. And so we just echo the past if we don't change it. And the change is not from without using outer lips, but the ones within. And you really have to feel that you have found the ear of life that you're listened to. That what you said was heard. You have to actually believe that. Or else you're going to go outside of yourself and you're going to start yelling, hoping that something in the sky hears you. And then what happens is when you start to become responsible and you believe you're heard then you start to, what happens is patterns will unfold in, the, in your life. And these patterns are really unfolding right now from the state you're in. But you can change the pattern of your life. You can change the course, however you want to say. But I call it a pattern because I think that it already is so. It just needs to unfold. It's like the moment you... Neville's right when he says it's like a pregnancy. At the moment you start to, you, what, what you do is you create a mental you and then you believe in it and that's what gives it reality. 
And then this mental you will push its way out. It will express itself like a baby. It will come out of its womb. But you are the womb, and you're the one who impregnates yourself. You do both. That's what consciousness does. Now, it symbolizes itself here in this world as a physical symbol. But to imagination, it's both. It's the conception and the conceiver. They become one. Well, in this case, it's my mental me, and I become one with it. And so I give reality to what is imaginary. But if I become that which was once imaginary, then imagination does create reality. And so I would have to assume at the end of the day that I am made of all imagination if I became what was just simply imaginary. And so I have to, again, create a mental me and believe in it. And, and the, the parroting of old stories has to cease. And the, the safety and the freedom to explore one's mind will start to grow. And you'll start to go into different areas that you otherwise felt off limits. Maybe in my case, I felt that forgiveness and respect and love was off limits to me. Regardless how I learned that, I believed it in me. And so, through Neville's work, what we discover is that all things are in us. And the question that needs to be asked is, is my suffering in me as well? Because if I can find the source of my suffering, maybe I can work with it. Maybe I can learn to change that. But if I don't see that it's coming from within me, and I think it's something external to me, independent of me, then I will feel powerless. So it's not until, so power really does come from within. And again, this goes back to responsibility and ownership of one's mind. I had a friend once say that it's truly the one responsibility we do have, which is what we put in our minds. And he's right. It is our responsibility for what we put in, but we have to feel ownership over it. We have to feel like we have ownership over whatever words we want to speak inside ourselves. And we have to feel that we're heard. And then we change the course of our lips and then we stop parodying the past. So when it comes to Neville's ladder experiment, which is basically imagining yourself climbing up and down a ladder inside yourself. And that's essentially what it is. But there's a a distinction that needs to be made when it comes to Neville's ladder experiment that I think that needs to be emphasized on but before i get to that i just want to say that i've tried the ladder experiment and it did work for me but that wasn't the first thing i tried it with i tried it actually with money and then i tried it with just different just strange objects that i normally wouldn't see and then i did do the ladder experiment and it did work but for me the ladder experiment worked in a way where i didn't realize until like an hour later i real i remember that i imagined it and it, it happened in such a natural way where it was similar to um, the stories I've read where someone just asks you to climb the ladder for them to do something. That's exactly what happened to me, but I didn't think about it till, till later. But the distinction that needs to be made is this. So he tells you to grab your, you know, take your imaginary right hand, place it on the ladder, and take your other hand, your other imaginary left hand, and put it on the ladder, and then take your right leg, your imaginary right leg and place it up on the ladder and then you start climbing up and down a ladder. Now, the difference that happens, this is a key moment in imagination is are you imagining this so that you can so that you can climb a ladder outside of you after or are you simply trying to just climb this ladder? Are you trying to get something or are you doing it? That's the difference. If you had to climb a ladder You wouldn't imagine climbing a ladder so that you can climb a ladder because that leaves you in desire still. So what you do is you imagine climbing the ladder. That's all you do. And again, so the question is, do you believe you are climbing the ladder, not to climb it here in this world, but that you are actually climbing it? So you have to identify yourself with the mental you, the imaginary you that's climbing it. And so once you identify yourself with that, you will naturally just do it. You won't be thinking about getting it. 
you won't imagine to get anymore. You will imagine to do. You'll imagine to be it in this case. But in this case, we are the experiment is to climb a ladder. It really has nothing to do with your self-concept, right? Because it just has to do with climbing a ladder. So it's about doing something. So you imagine that you are actually, as Neville said it, you imagine you are actually doing it. That's all you have to do. And it stops right there. You don't go outside and say, well, I, I'm doing this so that I can get a ladder. I'm doing this so that this can happen. It's really just about doing it on the inside. That's the difference. It's a getting versus doing. And you can feel the difference. One's, one's still left in desire. The other one is actually fulfillment. It's actual fulfillment. One is experiencing the fulfillment, and the other one's trying to get the fulfillment. And that's the key difference in that latter experiment. If you can apply that to other areas inside of you, that you're no longer trying to get forgiveness or respect or whatever it is, you imagine that it already is that way. The latter is just your desire. But you don't imagine your desire to get it. You imagine desire already being that way inside of you. So you make it so inside. And that's the key difference. I know I've explained this many times, but it's very important to know that because that is the difference, in my opinion, between success and failure inside of ourselves. That's the difference between us feeling like we did it and accomplished it versus feeling like we still haven't done it yet. That's the key difference. That's what we remain loyal to. We remain loyal to doing it, to being it. That's where, so true loyalty is to, uh, to the self. So true loyalty is to ourselves. That's what we remain loyal to, but we do it all within. So we don't wait uh, for society to change. We change our, our state of consciousness within ourselves. We don't wait for things to change. We change. So we do it all from the inside out. And uh, so take this concept, uh, actually try the experiment out. If, even if you've already been like a seasoned, I guess you want to say somebody who already understands Neville, has experienced it, applied it, try it again. Just try the latter experiment. And um, it's always fun to try and it's fun to test. But when you do it, especially if you're new, try to make that, try to see the distinction I'm seeing inside is that there's a big difference between trying to get the ladder versus just doing it in imagination, just climbing it. And you'll see the, the stress is gone. The anxiety is gone because you're not focused outside of you. You're focused on what's happening in you. Neville once said that imagination will do little for us if we imagine out of compulsion. It's not until we imagine the wish fulfilled for it to take action. And again, the imagining of the wish fulfilled, it's very simple, but it has a nuance to it. In the last video, I talked about how we're not trying to get a ladder, but we're trying to climb it. And Neville gave a story about how he wanted to go to Barbados. And Abdullah told him, well, then you've already gone. When you walk outside, you're going to see the palm trees. You're going to be there. You're not going to try to get there. You're not going to think about the lack of the ticket or the lack of the money or the lack of the clothes. You're not going to think of the lack that you have. You're going to be there. You're not going to wonder about the economy or how you're going to get there, by which mechanism you're going to use to get there, how many days it's going to be. You don't think about anything of that. If you want to go to Barbados, you go there in your mind. You go there. You be there. And so you don't try to go to Barbados. You don't try to get a ladder. You are in Barbados, and you climb it. And you see the difference between doing and getting. And Abdullah told him that he, you know, when Neville got a ticket, he was going to go third class. And Abdullah told him, no, you're going to go first class. And he ended, up, he ended up going first class. And the idea there is that you're not doing anything wrong by imagining greater for yourself. When you imagine greater for yourself, you're imagining greater for humanity, for God. You're a part of it. And so it, it would be in your best interest to imagine greater for you. You know, don't try to figure out whether if, you know, Neville, when he wanted to leave Barbados, he imagined that he was on the gangplank and he left. And the lady got scared and decided not to go. It's really not about figuring out if someone's going to be scared, if someone's going to quit or who's going, who it's going to be. It's simply exercising imagination and by imagining the wish fulfilled. He needed to leave, so he imagined that he left. And so again, it's not about 
who is going to be afraid? Who is going to give up their seat? How, how are they going to pick me? It's really not about that. You're not here to figure that out. You're here to test your faith. And it's a constant testing. And you should always treat it like a test. Test it when it comes to a situation in your life. And after it works, test it again somewhere else. And always think about in terms of testing. Because if you stop thinking in terms of testing, you might feel like you're going to give yourself an anxiety attack. If you treat it like a test, you'll treat it more. you imagine experiencing it and you'll treat it more lightly. And you'll no longer try to get things. You won't use this imagination to, you won't use it anymore to try to get, you'll use it to experience, you'll see it as a, as a way to experience the wish fulfilled, that's a mechanism you could use to experience your desire already being done. So imagination is the, it's the immortal eyes that can see the desire being fulfilled, it can experience, it's the immortal man that can experience beyond the time that your senses are giving you. And so the Barbados story is uh, is one of, it's very symbolic because Barbados is a symbol for your desire. It's simply the promised land. It's, it's a place where you want to be. It's your desire, but you have to imagine that you're in Barbados. And so that, that applies to anything in your life. You don't imagine trying to get it. You imagine it already being so. And Neville didn't quite understand it at first. He didn't quite understand the power he was using. And that's completely okay because I think we all do that. And many of us, myself included, have misused this power. For I've seen this power be used in my life that was not in the direction I wanted it to go. And so I misdirected my power. But it is a power. And he got to Barbados and everything was planned out and everything was fulfilled but it's not about adding a judgment to it it's not about judging anyone for misusing the power it's not about judging him for not having the money to for a suit or his brother gave him money for a suit it's not to judge neville it's more about seeing how it worked for him and if you let go of the judgments you'll be more willing to test it because you'll find it far easier to imagine the wish fulfilled than to judge yourself. It's always better to experience the the wish fulfilled than it is to imagine out of compulsion. And to imagine out of compulsion is trying to get it. It's trying to force something into play. It's trying to force a change on the world instead of changing oneself. And oneself, you have to find it within you. And so Neville changed his orientation inside of him. He went he went from being a Neville that desires Barbados to a Neville that is in Barbados. He changed himself. And that is the story of, for everybody. And so you no longer are in the version of yourself that desires X. You're in the version that is experiencing X. Just try it. Don't judge it. But try it. To test it. And if you experiment with it, as Neville says, an experiment with uh, a faith will become an experience. And then you, you will realize that your life is made up, your future is made up of present imaginings. And when you see that your future is made of present imaginings, you'll see how important it is to imagine in the now for what you want. And you'll see how it's a waste of time to figure out whether you're worthy or not. Another way of phrasing it is that tomorrow is created by today's imaginings. And so it makes sense for you to, if you're only experiencing self, it would make sense for you to imagine greater for self so that you can have a greater experience of self. And so you have to raise your conceptions or change your conceptions, however you want to, which way you want to decide for that. But you're going to have to eventually change the conceptions of yourself if you want a better experience of self to the conceptions that you desire. But you don't change the conceptions hoping that they manifest or hoping that they express. That's just what happens here. That's just how things work. The spirit becomes flesh here. But you have to change the spirit or change what is within. And don't 
wonder if the ability of this power can do it. Don't wonder if it's powerful enough to change X. Go to self always. And you'll see self, as I said, is the key. And so a change in self is a change in destiny. A change in self is a change of one's future. And when you see that your future eventually becomes your past, and if you want a past that you can recall, a past that is of pleasurable memory, if you want that, then you, it, it's obvious now to see that why it's so important for you to change your imaginings right now in the present moment. And to change your imaginings in the present moment is to imagine yourself the way you want to be as if there is no future or past, no past holding you back and no future scaring you into submission. And so you imagine without those things so that you can be present with being in Barbados or being with your desire. You accept with totality that you are the thing you want to be. You don't worry about the physical. You change the mental. You change your imaginary self. And you'll see that you're one with that. And then you'll be in Barbados. And you'll walk like you're in Barbados. You'll walk in that new conception and you'll start seeing it mold into your life. So I want to reiterate that you're not here to try to get to Barbados. And you're not here trying to climb a ladder. You're going to climb the ladder and you're going to be in Barbados. And that subtle difference is going to make the, a big change in your life. Because you're no longer going to be in the future. And you're no longer going to be in the past. You're going to be present with your desire. And that fulfills it. And then you apply it to somewhere else. And test it and test it and test it. Always treat it like a test. See if it works. And when it does, again, do it to something else. But to, to wonder if you're worthy or not to be in Barbados, to know if you're welcomed in Barbados, is a waste of your time. There's no better time to imagine than right now about yourself. And again, if you want, since you only experience self, you have to change yourself to have a greater experience of self, to conceptions that you desire. And so... That clarity, in my opinion, when I saw that, that has been a huge revelation to me. Because that was revealed in me when I, when I was seeing how much I struggled with imagining myself in the wish fulfilled. When I saw why I was struggling, it made sense to me. The difference between me trying to get something and me experiencing it. And I hope this clarity aids you on your journey. I was meditating yesterday. And there was a word that kept popping up over and over again. And it wasn't until I saw the meaning of it that I was given a clarity moment. And it's a word that we all keep using, and myself included. But I want to define it, and I want to bring clarity, or give you the clarity that was given to me. I had a friend say, I don't, after listening to your video on the Neville's Ladder experiment, I started realizing that I don't know if I'm thinking from the position of it already being so, or I'm trying to make it happen. Which is similar to what Neville said when he said, don't think about it, but think from it. And what I kept hearing in meditation was, don't question it, but change it. Don't desire it, but fulfill it. And this is the clarity that was given to me is that the word it means self. And when you, see, when you see that, it will make sense. That you don't think about it, you don't think about yourself being it, you think from yourself being it. And that it is you. That's what you, your it is what you desire, but it's yourself. That you go into meditation, you go inward, you don't desire it, but fulfill it. Well, what's it? It's me myself and so I fulfill myself that's the goal he has a Neville has a video where he says you can change the dream change it by daring to assume that you are not what reason tells you you're not and he says it might be difficult to imagine you'll ever be it but forget all that imagine it anyways 
And we keep using this word it. And in that sentence, he made it and dream the same. But that can get rather confusing because how do you know you changed the dream? How do you know you changed it enough? How do you know that you were successful in changing it? You can only really know from yourself. And so when he, what really should have been said, in my opinion, is you can change self by daring to assume self is different. Because self and dream are the same thing. And self and it are the same thing. If you can dare to assume that your self is different, you will know if you're successful in that. It's not going to be an outside thing. You can remain exactly as you are sitting in the, in the chair you're in and change yourself. Whether you sustain that is up to you, but you can do it. And you will see that the world, when you do change it, change yourself, you will see that you were never your behaviors to begin with. And you weren't the state that you were, pre you were previously in. You could have been in that state for 30 years. That was never you. And what you will see is that the world has defined you by your definitions. The world defined you by your states and has told you these are your permanent prisons. But it's not. And so what we do is we take the definition of man, which is a being that we call a, a being that simply lives upon its senses and is really bound by its senses. What we do is we expand the definition of what we call man. And we see that it's a being that can imagine. It's a being that can believe. It's a being that can change. And then you will, instead of identifying yourself as a, as a being that is just a physical body or bound by your senses, you will see yourself as a being that can move in and out of states through the ability to change from inward to outward. And so you will see that the change that you're seeking, the change in yourself that you're seeking, is within you as well. But Neville is right. You might think it's impossible to ever be it, but the point is not to figure out the possibility of it. Instead, imagine that you are it, that you've changed yourself into it, that you have this power in you, that the power of change is in you, and you apply it inwardly. And then you will see that stagnation is in you. The ability to move is in you. The ability to stay is in you. And all these things that you're really wanting were in you. When you go outside to seek it, you're blind. But when you go inward, you will actually see. Become entranced by your desire in you. Become entranced by seeing it fulfilled. Become entranced with the change of yourself. And that's what true enchantment is. And so you see the key that you're seeking is also within you, and the key is self. And so again, the goal is to not figure out the possibility of the change of self, but to just actually do it. Neville would say that it's not his responsibility to make it happen in the world. His responsibility is to imagine it's already happened and sustain that with faith. And so if you can see that it's always going to come back to self, then you can feel sustained. You can feel stable, knowing that it's the change in self that causes a change in my reality. And so you see reality and self become the same. And so we start to broaden our idea of self. We don't limit it to just behaviors and states, but we see that the being that is in the state is different than the state itself. That the state really is dormant. It's the lights are off. It's a room with the lights off, but when you enter, the lights turn on. The room doesn't disappear. The state doesn't go away, but it simply becomes dormant. And you enter a different room, a different state. And you live in there inside yourself. You don't have to feel that you're doing anything wrong by doing that. Actually, the Bible tells us that that's actually how, you know, righteousness is how you overcome sin. But righteousness is actually believing in yourself. It is fulfilling your desire. That's what right, the righteous act is to imagine that it is already so. And that's exactly what the character Christ did in the story. 
he imagined that the harvest was already ripe. That's the right, that's the right course of action is to first start with the inner. Change that. As it says to change the inside of a cup, not the outside. And then the outer will be clean as well. And so when Neville says you remain faithful to it, you remain loyal to it, again, what is the it? It's yourself. So that's what you remain loyal to. You remain loyal to the change of yourself. You remain faithful to yourself. So if you forget everything I say, or everything I've written down, if you forget it all, remember that self is the key. If you can remember that, if you can go back to that and remember it, then you won't need to think you're missing something. You won't feel like you, you're, you're missing that piece of knowledge that once you get it, it's all going to make sense. Always remember that self is the key. If you can sustain that in memory, then you, will, you won't seek outside of you because self is within for a change in your life. You will see that the self is the most important thing to you. And so you learn to change the most important thing in your life, which is yourself. And I want to emphasize when Neville says to dare to assume it, even though reason tells you you're not it now, and it'll be difficult for you to ever be it, do it anyways. Just dare to do it. And as I said in the latter experiment, imagine that you actually are it. You actually have changed. That you actually are experiencing it now. Not as something to get external, but something to actually be inside and then that what you are inside is what's going to you can say express or give birth to or it's going to find its way to externalize itself that is just what we do naturally we are always naturally externalizing ourselves in this shadow but you want to change your orientation inside yourself and then you will express that new change but self is going to be the key you're not really needing a new technique. You're needing a change in yourself. And Neville often quoted this, but I'm going to say it in a different way from his own words. He said, That an assumption, though denied by your senses, though the world would say it's false, if you persist in it, it will harden into fact. And take that clarity that that it is yourself. So if you persist in yourself, although it's false, if you keep persisting in yourself, you will harden into fact. So when you go inside yourself to imagine yourself in a new state, don't feel like you don't belong there. Don't feel like you weren't invited. Feel welcomed. Feel accepted. Accept yourself in this new state. And you'll see that acceptance will go a long way within you. And then you will gradually change yourself. It might take some time to remove certain ideas that have been embedded in you about yourself but they can be removed and they can be changed. And once you do that, you will see yourself has always been the key. So when Neville says to not forget the conceiver, the idea is that I have a perception and my perception is coming from a conception and my conception is coming from a conceiver. And the conceiver is what Neville calls God, the one who conceives things to be. And I conceive myself to be a certain way. And so I start to perceive reality that way. And so if I need to change something, I go to the conceiver and I change my conception. Now, there's this idea that Neville spoke about when he says that only slaves have masters. And so if I see masters in the world, it's not that they're masters over me. It's that it's showing me my own slavery. And the, another idea of saying is that if I see giants in the world, it's that they're showing me my own grasshopperness as I see myself as a grasshopper. And that's why I see giants in the world. And a giant doesn't have to be just a person. It could be as simple as, a, as, a, as criticism. I can make things into giants. I can make criticism into a giant. I can make things into giants and therefore I feel small. And so it reflects back to me my conception of myself. And so Neville has the idea of leaving the world alone and then changing the conception of yourself. And that first part is so crucial, to leave the world alone, to leave it exactly as it is, leave the people exactly as they are, leave the thoughts and the words that you've heard, leave what you've imagined, 
leave what you've said, leave what has been done exactly as it is. And from there, you're given a freedom to change your conception of yourself. If you won't do that, then you're going to try to control the world out of fear instead of letting it go and letting it be the way it is. And then the idea is to test this. If I change the conception of myself, will there be a change in my reality? And you keep trying it every single day and you treat it like a test all the time. And when you treat it like a test, you become curious and open about a change in reality. You start to see reality more as a fluid instead of you start putting permanency upon it and you see it more fluid and then you'll see yourself more fluid. And so when I change a conception of myself, how do I do that? Well, all I do is I simply start being the con- I stop trying to get a conception. I simply start being the conception. It's, it's an experience. And so I stop trying to get something. And inside myself, there's a mental me. And I make that mental me. I change that. I change the mental me. And I start to feel that I'm one with it because I am. It's a part of me. It's intimate. It's in me. And so I, with the mental me, I can touch a new reality inside of myself. I can interact with it. And I simply start to experience it as a fulfillment. I experience the fulfillment of it. I don't try to make anything happen. I simply change the orientation of the mental me. And it's, it's very simple, but it's the key to changing oneself because there's no, you might be surprised by how little effort it takes. But when you have the willingness, as Neville said, to let go completely of the previous state, you can move into a new state. He says moving from state to state is simple if you are willing to completely let go. And you can, and it's something you, you, once you, once you get enough of the state you're in, you will let go of it. Once you have the desire to move, you will move. But I move the mental me. I move where I'm at mentally. I test to see if I move the mental me, will there be a change in my world? And if I start to see a change in my world, then I see that the mental me is truly connected to my life. And so if I start to use my imagination to create fears, my life becomes fearful. And so my life and my imagination are so closely connected. And if imagining creates reality, then it's in my best interest to stop imagining conditions and start to imagine the things I desire as fulfillments. So no longer walk around mentally inside, seeing with my mental eyes lack. I start to see fulfillment for the sake of seeing fulfillment. I just hear fulfillment for the sake of hearing it because it feels good to my ears, to my mental ears. It feels good to my mental eyes to see that. And I just experience it until a smile gets put upon my face. And I feel a peace that turns into a patience in my life. And so back to the beginning of this video, if I perceive reality a certain way, if I walk into a room and I see people a certain way that frightens me, I leave them alone and I go back to the conception of myself and I ask myself, how do I see myself? Is, the, is, is their giantness reflecting my smallness? Are they, is it, is it, is my state fulfilling itself here? Because states fulfill themselves through my perception. And so I leave them alone and I make myself bigger. I change how I see myself. I don't bother with them. I don't make them into something else. I don't walk into a room and see masters and make them slaves. I make, I stop, stop seeing myself as a slave. And so the question becomes is how do I see myself? It's a a question you ask over and over and over again, and then eventually you're going to ask, who am I? And then you're going to go back to the conceiver. And that's what Neville's trying to get you to do, is to go back to the conceiver, to see that the conceiver is conceiving conceptions of themselves, which is causing perceptions, and then that causes behaviors. And so I behave based on how I perceive reality, and I perceive reality based on how I conceive myself. And so uh, you might have heard many things about yourself in your life, But it's not what you heard, it's really what you're hearing now. It's not what you've imagined, it's what you're imagining now. And a perfect example of this, if I see myself as guilty, I will create punishments for myself. So I treat myself based on how I see myself. And if I wish to change how I see myself, then I leave everything exactly as it is. And I, you know, as Neville says, I yield into a new conception. I completely let go 
and yield myself into something new. And Neville has once said that habit is not a law. And I love that he said that because habit can sometimes feel like a law where you feel like you've been habitually thinking of yourself a certain way for so long, you feel that you're it's a part of you. But it's not. And habit is not a law. It's something that feels like one because we have such a difficulty getting out of it. But habits can be let go of as well. You can think of it as you're always holding onto a rope with these states and you have to learn to just drop the rope and finally let it go and have the freedom to move. So you grant yourself your own freedom and your own restrictions. It all comes from inside of you. If you can see that really all of it is stemming from you, you will, I, in my opinion, you will naturally learn to be more giving towards yourself. And then you start to become more unconditional towards yourself. And you'll stop creating the conditions in which you have first must meet and the qualifications you have to meet in order to finally give yourself what you want inside. You'll let go of these ideas and you'll start to become really an unconditional giver towards yourself. And there's a freedom in that. And it's something that doesn't go away unless you take it away. So it's something that can always be applied to yourself at all times, anywhere. You can drop the senses, maybe for a minute or two, and hear something you want to hear. You can drop the senses and see something you want to see. You don't have to condition it. You don't have to feel that it's got to be in a certain time frame. You don't have to worry about anything. You just experience the fulfillment of it. And so you start to walk in your life always trying to see fulfillment in everything. And you shape it towards your own desire. And you don't let it become this daunting task or this thing you have to do. It's something you start to want to do. It's, it's, a, it's a way in which you start to use your mind differently. You stop using your mind to fear yourself, but to fulfill yourself. And I really love that Neville said this. It takes no time to change a state, only if you're willing to completely let go. I really love that he says it doesn't take much time to change a state if you're willing to let go. And when you think about it, it, it's true. If I have the willingness to let go, an openness to, to really see myself differently, I will do it because I'm tired of the certain states that I've been in for so long. And to reiterate one more time that if I see giants in my life, it's because I see myself as a grasshopper. So I leave the giants alone and I get rid of my grasshopperness. I raise myself. I lift myself up. I stop demeaning the name of I am. That's my name. I stop cursing it. I stop punishing it. And I start to redeem it. I start to lift it up. Regardless of what the world says and regardless of what the world thinks, I lift it up and I keep doing it. And I don't really view it as a stressful thing. I really see it as a redeeming of the self, a forgiving of the self. And so it's a, it's intimate and special. And if you want to talk to me, you can go to the description and, and just email me. Thanks for listening. And so this is about freeing yourself from any kind of judgments that you've placed upon yourself. Because judgments have no real place in imagination. When you decide to imagine yourself differently inside, you change the mental you, you don't worry or think about the senses or you don't think about the color of your skin or you don't give yourself some judgment for something of the past none of that really is taken into account the mental man can change inside it doesn't require a certain qualification and so the world will always have you want to judge people off of their skin color or judge them off of their anything um, whatever they may be, they're even the amount of money they make or their intelligence, and we, we judge people. But in reality, we we're actually judging ourselves. Neville had this story where this woman won the lottery, and you know he talked about how we don't show, he called it empathy. And he gave this example of the way he viewed empathy, which would be to see that a woman who won the lottery, he said that, you know, you think to yourself, well, you know they're uh, they're this religion they're part of that religion or they're they're this and that how could they win the lottery and essentially you're also saying why not me and so we create a judgment after something good that happens and Neville would say instead of celebrating we kind of go into that well why would they get it if I I remembered them doing this in the past 
and we think that it's unfair. But the imagination isn't judging off of what we think is fair. It doesn't judge off of, uh, off of the senses. This is more of a shadow. It doesn't judge after the shadow. And so when you go to imagine yourself and you're creating all these conditions and, and judgments, they're self-afflicted and they're self-done because you're just creating judgments. You're creating conditions. You're creating fears inside. Once you see it that way, instead of the word thinking, you're thinking fears. Say you're creating them because you are. It's also true that we create inside ourselves. And we can create torments or we can create things that we love. And we become what we fear and we become what we love. So we have to start thinking in terms of thoughts of love. And Neville also said about how a chicken... Um, you can have these chicken eggs and you want them to hatch, but there's 10 of them, but only eight hatch. Well, he would just say that, you know, these represent the things that you love, the, the, the things that you want to give birth to in your life. And you have 10 of them, but only eight appear. He says, you won't even notice that the two didn't appear. So the idea there is to constantly, or try to imagine, not as a work, but something you want to do, imagine more lovely things. And do it all the time and just start creating more and more lovely things inside yourself. And you won't even recognize if something doesn't even appear because you'll have so much. And I want to give a simple exercise of what you could do to get yourself in a state of mind or a new state of mind. And it's very simple, but all it takes is your curiosity. I want you to become curious about a different version of yourself. And it doesn't matter how slight the change is, it could just be a more confident version of yourself. It could be something that you want to change. And I want you to start asking it uh, as if it's a separate person, a million questions. Just ask, you know, how Neville says, what would it feel like? But also ask, like, what would I, how would I speak were I this type of person? And how would I enter a room? And how would I walk? And how would I think? What are the things I would speak to myself? How would I feel towards myself? How would I interact with the world? And how do they see reality? And you just become curious and you answer these questions and you start realizing that obviously you're the one answering them and it's you. But the more you saturate your mind with it, the more you become one with it, the more you're thinking about things that you love. And that change in, in, in yourself will cause a change in how you start to behave and it could happen instantly. But it's frequently going back to that state that I find is what creates a naturalness to be it. And you just become curious about what it would be like to be different. And that's really what Neville is asking is when he says, how would I feel? It's a curiosity. It's not a, I have to make myself feel something or I have to force myself to do something. It's, it's, a, it's actually a joy to do. It's something that is relaxing. It's something more freeing. And you just become curious about a different side of you. You don't judge yourself. You don't judge yourself for you know the state you're in right now. The state that you're in right now shouldn't really matter. It should. What should matter is the state you want to be. And you focus on that, and you ask it a million questions. That's what I do. I will ask it a million things. How would they speak on a mic? And how would they, how would they feel towards themselves? How would they treat themselves? And I answer them as if it's my you know it's my own answer. But I become curious about states for me to change into them. And I think that's what the that question is, how would I feel it really stems from. And when you start to accept that they're done and you accept these lovely things or you start to experience them inside, you're given a deep relief. And Neville would always say he felt a relief after he would imagine. And it wasn't a forced relief. It was an acceptance of it being done. He would rest in that. And he saw all of this as one big relief. And that is what you would feel when you wake up from a nightmare. You feel a deep relief that it was just a dream. And speaking of dreams, you'll start to see reality more like a live painting. And I've said that, you know, we, you and I will paint still images. But the dreamer will dream a dream that feels alive. He paints an image that's alive and it's moving. And you're intimate with this dream or this painting. And you start to see more meaning behind life instead of seeing it from face value and judging off of intelligence and skin colors and, and, you you know you you see someone win the lottery and you think well uh, but I'm more intelligent I should it should come to me or uh, why is it that they got it and it's trying to judge reality instead of paying attention to what you're doing inside yourself 
and you'll see that you're you see conditions because in you you're creating them that's why you keep receiving them it's an it's truly an acceptance and you want to imagine as if there's all the time in the world and that's what neville would do to cause him to get a deep rest he would feel, feel relief knowing that he has all the time in the world for it to come about and so he never thought about time he didn't condition his imaginings off of time and he didn't condition his imaginings off of judgments of his past or things about himself it didn't really matter what mattered was becoming curious about a new state um asking it questions trying to get to know it and try to be intimate with it. and you'll see how intimate eventually you'll see that it is in you that's how intimate you are with the state that it really is there for your taking and he also spoke about how when you start to take things in your mind never feel that you're depleting it because it's an infinite power it's infinitely giving, and it doesn't give based off of appearances. So if I, if I feel that I'm being judged off of the appearances, I have the wrong God. I'm believing in a false one. It doesn't judge me after my appearances. And so, really the outside doesn't really affect my ability to repent or change radically inside. And that is what we're, we're doing. We are changing the mental us to see if there's a change in reality. It's really a test to see how intimate we are with this thing we call reality. And we no longer will feel so separate from it, but we'll bring everything back to more of a unity. And I truly believe, because I've experienced this, that if we don't, William Blake said, those who do not live in love will be subdued by fear. I truly believe that. And I've seen it in my life, but when I, but I take the idea of living in love, I think of living is from within. So I have to start living in love within. Or my mind or myself inside of me will be subdued by fear. I'll start thinking of fearful things. And then you find yourself in a cycle that you can't get out of and you don't see that it's a self-imprisonment. And and so you and I will start to free ourselves from the inside out, regardless of appearances. We no longer judge with them. We take a different approach to the same issues or the, or the same reality. We go from the inside out. And that's really Neville's message is to start there. You know, he, he spoke that you may not have a dime, but in imagination you have much. And you take that attitude everywhere. And become, again, curious about the one who has much in you. How would they be? And it's yourself, but like, you know, separate it to give it more clarity. And then you'll, when you start answering the questions honestly, you start to become it. And there, there you are becoming what you love. And so we always become things. We just have to direct the attention or the nature or change the nature of ourselves or the nature of our mental environment. And we start to become our environment. We start mentally. And so you, you might have not said what you wanted to say in the day you say it with, you know, you make the mental you say it inside at the end of the day you revise it or something didn't go as planned you you don't judge after the appearance you judge after the mental eyes that see it fulfilled it's showing you that it's done and you don't concern yourself with anything else and then you find a deep rest that you're believing in the one power and if you wish to speak to me about neville's teachings i am doing one-on-one -on -one talks for a fee that i find reasonable and if you're interested and you want to find more information, just go to the description and email me. Thanks for listening, and try to experiment with getting into a state. It's late at night where I'm at right now, and I'm just, I had a deep urge to share this message about imagination being the Christ. It's something that Neville spoke about pretty much every lecture, and I don't think you can divorce that from his work. And I understand that the law is very important to people and they want to learn how to start being things. And that's really what the law is, is learning to start to be the thing that you otherwise want to be. So you leave you leave wanting it and you start to go to being it or having it. And it's a, it's a present tense practice. It's an acceptance that you have it. As I've said, you know, when it comes to desire, some people will say to restrict them. Other people will say to indulge in them. But Christ says to believe you have it. And 
And the, the point of Neville's mystical teachings is to show you that Christ is the imagination. And that this imagination is here to save from sin and death, which is really the enemy to everybody. Your enemy is not the nation across the, the ocean. That's not your enemy. Your real enemy to humanity is sin and death, and that's what Christ comes to save us from. And what I've learned from Neville's mystical work is that this is an unfolding process, or it's a more of a, it's through revelations, it's being revealed. So the imagination that is housed in us, which is us, it's the essence of us, it will reveal itself to you either in stages or it seems to reveal itself in that case where I had the dream where I saw it as light. And I, Neville has you know, read the scriptures so many times where it says, I am the light of the world. And so I saw it as light, and so I found the light of the world. Um, it wasn't outside of me. It's not the sun in the sky. It's, this isn't a light that disappears. It's, a, it's not a fire that burns out. This is the light of the world. This is the light. It's eternal. And I didn't find it outside of me. But the imagination in me, which is in you, it revealed itself. It reveals itself through these states or these stages it seems like it will if you need something for example i remember i needed i wanted forgiveness really bad i felt it in my just in my heart i wanted it and then i had a dream where i forgave everybody in the dream like everybody in my life was forgiven and i repeated the words people don't know what they're doing and i forgave everyone and then I woke up from that and I felt that the imag my imagination, it wasn't like a normal dream. This was very, it was just as real as this. And I felt in that moment that the imagination revealed itself to me as the creator of my forgiveness. That I was trying to find forgiveness through things and, and wood, <laughs> like wood crosses. I would pray to wood crosses. I was always trying to find it and... I couldn't find it. I, I went to every false god and I tried to learn, but I realized that wood is meant to be used and not to be prayed to. And, and once I started to cancel away every false god and every ism, it was quite, quite the, the conflict and war inside of me. It was years. Once I started reading Neville's work on a more spiritual level, these things started to unfold in me. And it and it's just something that I believed. I just kind of believed him. and Or at least I would think about what he would say. I wouldn't just drop it after he would speak and just walk off as if, like, you know, I'm just going to listen to the law part and ignore everything else, which I did at times. But I guess I got bored of seeking it in every lecture. It was like, when is he going to talk about the law? It just kind of was repetitive. But the stories of of Christ were entertaining to me. And I, and I always kind of pictured a man from 2,000 years ago, and I always kind of couldn't understand what Neville was saying. I didn't understand. I didn't get how the imagination was Christ. I didn't, I didn't see it that way. But what I've noticed is that the imagination will reveal itself to man in man. And it will reveal itself in sections, almost like parts of itself. It will show you that it's the true power of life. It's the true cause. It showed me that it's the true light of the world. That it's the creator of my forgiveness. And I, I once had a dream where, you know, in my life I never felt I was ever acknowledged. And for anything good, it felt like I never got praise about anything. And I remember I wanted praise. I really wanted it. And I had a dream, but I never really gave it to myself. I had a dream, though, where I was in an auditorium, and there was many, many people there. And there were people I knew, and they were just cheering away and clapping. And I remember I got very frightened, and I felt scared, and I ran away from the auditorium. Like I, I didn't, it's almost like I didn't, I didn't like the way that felt. And then I had this voice that was my own voice, but it was a voice that felt outside of me in the dream. And it said that I'm the creator of 
or I said, the dreamer is the creator of praise. And it was, and then I woke up in that moment and I realized that I thought there was another creator for my praise. And, and I guess when I saw that there wasn't anything other than the dreamer or the believer, the one that believes this, this one that can believe and praise is the creator of it. It's not something outside of me. And so I share with you what the imagination revealed to me inside of me because I believe that we're one. And so I feel that I share to you that you are the creator of your own praise, that you're the dreamer. You're the one who believes as well. And so I, so Neville, what Neville did was he shared the revelations that he received from the imagination, that it showed him it's, it's the Christ. It's the Savior. It's the true Savior of the world. Everyone's looking for a Savior, so they try to look to a man in power. And they think the man in power is going to save them. And and they, they, they think it's an ism. They think the ism is going to save them. Or they think something's going to save them, but they, they don't realize what they're trying to be saved from. That It's sin and death. That's the enemy. That's really the enemy, if you will, of humanity. It's not. It's not an ism. And so this this imagination, it's revealing itself to us, in us. And I've only been revealed a few things. I believe in the other things, but I've only been revealed in myself a few things, which is it's the creator of praise, it's, which, which to me represented human interaction. It's the creator of my human interaction. And it was the creator of my forgiveness, which I thought was in the traditional Catholic God, and I found that to be a false God. And so really Neville's work, what it does, it's a sword. It's a sword to all the things you believe in that are outside of you. And so his the true message, this truth is like a sword, and it goes against everything you believed, whether it be an ism, a man outside of you to save you, these things you, you think that they're independent and you think that they are your your god and this this gospel of neville's or really just as i find it to be the way he interpreted i find it to be true and i've studied this for years and i came to this conclusion that very similar conclusion that neville did but neville took it such a step beyond than i did i studied for years and i i came to a conclusion but it felt like it was at 80 percent and neville's just his interpretation really blew me away i mean i was I was really blown away by how he would interpret these things and how life-changing they were. And it was because I studied so long before that. It just kind of built up. But I say that because his interpretation is truly life-changing when you accept it and it starts to be revealed in you. It really is like a pattern that unfolds in us. And I keep saying in us because the whole point is that there is no Savior outside and so the Savior starts to form itself in us. And it will show you whatever desire you have. You may have it, you might desire something, and then you'll dream. And in the dream, it's the fulfillment of that desire. You might be f- actually experiencing the fulfillment of that desire. It's showing you that it's the Creator, it's revealing to you that it is. It's showing you. But we can mistake things as being. Um, having other causes, but then you start creating other gods. And then you will, as Neville said, you multiply it. And next thing you know, you have many, many gods in you that you worship and believe. And then you'll start worshiping rocks and you'll worship, you'll worship every little thing you can grow a grain of sand, you worship it and you, you ignore really yourself. You ignore the, the true God, which is within us. But it's something that you, What I found is that I believe in it, and then I start to have these experiences unfold in me. But they're not normal revelations. It's not like a normal dream. I don't don't mean like a, a dream where you kind of fall asleep and you kind of do normal things and you speak to people in your in your life that are typically there. I don't mean that. I mean, like, it feels like you're, Neville would say this is the spiritual plane where you're inside yourself, but it feels just as real as this world. He viewed that as, Esau being the outside, Jacob being the inside, and Israel being the spiritual. So it's these three planes. And 
that's why when Paul says I was taken, I might have been in the flesh or I was taken in the spirit, I don't know. And so it feels like the flesh, but it's happening in you. And I once had a dream where I touched somebody and, and they felt like flesh in my own dream. And the, I was revealed that I was the creator of, of flesh. The imagination was almost showing me that it was. It was it's like telling me that. And, and I think it's happened in a lot of people. I don't, it happened in Neville. And I think it comes from you believing it and then you start, you start to experience these things. But you can definitely blow it off and say it's pointless. I haven't found it to be pointless. I have found it to be incredible. There's so much value to it. And it makes sense of life in the sense like I realize that my life isn't, I, I'm, uh, my destiny is not to be a celebrity. I, I'm, I'm not here to become some type of, um, I guess the way I would put it, it's like I, I'm not here to fulfill some type of role that society has formed. I'm starting to associate myself with the imagination in me and I feel that there was a there's a purpose to coming here. There's a purpose to being here as a as experiencing death. And it there is a purpose and it unfolds in us. But and we feel we will feel unified by this unfolding. It's not done through study or or trying to become morally perfect or it's it's just by believing the story and it starts to unfold and i wouldn't pass on it i would i kind of urge you to try to understand what neville is saying and and you'll start to really dis i guess you'll start to be revealed your true identity and you're much larger than you think and you're I would I would argue that if you really believe that you are just a man here, I would say that you are living in darkness. I think you're much larger than just here. You're much larger than just Esau or the the man of the senses, although that is you too. Um, inside inside of ourselves, we'll be revealed that we're much larger, that we're one with this thing that it's really, it became us. And it's quite a wonderful story. It almost feels too good to be true. Um, but one, I, I really do believe that this is something that it will unfold in people who believe it. And the end goal to these revelations is Christ. It's the, Christ is the fulfillment of these revelations. And the, the last fulfillment is... W- what Neville calls Christ and it's love and power combined, that it's power guided by love. And that's the formation of Christ in us. And I don't speak from a Christian perspective. I'm going to repeat that. I don't speak from a Christian perspective. I do not believe in a man who died for my sins 2,000 years ago. I do not believe that at all. I don't believe my Savior is outside of me, and I don't believe it happened. In, he's 2,000 years old. I don't believe that. I'm speaking of of something that has been revealed. It's going to be revealed in us, not something outside. And so you become your own self-witness to yourself. So you become a witness to the light, but it's you. So you become a witness to yourself. That is Neville's... Essentially, I'm trying to give you the footnotes. Although I urge you to do more study, and I urge you to try to understand it, and I urge you to believe in it, um, the footnotes are is that you will be transformed, not transformed, but I guess you, yeah, you guess you're being in a, you're thrown in a furnace to remove sin and death. And Christ removes it from you by becoming you, which is the f- embodiment of love and power. And because if you have power without love, it's violent. It's reckless it's damaging it's it's abusive but when you start to guide it with love when you insert love into it that's true power and that's the truly the fulfillment and i hope you believe me that this is very um important to me because it's really late right now and i'm speaking about 
this story, but I can't help it. It just came upon me and I find it important to share with you things that I think will happen to you as well if you believe in Neville's work. I think that you'll be, it'll be revealed to you that you're not here to be morally perfect. If that's your fear, if your fear was that you're not perfect, it, that wasn't the point. And you're not here to become something great in this world. Although you could, you really could, if you wanted that, you could. But that's not really your ultimate purpose. It's to shut off sin and death. And so I'm not speaking this to any kind of religious ears. I'm just speaking it to the ears who are willing to listen. You know, those who have ears, let them hear. And so in the end, it's an act of redemption. You can almost think of it simply as life became death to redeem death, that, that love became fear to redeem it, so that in the end there is only love. And it doesn't appear to me that it's something we do or we try to perform loving acts to be love. I don't think it's something that we do. I think it's something that's revealed to us about ourselves. And it, it says, as Neville said, it seems like a grace. It doesn't seem like something that we have to work towards. It seems to be given, and it seems, and also it seems to speed up the process if you believe in it. And I trust Neville because I've just had a lot of experiences like his. And I remember one time he said, "If you start to practice revision, you will stir up within you the forgiveness of Christ." And I remember I did it for a while, and I had this intense dream um, of feeling that I was pure forgiveness. And it shocked me for maybe four four days. I couldn't, I didn't feel the same. But then I went back to my old habits and, and thought from the same perspective as I did before. But I remember for those that week, I felt really different. I had a very vivid and intense experience that I can't describe the feeling. But it only happened after revision. And then I read that later in Neville's, uh, in a lecture. And I just felt... I felt like I understood where he was coming from. And then the more um, the more I believe in this message, the more it's being revealed, and I'm starting to see life a little bit differently. And I'm also starting to see it the same way. I almost feel that it, there's... I'm almost having more of a hands-off, letting the world be, and realizing that this isn't about changing the world. It's about... It's a change within each individual. But not has nothing to do with stopping drinking or I'm not talking about those changes it's a change of not just identity it's a revelation of identity it's a revealing of identity in us it's a pattern that unfolds I don't mean you give up a drug or you give you do some change in your life I'm talking about a, an entirely different change that's happening in us and I hope that this message reaches you that Neville's work really is a sword to every god you'll believe in and it's a conflict that will have to be resolved. And you'll come back to this idea that there is one creator. And it starts to make sense. Things start to feel a lot more natural as they should. And so I hope that you start to have these things unfold in you. And you start to see what Neville was saying. And I seem to, personally, the way I feel about it is I feel like a witness to Neville's work. I don't feel like I invented his work, I think his work is brilliant. And I feel like just a witness to the unfolding of the things he spoke about. And I don't think that I've had all the experiences he's had. I know I haven't. But I've had enough to where there is a pattern that seems to unfold. Now, I didn't document my dates or anything like that. I'm just more speaking from my memory. I mean, these these things, these images I have in my memory are just stronger than some of the things that, I mean, they're more vivid than than what happened today in my life, this, these visions. And it only happened after studying Neville. I didn't have this with any other teacher. And so I just personally feel like a witness to the things he's talking about. And, but I do love, I love talking about this and I will continue to do more lectures on, on his work. Cause I, I think that it can open your eyes to a different type of peace. I think the law can make you feel powerful, but it can also feel a little bit frightening to have power. And I think his mystical work kind of balances it out and makes you feel a bit more relaxed and 
it feels a bit more like you're on a on the ride of life or in this case death we're on this ride and we can change certain things on the ride but we're on a ride and or it's and i'm making light of it but scripture calls us a furnace and that's a lot harsher than calling it a ride and it's a purification process it's a formation of christ in us that seems to be the purpose it's not really about becoming something big in the world it's about the formation of christ in us that's the purpose and whether you believe it or not um it's up to you but i i'm glad that this message can be on the internet and be looped over and over again and again this is just the footnotes there's a lot um there's thousands of lectures you've talked about this so i will be going through some of them and giving my own footnotes of them and see if I have had these similar experiences and what mine were in contrast to his, um, just because I enjoy it. And so I hope this message reaches you and, and hopefully it stirred up within you a, a sense of peace. Um, really, that's about kind of what I hope. But And I hope that you believe it and start to have this pattern unfold in you and you get to share your experiences on it. But again, thanks for listening. And, and again, it's super late where I'm at, so I, I really had to share this. I've tried to make different styles of videos and I've noticed that the ones where I just kind of go off of what I feel seem to be the ones that are most enjoyable for me. And they seem to be the ones that help out a lot more people. I think sometimes when I follow a structured route, it can feel too tight. And then when I, when I try to read, I just hate it. So I'm going to just do more videos where I go off of what I feel. Cause I had these ideas about writing or making a video about Jacob and Esau. And I've been thinking about that for the past week. And then I just kept reading. I read about 10 lectures of Neville that I've found so interesting, but something that just kind of been, was pressing on my mind today was fear and something that I've heard a lot from people in the comment section and people on my one-on-one -on -one conversations, I've noticed that there is this uh, reoccurring nightmarish type of thinking. And I want to address it more from a different angle that I've learned from Neville. Because I'm somebody who has a lot of experience with, you know, having really terrific, or uh, terrific, <laughs> terrifying imaginal thoughts. And it's it's something that has plagued my my existence, my inner existence for a long time, I would create really disastrous thoughts. And to be honest, just the same way, if you were to think about many of the things you love, you might get four or five of them, as Neville said, imagine 10 things you love a day, and maybe you get eight, but you're not going to complain because you're, you might not even realize the other two because you're feeling that you've received most of what you want. You might not even realize it. Same thing happens for fear. I would imagine... 30 fearful things in a day and and some will show up and I and I can't deny my own involvement in my own fearful harvest my own nightmarish of a harvest I have to see that I actually was uh, my own hand was involved in this and I did imagine it and you know just to to give a scripture cuz I do I do find Neville to be a biblical teacher I don't find him to be a law of attraction I guess I, I never really associated him with that type of that group. I found Neville just strictly biblical. And it's a very simple scripture. It just says, have no fear of sudden disaster. And and the Lord will be your confidence. And I found that it was interesting how it was linked with confidence. So we had fear and confidence. But I want to take a different approach that I've learned from Neville's work. Neville's work is very, you know, it's it's from the gospel. So it's very much about forgiving sin and it's a redemption style of living and it's about redeeming oneself from a fallen state or you've tripped and fell into a state you don't like or or you contemplated on fear for a long time and things started happening what what i've noticed on these talks that i've had is that one could feel very in or trapped inside of one's imagination and these disasters where it feels like things are going out of your control to me, it's really just, I really believe an imagination that's filled with fear is simply void of love. And I think that what we try to do is we try to fight our fears and we try to maybe um, prove them wrong by, let's say if I'm afraid of talking on a mic, I'm going to 
do a YouTube channel talking the mic. And we can think that that is overcoming the fear, but I haven't found that to be that successful. There are certain fears that have plagued me and they weren't, you know, they were very difficult to remove. And I didn't quite know what to do. I thought that maybe if I could shove it to the side and, you know, push it under the rug that it would it would eventually disappear, but just like anything else in life, if you just push things under the rug, it's just going to build up. So it doesn't it, that didn't help me either. But what I what I took was from Neville's work was to redeem it with love is that when you when you uh, imagine fear, what you're actually doing is you're persuading yourself the same way you would with something good. Everything in the inside is self-persuasion. It's not about the outside. The outside is very factual based. I'm wearing a watch right now and the watch is telling me the actual time. But inside that there's not really the watch doesn't matter. It's not really necessary for me to have a watch on the inside. And so the inside, the nature of this world is more deceptive. It's about making an imaginal scene a reality. And I've noticed that when I would fear myself or when I would scare myself, I was very good at taking an image and creating or use this image making ability inside to create an image of that, that felt real to me, that felt fearful to me, that actually scared me. And it deceived me just the same way Jacob deceived Esau. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just going to bring this in is that in the world of Esau, this outer life, we, we don't need to be deceived or are persuaded. Things are the way they are. But in Jacob's world or on the inside of us, it's about deception. And if I could get you to see that the thing you are right now, you were persuaded to be, you would start to persuade yourself to be something else. But you have to first see that the state you're in, you're persuaded by something or someone. You eventually took a bite and believed in the state. You know, you started to feast upon this idea of yourself. But when you are scaring yourself inside, because you're very good at making these fearful thoughts so real to you, because you're good at that, you're simply not redeeming these things with love. You're keeping them there in fear. And when you when you apply love to these areas instead of fear, which would be compassion or any kind of antidote that involves us the spectrum of or any kind of love, anything loving, doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it's something loving, because trying to overcome your fears by force, you might overcome it, but you're not left with any love. You didn't gain much love. You might have reduced some anxiety, but even then you might doubt yourself and there you go again, feeling fear again. But when you redeem things with love, it's more permanent. It relaxes you better. It's more at ease. And again, or, or for example, if you have sin inside that is causing you frustration, forgiving it is more easy. It's more, it puts you in a more relaxed state than it would be to try to force sin out of your life or force by sin i mean missing your mark you know i do think that life is subjective in a, in a large sense so i don't i can't tell you what you know your morals should be hopefully you can create a good morality but you shouldn't you know if you want if you've done something that was against your own moral code then and that causes you fear i would try to redeem yourself with love try to find you see that you're 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 fearing yourself inside. You're actually scared. You're the you're the thing that is scary. The most scariest thing to you is yourself, and that's what I've noticed. In in one's imagination, they are the most frightening thing because they can create the exact fear. They can create an image that is so powerful. You know, it's so vivid that it can cause the person to be deceived by it and believe in it. And the next thing you know, they're terrified. But you have to see that your imagination is not scaring you it's always revealing to you it's revealing what you're afraid of it's revealing what you need to redeem when fears pop up i think about i think about redemption with love instead of avoidance or fighting it or you know it's about creating a different image that you love and when you find yourself in fearful positions inside it's realizing that the imagination is not doing that so that it can create this in your life so that you can have a miserable life. It's showing you what you're scared of. It's showing you what it, it what's left to be redeemed in you. And there's there the only way, the antidote that I found to fear is love. 
And love, obviously, is something that you're going to have to discover in you and how you want to apply that. But I'm sure you can figure that out. But it's not common that we apply love to our fears. We try to do anything else but. But I found love to be the antidote. And I found that from Neville's work. Now, that doesn't might not sound that, how should I say, doesn't sound too magical. It's actually kind of basic. But it is something that I found useful from Neville's work. His mystical work really intrigues me because I don't quite understand it sometimes. And I love when I don't understand things like that. But with this, I learned that it's useful to see it this way, to always see things in a redemptive attitude instead of seeing it as a damning attitude. So then you start to utilize this ability to deceive oneself for your, uh, not just redemption, for your glory, for your, for your, for the life you want, instead of for your own demise. So the the imagination is like an image-making tool. It's almost like a tool to, yeah, to create images or to, to create a certain image of oneself. It's all about image-making. So when you're, fear, when you're making a, a fearful thought, you're making this image fearful, and you're believing in it, and then you become it, or then you experience that. The image-making ability doesn't go away. You're just directing it towards love or towards fear, which you now need to direct it towards things that you love. You need to create images that you love. That's really what you need to do. And you need to start redeeming yourself inside. That's all that is in there. And, you know, every thought is a, is deceptive in a sense. And you may think of a horrific thing and you might start to become, you might feel frightened, but you have been deceived. You've been deceived by making that thought persuasive enough by adding colors of reality feelings or implications, and then you believe it. But you're self-scaring, and you're painting these nightmares that feel real. And if you can see yourself, you can see that you scare yourself with thoughts, you have the power of self-deception. But utilize that to your benefit, not to your demise. And so the imagination is always revealing to you something about you, what you're scared of, what you don't want to happen. You might be hyper-focused on what you don't want to happen. Well, then start focus on the things you would love to happen, what you love. Just don't be so convinced by fear's grip of, you know, and don't be so convinced, don't be so deceived so quickly. Don't be gullible inside and just believe everything that's fearful and start to apply the the ability to believe in what you love. That's essentially how we start to change our lives because that's the redemptive attitude of one's imagination and of oneself. So I don't think it's about force or effort or because that, that teaches to me that you need to earn something. I haven't found that that's, that's in the world of Esau. You have to earn your money in Esau's land. But in, in Jacob's land or in, inside of ourselves, it's not like that. It's about deception. It's about image making. It's about having the ability to create anything you want. That's why you need a direction because you can create anything. You can create evil. You can create hate. You can you can cre- create all these horrific things, but it's it, knowing that you can do that. You now have to go towards what you actually love, and you can personalize it to you. But that is why not all things are beneficial inside. And now it might be beneficial in the sense that it led you to where you need to go, but remaining there, remaining in shame, remaining in fear, I don't find that to be the most helpful thing, the most beneficial thing. It's best to learn to redeem oneself with love. And how that looks is by starting to create the image, use this image-making ability to create images that you want or that you love um, instead of the ones that you fear. And then you start to overcome your fear with love. And that is uh, simply a process of repentance in this case, or Neville called it revision. You don't, you don't have to make every thought perfect because that and that's gonna that sounds like efforting to me you have to make images that you love you have to make thoughts that you love don't worry about if it's going to happen or not just create it it you don't have to be so concerned with this attachment to this outcome you have to always think of it as the imagination is expressing it's, it's something that always happens regardless of whether you want it or not and you can prove this if you imagine fearfully for 30 days Actively, consciously man- uh, uh, imagine fearful things and hateful things of yourself and see how life starts to work. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, but I would recommend it in the reverse, to start inward. 
So it's as within, so without. A- ask yourself if that's true. Really question all these things. Is this really true? And if it is, let me see if I can test it. Let me start testing it by creating in me things that I love. And let me sustain the things that I love within me. And the more I go towards that, the more I, I will habitually live in those states of mind that I want to be in. Because I will always want to go towards love. And so if you find yourself like me going towards fear, it's it, I was being revealed to myself what I need to redeem. Not what I need to be afraid of, but what I need to redeem. I might be scared of it, but I should take a redemptive attitude towards the things within me that are in sin or in fear, however you want to call it. That's my attitude that I've taken from Neville's work. I hope that helped with sort of giving you an idea and that you can contemplate on that and think about it longer. Maybe you can come up with your own branch and and create your own fruits from this idea of redemption. But it has been a very powerful attitude adjustment that I need to take towards fear within me. Again, Neville's work to me, it's all redemptive. Everything about it from start to finish is about redemption. In all cases, big and small. And the story is is that the immortal became mortal so that the mortal can become Im- immortal. And so that life became death so that death can become life. It's this mystery of, of the, the divine becoming the non-divine and changing the non-divine to divine. So that all there is is divine. And that is the, or that God became man, that man may become God. That is the redemptive story. But it's, it encapsulates all things, not just the, not just the big things. And, this, and not just the idea of life itself, but also the things within life. And that includes you. And so you have to start to redeem yourself instead of creating more punishments and creating more fears and putting yourself in states that will be at your own demise. Essentially, you're going to create a harvest you're not going to want to reap. But if you can go towards love and start to change the image of yourself as you are always doing, I'm sure you'll create a life that you love. And it's cleaning the inside of the cup so that the outside may be clean. So we start from the inside out. And when you go inside, you might be hit with fears. But take the attitude of redemption. Instead of avoidance or running away, it will help you. And if you're interested in my talks, um, I do one-on-ones. And if you want more information, it's in the description. I You'll get an automated message if you email it, um, giving you all the details of it. I appreciate you guys listening, and I hope that helps. When you and I go to imagine, we might be hit with a bunch of questions. And there are going to be voices of reason. There's going to be a voice of doubt. There's going to be a voice of time telling you, well, this is going to take a while. Or it's going to say, do you really think this sounds outrageous? Are Are you really going to believe this? Or you would say, you clearly aren't that. So why why try to force yourself to believe something that you aren't and these voices will come but really the the attitude has to be that you silence those voices when you imagine because you're going to spend more time trying to answer questions you don't have the answer to than actually being the thing you want to be we're moving from wishing to gr- granted and it's about a change in the self not a change in anything else and so neville has the quote, he says, leave the world alone and change the conception of yourself. That first part is the crucial part. It's being able to actually leave it alone. Even point, point everything out in your life. Point to your room and point to, the, point to wherever you're at and say, just leave it alone. Tell yourself to do that. Let it be exactly as it is. Don't try to change it. Try to change self. Because that is what you want to change. So the change has to be in, in in a change of self. How you get there is up to you. How you go about changing yourself is up to you. Um, but I do think that it's better to start from the inside. And you're basically using, like I said, the image-making ability to change the image of yourself. But that first part is to leave it alone. Stop trying to answer all the questions. You're not, you don't have the answer. Because I, I, I've had so many things happen where there's no way I could have figured it out. And so you have to not spend time feeling gut punches and feeling like a tightness in your chest when these questions come. Because then you feel like you can't move into the state of being unless you first answer these questions. 
And Neville said, you know, if, if you have the question, you know, what if it doesn't work? He goes, then you haven't yet yielded into the state. And so when you're in that s- position where you're in that wrestling match with yourself, where you're in that, that war, where you're, the, the questions and the facts come, which is basically Job, the story of Job and, and his friends, which really kind of aren't his friends. His, they're just like bombarding him with a million questions. That is what we do to ourselves when we go to, to change, when we go to move. And it's learning to silence those, vo- it's, it's practicing being able to make those voices, or those, um, yeah, those voices silent. And it's not about answering those questions. It's about being the thing. It's about mentally moving and mentally being in a new mental environment and accepting it. It's about changing the self than the things in front of you. And so the first part comes that I would, I would also say leave the questions alone. Practice being it more than answering those difficult questions because to, I don't quite know the time. And that might sound limiting to somebody, but... I don't try to figure that out. So like when you go to sleep tonight, try your best to fall asleep being the thing you want to be. How you get there, I don't I don't know. I will start to feel that I am it. And once those questions start coming, I just silence them and I just and then eventually you kind of surpass it and then you kind of can just sit and be in it. And you can fall asleep in that state every night. And I found that to be the way to change oneself. Is being able to drop the outside and drop the questions. Because it's a, as I said, it's a law of being. It's more about what are you being, what are you aware of being, than it is about your worthiness or your the answer to these questions or anything else. You don't have to satisfy reason. You have to satisfy self. You don't have to satisfy those questions. And you won't you won't stop until you do satisfy. So you might as well just satisfy. Because I don't know anybody who really wants something within themselves and just gives up. Usually they push and push and they find different ways if they don't. I think I once heard to say if you don't if you if you have a want you don't need a how or something like that where you don't you'll figure out how because you want this. And what you'll find is that you're going to find these questions to be an obstacle, fear to be an obstacle, and eventually you're going to silence each one of these voices. And the only voice you'll hear is the voice of your savior, what you have identified as your savior. That's what you're believing in, which is the version of yourself that you want to be or the state that you want to be in. The that is what you identified as your savior and you believe in that believe you are that so then your ears your mental ears start hearing the voice of fulfillment so your mental eye starts seeing fulfillment and you start being fulfilled in what you were once desiring it's not a trick i wouldn't call it a trick i just would say although the bible did describe it as a deception or it's a it's a deceiving i I wouldn't call it that, but I can understand the idea there. But it is kind of, it's it's simply moving. If you know that the state you're in it's is is a state, if you can really see that it's a state that you're in and you want to change the state, I think when we give too much power to our current conception, we think that it ha- it holds this because we've been habitually in it for so long, we think it holds this power to where the new state almost seems unfeasible, yet it's a state within you as the state you are now is within you. And so the war really turns on the moment you go to change. That's where a lot of, there might be a lot of resistance. You're going to have questions and you're going to have uh, the, the habit of being that is going to try to grip you back. But what I've seen is that it's easier to commit to a state, a new one that you love, versus fighting an old one that you now hate. It's easier to commit to something new than it is to fight against something old. And that is the process, is being able to commit to new things inside. And anyone can do it. So when you go to sleep tonight, you don't allow yourself to sleep being the thing that you don't want to be. And, and the way you get there effortlessly is by the moment you go to change, you might, you might worry about what you need to change outside. But 
let it go and leave it leave it exactly as it is that is the key to make this it's it's a it's a way to make the 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 mind almost you almost gave your mind oil it's going to it's going to run more smoothly now when you don't you realize you don't have to satisfy the the questions and you don't have to uh do anything externally in the moment you just need to leave it exactly as it is and when you do that it kind of frees your mind to be able to be present and being the thing you want to be so it's releasing this gives you sort of a mental lubricant in a way and and then your thoughts will become more clear and your thoughts will feel more maybe they might be heightened in, in its vividness but your thoughts will feel like you can sustain them longer you can sustain the feeling of the thing you want longer than if you just force yourself to try to feel it or force yourself to avoid certain questions just learn to silence them and tune in as you would into a radio and tune into the to the words of the fulfillment really be sharp with your mind you don't have to it doesn't have to be messy and you know how you, the more you do something in life you, you become i know for me whenever i whenever i started um using lathes and building things i the more and more i did it the the sharper i became and i was able to see the the details of things same is true in the imagination and and you'll find that i i discovered that i had to give up i had to give up answering questions i had to give up the fighting i had to give up the doubting i had to give up the reasoning and i i really just had to believe and i what I, what i'm believing in is that i believe in the one name which is i am it's not i do it's i am it's the only name and so scripture tells us the name we use to to change things and so it's not they are it's not they must be it's i am and that's what i change it's a considered a magical name edward is just a a, a word we have here but i am always remains the same and that's the same message for everybody and so it really is a universal message and that's why it speaks to so many people because we all can relate with beingness and you go back when you say okay am i this no i'm not that and then am i this i'm not that and you start questioning everything you really allow yourself to question everything just become curious about life that's the way we discover answers and ask yourself questions um what does it really mean to move into a state what does it really mean to 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 be it and not try to be it what is the difference you know ask yourself all these questions and and really think about it because when you start to create a mental framework of how you're going to imagine when you have all these questions answered it becomes smoother it becomes easier it's lighter i found it to be a lot less stressful when i finally gave myself the permission to no longer satisfy these questions that understanding what these release why 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 am i why does it feel like i'm being released from a certain mental prisons was i in a mental prison and you just ask yourself all these questions and the more you ask yourself the more answers you're going to get but you'll find that it's going to lead you to a place of knowing that it's about being this it's about being it and it's practicing that it's using and practicing the name of i am that is what we're doing we're having faith in the one name and we're changing that one name and then we have faith in it and we believe we are it and you can spread belief to other people you can believe in them but i would recommend that you start with yourself learn to believe in yourself and don't take this lightly and i know i said you you should imagine lightly but don't take this instruction lightly really put it to the test and see if it works change the one name and see if that starts to change things in your life and it's it's a sacred name and you know don't use it it says you know god says don't use my name in vain and when i was younger i was taught that that meant you don't say oh my god and if you say oh my god i i didn't know what was going to happen to me but i just felt this well maybe something one day might happen because i said that and that's what i was taught that using the name in vain is but that's not what using the name in vain is it's uh, attaching all sorts of things to it that don't even benefit you don't even want you're using that don't use the name in vain and don't believe in another name and you'll see that i am is the only name and that ain't, that name is within us it's our name so we are the we are the i am 
and there's only one. And so that's where self-respect comes in. It's not standing up straight and giving a firm handshake, although that could be a symbol of it. Self-respect is attaching what is lovely to the name. You know, the Lord says that if you don't honor my name, or I, who, those who honor my name, I will honor, and those who despise my name, I will lightly esteem. Now, that sounds like a cruel God that's telling you to, you know, worship me or else I'm, you're screwed. But when you think about what the name is, if I honor the name of I am, then I will be honored. If I despise it, if I hate the name of I am, then I will be lightly esteemed. I'll barely be esteemed. And so, to respect oneself is to respect the name of I am. And we attach to it things that we, we love. We have that freedom. So don't think, you, don't think you never have the freedom to do something inside. Never believe in the lie that you are stuck. There's always redemption. It's a constant source. It's really like a well of redemption. And it's in you. So you don't have to go anywhere to, to do anything. Where you walk, it's holy. That is essentially the message that Neville's giving us from the Gospels through his interpretation. I just found his interpretation to be true and fascinating. And so take that message to heart to, to not use a name in vain, but attach things that are meaningful and lo loving to, uh, to it. And then you'll be respecting yourself and you should be honored. You're honoring the name. So, uh, thanks for listening. So I want to continue the idea of already being so. And I made a video about this in the past. But it's going to, I'm going to stitch it together between the latter experiment and already being so. Because I think these two things are important. Because one implies a physical object, which is climbing the ladder, and the other one implies a change in, in one's conception. And how can we apply the idea of climbing a ladder instead of trying to get a ladder to a conception of oneself? How can we apply that same principle of climbing it? And in this case, it would be already being it. And that I the, the common thing I see is... Not only do we always try to get ladders, we always try to get conceptions. And we, what we will do is we create conditions because we don't think we can actually be the thing we want to be. And so we try to minimize it. We make our desires smaller. We modify them to whatever it is. Instead of we, we, I mean, the reason why we do that is because we keep judging after our senses. And if you keep judging after your senses, what you judge after is what you'll get. And so you'll keep getting the sense world. You keep getting the limitations that you see instead of expanding oneself to identifying oneself with one's imagination. You will continue to identify yourself with your sense limitations. And, and it's not a supernatural thing. It's nothing crazy. It's simply identifying yourself with the one inside of yourself. And so you identify yourself with the one that's climbing it. You identify yourself with the one that already is it. And what that means is that we go to the end. And so the I am is our end. So in the beginning, you can ask yourself, what do I already want to be? Ask yourself that question and know that God's name is I am. So if I need a, if I, I need a certain power to create this, I need a power to, I need a power that can change me. Well, I am is a power. And so it's considered the one power through Neville's lens and through my lens. And so if I need to change something, I need to change my I am, for that's the creator of my life. But I change my I am by going to the end, and the end is me already being it. And so you, see, you want to see someone, as Neville said, gainfully employed. You don't imagine them, you don't see them as unemployed and go, man, okay, I'm going to see them with a job, and I hope they get it. Or I'm going to see them with a job, and you, in your heart you feel fear that they might not get the job, or you fear that they might not get it in time, or you whatever fear comes up, you fear that what if it doesn't work? So you have all these fears that might come up, all these questions of from the voice of fear. And what I want you to do is silence that voice, and I want you to see him already being employed. Your goal is to see it already. If, if imagining creates reality, 
then I must imagine successfully. And to imagine successfully, to imagine success, is to imagine the outcome already being accomplished, the desired, the objective already being fulfilled. That is the, that is the way I should imagine. And so if I want, so in the beginning, I change myself by going to my end. And so my, my end becomes my beginning. And my beginning becomes my end. We just simply flip these two and you'll see that the end goal is to be it, right? And so you want to already be it now. You want to see them already being employed now. You want to see your friend already being successful now. It doesn't cost you anything. You know, I was, the other day I was waiting in line and there's a little boy in front of me and he said something that I've actually repeated to myself, inside myself. And so you can see life can feel like an echo. But he said, you know, the one poster I wanted here, of course they don't have it. And I've said, I've, I've, I know what feeling he's feeling. And I've had that feeling many times in my life. But the day will come when he will realize that he has to change that script. He's going to have to realize that life is not against him. Life isn't against him. And I've felt that for long, for many, many years. I stayed in a state of feeling a victim to life. And I was. I became a victim. I really, truly was. I felt sorry for myself. And then I really was sorry for myself. I become the things I contemplate myself on. And if I feel like what that boy felt, which is, of course, the thing I wanted isn't here. If I keep feeling that, I will keep creating from that because that's what I'm giving my attention to inside myself. And so you see indifference becomes a tool that you use when you want to change yourself. If you, you have to see that the thing you dislike or this, this state that this boy is in, he's going to have to be indifferent to it one day and see that it doesn't stop him. It's simply some, it's part of his own creation. At one point, we might have loved this state that we're in, that we might despise now. At one point, we loved it enough to become it. We believed in it, or we we're deceived or convinced by something, by our senses, that we are the thing that we do not want to be. And so I have to eventually stop judging after my uh, senses. I mean, to the point where, as Neville said, you might have a friend call you. And they tell you the opposite news. They say it didn't work. Or they say they don't know that you imagined it, but they tell you the, the bad news. Neville said he would simply get off the phone with them after they're done with their conversation and imagine saying that it did work. So you go to the end, you keep forgiving it over and over again. And that's how you apply it to yourself. When you change your conception to something more lovely towards yourself, when you change your and shape your I am with with pressures of love when you're as if you're molding a, a pot of clay and you apply hand you, you use your hands to apply pressure to the clay when you finally you apply the the pressures of love onto you you'll start to mold your i am in a more lovely image and so we are we're truly image making here that is what neville called this a school of image making and so i practice every single day to change the images of myself into something i love and then i'm forgiven myself over and over and over again I don't leave myself in want the same way Neville didn't leave that man who told him it didn't work in that state that it didn't work. We, he picked him up and moved him into a better state. He imagined himself seeing and hearing success. And the, the success in this case is, is the end. So in my beginning, I go to my end and the end is already being that. That is the secret in changing oneself from the inside out. Because in the inside, we go to ends in our, inside of ourselves. We don't meddle with the middle. And that is how you have your imagination run smoothly. You'll see how much more freeing it is if you test it on someone else. And imagine, without telling them, imagine them more successful. Just see them more successful. Put them in that state of mind. Regardless of where they're at right now, just put them there. Don't judge after the sense world. Judge after imagination. And then you'll start to free yourself because you can create anything in imagination. And you can create by having faith in the already being so. And that's the, that is how you stitch together the idea of climbing it, which is you don't try to get a ladder, you climb the ladder. And so you don't try to be a conception. You don't try, you be it already. You don't, if you want a skill, if you want to learn a skill, you go to what the outcome, if you had the, if your skills were, and if your skills were, if pushed to the maximum and you were and you produce something with your skills, what would that end goal be? And you see that end goal already being the case. Regardless if you don't know the skills right now, the skills will come. Things that things that are needed will fulfill that void. 
And, and the same is true for conceptions. And so I must always go to my end. And if you have a lot of anxiety about that, then you're not imagining it already being the case. If you're one hoping that your friend does get the job, then you're not really imagining it already being done. And that's how we create. We create by going to the ends. In the beginning, we create our ends. And our, your end is your I amness. So you change your I amness, meaning your, your, the self is always remaining the same, but the self is in different states of mind. And so you hate the state you're in right now. Know that it's a state. Don't identify yourself more than with it because then you'll start to think you can't change it. See it as a state of mind that comes with the sets of behaviors and events unfold from that state. So events don't happen to us. Events unfold from our states of mind. See it as a state of mind that is complete and grant yourself the ability to move into a different state of mind. And it can happen in an instant. It doesn't have to be something really hard. If, if it's very difficult, if there's a lot of resistance, then you don't see yourself in a state. You think it's something more. The, the, th the desire you want to be, that is also a state of mind. And eventually you might dislike that one. You want to move. But regardless, you have a goal right now. You have a desired, a desired end outcome. Go to it already being fulfilled. The, the inner man doesn't look for a ladder inside himself. Do you see how in this world we have to go to the basement and look for it? And you know, where the hell is it? And we, we realize that we gave it to an uncle and then they have it and then we don't know where it's at. And then we have to go buy another ladder. We have to do all these things to get a little bit inside. The ladder is already provided. In here, I have to learn the skills and learn the knowledge and do all these things to become the desired outcome or the desired conception. But inside, I'm already the conception and I identify myself with that being instead of the one of the senses. No more Esau and now I identify with Jacob and I judge after Jacob's eyes. And I know this will help you because it, it eliminates that fear. It neutralizes it. And it neutralizes that anxiety of trying to get a ladder and trying to be something and hoping it works out. It neutralizes that. You go to the end. The end is already being so. The end is climbing it. You're not looking for the ladder inside yourself. You're not looking for the conception. No more seeking inside. You start to fulfill and start to be. And so your outer ears might hear bad news, but you go to your inward ears and you change it to good news. You hear the good news from it within. And then you put your trust in it because you will, you will put your trust into something. You put your trust into the immortal ears and the divine, the, the divine eyes. And so I'm glad I was able to, if you apply that, you will remove that friction from the inside. And I, I should also say that I also offer now one-on-one -on -one conversations with me. And if that interests you, just email me. It's in the description. And if you email me, there will be an automated message that will come to you and it will give you pricing and the date and all the information you need. So if you're interested in that, then, then it's available. And just thanks for listening and remember to hear and see fulfillment. Just hear it and see it. Don't do anything else. Just hear it and see it.